development. It also seeks to give us Jamaicans a chance to participate in developing our country towards achieving the kind of, of Jamaica that we want, not just for ourselves, but for future generations. The large and growing diaspora has been playing a role in support of Jamaica's development. I believe the people in diaspora are very interested in giving back and being a part of this one big community called Jamaica. We're just trying to find ways to get involved, help and see Jamaica become the best version of itself. The PIOJ, Jamaica's premier planning institution, continues to evolve to meet the changing needs of our country and the global environment. I envision the PIOJ as a place of choice for the brightest minds across the range of disciplines pertinent to the Institute to enable Jamaica through ideas, innovation and enterprise to increase in the pace of development and to become the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business. The Community Renewal Program, CRP, was established in 2011 as a multi-level integrated intervention for coordinating and enhancing service delivery among 100 of the most volatile and vulnerable communities in Jamaica. Its primary objective is to achieve sustainable positive change among the targeted communities by harnessing multiple interventions under six broad thematic areas. These are social transformation, socio-economic development, governance, youth development, physical transformation, and safety and justice. The selected communities are from the five parishes that have sustained the highest murder rates over the last 10 years. These are St. James, Clarendon, St. Catherine, Kingston, and St. Andrew. Objectives of the Community Renewal Program the overall objective of the Community Renewal Program, CRP, is to contribute to inclusive growth and equitable national development by fostering the socio-economic well-being and enhancing the quality of lives of residents of volatile and vulnerable communities. The CRP Secretariat coordinates the implementation and monitoring of the CRP by building partnerships among state and non-state entities to ensure collaboration, coordinating and harmonizing development partners, state and non-state entities and institutions to prevent duplication and maximize the impact of interventions. The Planning Institute of Jamaica, through the Community Renewal Program, continues to support the process of policy formulation and development through the coordination and implementation of policy activities under the economic sector. Notably, in 2016, a policy committee was established within the PIOJ to facilitate stakeholder discussions and to advocate for the development of a legislative framework for the social enterprise sector in Jamaica. This advocacy was successful and led to the CRP's participation in the review and update of the MSME and Entrepreneurship Policy, resulting in the development and inclusion of a new chapter on social value creation being added, which received Cabinet approval in 2018. The CRP now chairs the Social Enterprise Working Group, a subgroup of the National Policy Implementation Committee. Monitoring and Evaluating to strengthen the M&D capacity of the Community Renewal Program, a web-based monitoring and evaluation database was introduced in July 2020. This system is intended to be used by CRP implementing partners to plan, track, measure and report on the performance of interventions under the CRP umbrella. Coordination and collaboration among the agencies within each parish is facilitated by the Parish Interagency Networks established by the Social Development Commission, SDC, to facilitate coordination and collaboration among the agencies within each parish. Let's now listen to Mr. Charles Clayton, Program Director, as he explains the CRP's theory of change. 
The CRP recognizes that agencies working by themselves in silos are unable to accomplish the kind of change that is needed in the spaces where we have social problems of the kind that we are addressing. So if we expect communities to be able to be transformed into in spaces where people can operate in, in a mainstream society, then we have to be more targeted in our approach. We have to target the issues that need to be addressed more intelligently and we need to work together in an uncompeting kind of way. So what the CRP brings as the theory of change is a process in which agencies that are working in common spaces are working in support of each other rather than against each other and they are targeting the issues that need to be addressed having been informed by the data that is available and there is a process that is defined with an end game in sight that says this is where we want to be in this community and this is the role that I will play versus the role that another agency will play and at the end of the day we are able to measure the change we have accomplished having worked together for a common good in the particular sphere that my agency is responsible to work in. For more information on the CRP, visit the PIOJ's website or email us at info at pioj.gov.jm. Social Investment Fund, JSIF, celebrating over 20 years of investment in community development. JSIF has forged relationships with international funding partners as well as private and public sector entities. Let us continue to invest to reduce vulnerabilities. Let us build our social capital and resilient infrastructures to ensure full participation in Vision 2030. JSIF, investing for community development. We want a peace for Jamaica. Mm, yeah, yeah. We have to be our brother's keeper. Yeah, yeah. Jamaica, we food, yeah. I make we enjoy life. But we feel safe at night. Jamaica, we food. I better you and I. No, say we future, bro. Jamaica, we food. Come together as one. I make the violence. you to stand with me for the national anthem of Jamaica.
please remain standing as I invite Dr. Elaine McCarthy, Chair of the Jamaica Umbrella Group of Churches, to pray. Let us pray. Most righteous and eternal Father, we thank you for today. We lift you up in praises, Lord, even as we are gathered here for this occasion. And Lord, as we focus on community and social development, we recognize the importance of this. We recognize that the family is key to our development. And families transcends into communities and communities into a nation. And so, Lord, as we go through the various sessions today, we ask that the information that will be shared will be of such that we will be able to embrace it and to take it back into our communities, into our homes, to build a better nation. We ask your blessings upon the presenters and everyone that will be participating in various ways. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity for service as we ask your blessings again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. The Honorable Favel Williams, Minister of Education and Youth, Ms. Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General, Planning Institute of Jamaica, Mr. Carl Hyatt, Acting CTD, Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Mr. Omar Sweeney, Managing Director, Jamaica Social Investment Fund, Mr. Delroy Simpson, Chief Technical Director, Ministry of National Security, Mr. Omar Frith, Deputy Executive Director, the Social Development Commission, Dr. Eileen Mac McCarthy, I'm welcoming you formally again, our partner agencies and teams, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Rochelle White and I will be your chairperson for today. The Best Practice Symposium was first introduced in 2016 through the Planning Institute of Jamaica's Community Renewal Program. In partnership with the Jamaica Public Service Company Limited, the Citizen Security and Justice Program, the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, the National Housing Trust, the Housing Agency of Jamaica, and the Social Development Commission. The objective of the symposium is to showcase and document best practices in social and community development and to stimulate and strengthen national dialogue on successful strategies in tackling critical development issues. It was determined at the outset by academics from some of our key universities, NCU, the University of the West Indies, and UTEC, that the following denotes the criteria of a best practice. Community readiness, evidence of impact, collaboration and partnership, sustainability, monitoring and evaluation, and importantly, the use of data. The symposium has looked at a couple themes from 2016 to 2020. Some of them include joint action for total solution, working together for a better Jamaica, best practices, the way forward, towards community renewal, coherence in coordination, and today we will be looking at transforming communities through economic and psychosocial best practices. To tell us more and to welcome us formally, I now invite Deputy Director General with responsibility for external corporation management and project development at the PIOJ, Ms. Barbara Scott. Mrs. Rochelle White, Chairperson and Senior Technical Advisor to the Director General at the PIOJ, the Honorable Favor Williams, Minister of Education and Youth, Mr. Delroy Simpson, Chief Technical Director at the Ministry of National Best Practice Symposium in Social and Community Development. As was indicated by Rochelle, 
The symposium was initiated as a mechanism for showcasing programs and methodologies that have had or have shown great potential for contributing to the development and restoration of our vulnerable and volatile communities. The continued staging of this event is in no small way due to the stable and enduring partnership that the PIOJ, through its community renewal program, has shared with a few key agencies. To this end, I offer a special word of thanks to the Jamaica Social Investment Program, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Ministry of National Security, and the Social Development Commission, who have, over the years, played an integral part in the development and execution of this event. This year, as Rochelle alluded to, we're drawing attention to two critical com components that are essential prerequisites for sustainable community development. These are economic inclusion and psychosocial intervention. In general, our target communities are plagued by high levels of unemployment and low levels of meaningful economic activities, and as a result, lack a sustainable economic framework. In addition, Many of the citizens are victims of various kinds of trauma that have never been treated. Youth in particular have given expression to these experiences in various forms of delinquency and violent behavior. Many have become vulnerable to the influence of criminal gangs with the result of increased participation in criminal violence across the country. It is in this context that the symposium is being hosted under the theme transforming communities through economic and psychosocial best practices. To support this theme, we have a distinguished panel of presenters that include local and international experts in the fields that have been highlighted. In this regard, we welcome Dr. Carlos Boche Madero from Mexico, as well as Mr. Hector Verdugo from California in the USA, and locally, Dr. Sky Morgan, Ganesh Shetty, Henley Morgan, and Mr. Tariq Weeks, about whom you will hear much more as the program progresses. Against this background, the privilege is indeed mine to welcome you all to this year's symposium. I encourage you to contribute openly where the opportunity may arise and draw freely from the experiences that will be shared during the course of today's activities. I have the sincere hope that key takeaways from today's session will be integrated into our practice as we work collectively towards building a better and more inclusive country in which the vision of Jamaica, the place of choice to live, work, raise, work, raise families and do business will be realized by every Jamaican in every community. Ladies and gentlemen, we value your partnership, we value your participation, and we look forward to a day of meaningful content and rich discussions. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Our next speaker has been a member of Parliament for St. Andrew Eastern since, since March 2016 and has served in a number of government posts, including those of Minister of State in the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, Minister of Science, Energy and Technology, and currently the Minister of Education and Youth. Mrs. Favel Williams is also a Chartered Financial Analyst by profession. She has an MBA with a concentration in finance from the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania and a BA cum laude in economics from the Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Please help me welcome Minister Williams to the podium. I see a lot of persons looking in surprise. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It seems our moderator has a different program, <laughs> a different agenda. All right, let me also join in acknowledging Mrs. Rochelle White, chairperson of this proceedings. Senior Technical Advisor to the Director General at the Planning Institute of Jamaica, and someone with whom I've worked for a number of years as well um, since I've been in government. 
Uh, let me acknowledge Ms. Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General, Planning Institute of Jamaica. Mr. Omar Sweeney, Managing Director, Jamaica Social Investment Fund. Mr. Delroy Simpson, Chief Technical Director, Ministry of National Security. Mr. Omar Frith, Deputy Executive Director, Social Development Commission. And of course, Dr. Elaine McCarthy, who took us to the throne of grace this morning um, from the Jamaica Umbrella Group of Churches. Partner agencies and their teams, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me begin by saying a big thank you for convening this meeting, uh, focusing on transforming communities through economic and psychosocial best practices. I come at this from two different perspectives, from that of being a member of parliament and from the perspective of, the, of being the Minister of Education and Youth. From being a member of parliament, we are required to be on the ground, literally, physically, on the ground, in communities, getting to know people and their needs, helping persons within communities. Just to situate you in terms of St. Andrew Eastern, because I know when I talk to some Jamaicans, yes, they know their constituencies, but they might not necessarily know the geographic boundaries of those constituencies. And so mine is the constituency that stretches from if you're traveling on Mountain View Avenue and you're coming from the direction of the airport and you get up to where the police station is on Mountain View Avenue on the right hand side, it starts about there. So it encompasses Jarrett Lane, Back bush as you come up, um, Excelsior would be on the left hand side and that whole area. And if you cast your eyes up into the mountains, Long Mountain, Beverly Hills, Pines of Karachi, um, the University of the West Indies, Hermitage, into Augustown, Goldsmith Villa, African Gardens, Tavern, Papine come around to some communities above Hope Gardens, Hope Pastures, Mona Heights, Standpipe, and so on. So just to give you a sense, I've, I've listed the communities so you can understand the range of communities within the constituency from the very poor to the very rich. So it gives me a perspective um, as I move through communities and their needs. Within the Augustown communities, we've had Zozo activity in that community for a while now. And you know, the Zozo brings together the interministerial effort from across government and concentrate it into the particular community. So it does a lot of infrastructure development, looks at entrepreneurship, um, job opportunities, how do you bring communities together, how do you bring war in factions together. There is the uh, security forces in there in a, in a, in a meaningful way and um, it, it, to me, that is a, an example of um, what can impact on communities. So here is one community that has had a history of violence and bringing in this intervention for the community, we have 
been seeing results, and it has been sustained over a period of time. I don't know if when you talk about your best practices today, you'll be mentioning that, but I can say in that particular area in the constituency, that set of concentrated activities from different agencies that has been extremely effective. I go now to other communities that just operate in the normal way we know it. People come together, they live, they interact with each other. And I've seen where, I've seen the, the range. Communities that come together using WhatsApp groups and, and you know, communities in which persons are able to walk, and so they come in contact with each other, you have a lot better and a different kind of environment in those communities. And so as you, well, as I think about best practices, those are some of the examples that I would throw in the mix to the PIOJ and others um, who are charged with looking at communities, how they operate, how can we bring services in that will have a meaningful impact on communities. And I have to specially mention JSIF because they are the coordinating entity within these communities, yes. And their effort, I mean, I am amazed. Usually initiatives start and they fizzle out. Um, but this one, JSIF, has a concentration in this area that is way above and beyond, I think, um, just in terms of helping the community to stay together, um, to, to look at how they can uh, begin to be an independent community uh, with coordination among them. And so there's an active CDC, Community Development Commission, there. Um, they manage the, some of the finances of the project. And I am delighted to report that there has not been any whisper of anything on towards as they, as they manage through um, the JCIF project. So that for me is a great example of how we can help communities in trouble to really come together and begin to think about their collective future and to actually work towards realization of that future. Obviously, um, education is a big component of it as well. And so, um, you know, <laughs> And I say that again because when I look at the range of communities in my constituency, um, yes, you have to take into consideration education, the level of education of persons within communities versus others. It makes a big difference because obviously education opens opportunities um, for you. The quality of the jobs that you have access to is obviously different. Um, depending on your education and on your skills. And so we have to really inculcate in our children and our young people the value of education. It is, if you ask me, what makes the greatest difference between, I'm not going to call the community names because they might hear it and they will be mad at me, between, you know, a community that is yeah, and one that's up here. It's education. There's no doubt about it. Um, because it opens the opportunities, it opens the doors for opportunities for, for all persons. Um, in Jamaica, across the length and breadth of Jamaica, we have access to education. There are 1,010 1, schools, primary and secondary across Jamaica. And you have double that number when you look at the early childhood sector. So access is not our issue in Jamaica. Um, what, what is our issue is that 
I, I don't believe that we really, really, truly embrace education in Jamaica. Because when you look at the, the absenteeism from school, that number is high, very high. Um, and something that we are wrapping our heads around to see how best we can encourage parents to ensure that their children show up for school five days per week. Yes, we understand that there are limiting factors, transportation, lunch money, and so forth. But when I look across the world, there are many, many millions of parents who wake up every day and they make awesome sacrifice to ensure that their children are in school. And so we have to get out there, pound the pavement, to let Jamaicans understand how very important education is because if we're able to raise the level of education in Jamaica to be on par with other countries that we admire decades ago was at a place that was far, far, far. We couldn't imagine the place where they were at a country, as a country. And it's through education where they're able to lift themselves up to be among the top 10 in the world. And if you read up on their history, their education system is very demanding. Um, children stay in school, many hours through what we have available to us to leverage. And so um, from the education ministry, you may have noticed that we've started a significant campaign branded as Trend, Transforming Education for National Development, to focus all of us as Jamaicans in the potential of every single Jamaican getting, attaining education up to the tertiary level. It's a very, very ambitious goal, but it's one that we are setting in our sights. It's not impossible. We, just, over the decades, we've not internalized that. Um, we think, you know, yes, primary school, high school, um, but we want to move the needle on tertiary as well. Because when you look at the data, as Rochelle mentioned this morning, you have to look at the data. Uh, countries that are doing very well, that are excelling, when you look at the percentage of their population with tertiary, education, it's extremely high, and we want to get there. We're hovering in the 20 to 30 percent. Those other countries are in the 80, 85, 90 percent. So you can see the gap between us and them. Um, so my message here this morning is one, to begin by saying thank you for the focus. Eight years, Barbara. Um, continue to do the good work. Sometimes it takes a while for things to sink in, but this is really good work that you and the other partners are doing um, to focus on communities, uh, you know, from on a particular constituency that has the, um, the range of different communities, uh, like the one that, that I have, and knowing what I believe it will take to get communities uh, from where they are to where we want them to be with better infrastructure, which means housing, roads, um, legal, electricity, metered, water, access to, to education. Um, this is a great symposium, and I wish I could stay the day with you to understand some of the best practices. Thank you so much, everyone, all the partners, continue to do the good work that you're doing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Minister Williams. My key takeaways from your presentation were the importance of support from our partners, the importance of education, data, uh, improving infrastructure within the community. So thank you so much for your message to us this morning. There will be one other deviation from the program as you have it. Uh, we will be having a musical selection from Mrs. Ariel Maddox. And we thought that it was important for us to have Mrs. Maddox play for us on the flute 
the song You Raise Me Up. And we are in this song to all community development practitioners in this room and those who are also watching online, whether you work at the community level or at the policy level. Every time you do what you do for our volatile and vulnerable communities in Jamaica, you are contributing to nation building. You raise me up. Mrs. Maddox.
you very much, Mrs. Maddox. A critical success factor of our Best Practices Symposium has been the support from our partners from the beginning. And this morning, to bring greetings on behalf of our partners, we have in the following order, Mr. Omar Frith, Deputy Executive Director of the Social Development Commission, Mr. Omar Sweeney, Managing Director for the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, Mr. Carl Hyatt, Acting Chief Technical Director for the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, and Mr. Delroy Simpson, Chief Technical Director for the Ministry of National Security. I now invite Mr. Omar Frith to start the greetings. Madam Master of Ceremonies, Mrs. Rochelle White, who is also the Senior Technical Advisor to the Director General of the POJ, the Honorable Favor Williams, of course, Minister of Education and Youth, Ms. Barbara Scott, the Deputy Director General of the Planning Institute of Jamaica, Mr. Carl Hyatt, Acting CTD, Ministry of National Security, my namesake, Mr. Omar Sweeney, Managing, Managing Director of the Social in, uh, Jamaica Social Investment Fund, and of course, Mr. Delroy Simpson, who is CTD, Ministry of National Security. I also greet Dr. Elaine McCarthy, the chairperson of the Jamaica Umbrella Group of Churches, and of course, partner agencies, presenters, my own colleagues from the SDC, other community stalwarts, all champions in social development, good morning. I know you have not yet had breakfast, but you retreated to a very soothing and empowering peace just now. So I believe you have a little bit more energy than that. Good morning, everybody. Indeed. Uh, this morning, while I drove into Kingston, I had a slight memory of Mr. Kung Fu Tzu, who we now call Confucius. And he said that he who chooses to secure the well-being of others in so doing is securing the well-being of himself. And so it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Social Development Commission to congratulate all of you this morning who continue to secure the well-being of others because in so doing, you are securing the well-being of yourselves and the nation in which we live. The SDC considers it an absolute privilege and, of course, a delight to participate once more in this annual best practice symposium in community development. This continues to be a symposium that presents incalculable value in the community development landscape. Therefore, on behalf of the entire team of the SDC, this morning, I greet you as fellow actors, leaders, and warriors in the community development arena, and congratulate you for your continued work in your various mandates to contribute to the transformation of our country from the ground up, because that is where it matters. But permit me, though, on behalf of the Commission, to convey special greetings, gratitude, and commendations to the PIOJ for taking the lead in which we can transform our nation. And of course, this year's theme, transforming communities through economic and psychosocial best practices, resonates deeply with the mission of the Social Development Commission. We firmly believe that growth and well-being of our communities depend on a holistic approach that considers a myriad of factors, including, of course, social and economic considerations. Not only do we have this as a belief, our strategic direction mandates us to advance the economic development of communities 
through an integrated community development strategy. And through this strategy, the SDC remains committed to supporting partners and playing its part in ensuring an atmosphere of collaboration by ensuring that the three key pillars of our integrated strategy remain strong, relevant, and complementary to the work of our fellow actors as far as possible. And this is why we were very delighted to hear the minister gave credit for the presence of a very strong and reliable CDC in her constituency. And so in closing, those three pillars that we commit to you include one, the strengthening of our participatory governance framework to ensure that the over 300 community groups that we have are not just available to support execution, but they are reliable, transparent, and in a position to deliver significant partnership work with you. And to this end, the Commission undertook over the last financial year what we call a verification exercise, which is essentially an audit of these entities because we recognize that there are many gaps in groups that may exist on paper, but not so in practice. And we're happy to report that we would have completed verifications for 175 of them, meaning we have seen improved areas where we can now give a stamp of, of approval to entities that have been improving. Secondly, we recognize the need to have access to reliable community data. And so the Commission continues to express solidarity and give you our commitment to make available to you reliable data. To that end, we have ensured that we have updated and make available to you 712 community profiles which are now available as of October 2023. This represents 92% coverage of communities island-wide. We have also ensured that you now have access to over 589 community priority plans so that our projects are not drawn from a pie in the sky of our intellectual ambitions, but they are driven by collaborative ideas coming from people from the ground that have identified their priorities. We have also ensured that you have access to 772 asset maps so that you can know what are the various resources and stakeholders that are available in communities which represent 99% coverage of communities island-wide. And finally, most importantly to the theme, we remain committed in not just talking but supporting the economic development of communities. As a result, since October 2023, through focal investment and support, we have given support to over 416 local economic initiatives, which would have seen out of those initiatives over 1,300 jobs being created at the community level. We have taken that a notch higher by introducing a special entrepreneurial grant, and we would have seen over 616 small enterprises otherwise ignored receiving funding to the tune of a total of $30 million across the community. And so we continue to remain committed to ensure that we support our partners and congratulate PIOJ and the rest of you for doing your part to make Jamaica a better place. Let us continue to serve, work together, collaborate, and not compete as we make Jamaica a better place. Have a great day. Make use of this symposium. Thank you very much, Mr. Frith. I now invite Mr. Sweeney to the podium. There will be also other activities that will be happening over the course of this week, uh, tomorrow as well as Friday. I will tell you more as the program goes on. Mr. Sweeney. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Clayton. Rochelle White. Thank you, Mrs. White. Uh, Honorable MP Fable Williams, to Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General, Planning Institute of Jamaica, to Mr. Simpson, CTD at the Ministry of National Security, to 
Mr. Omar Frith, who just spoke. Yes, I see here also Dr. Elaine McCarthy, and there's Mr. Hyatt here. Yes, Mr. Hyatt. I, I see so many other distinguished persons and partners in the audience, and um, I so, I'm so excited to be here because I heard M MP Williams say, oh, look first, let me stop. Good morning. I, I haven't had breakfast, coffee, anything yet. I, I, I don't even know where I am, and, and, and to even be more honest, I left this very room at that seat 11 o'clock last night. I, I was thinking I should have just gone upstairs and come back down. And so it's been one of those times, but it's so great to be here because when I think that this symposium really started eight years, I think it's more like 10 years that we've had the idea of the symposium and the work that has gone into it, and to see a room so packed, continue to be packed with persons who really speak our language, we say at JSIF. I, I really want to first recognize the work of the Planning Institute of making sure that this thing happens and stays in our environment. And since 1996, when JSIF has been working in communities, uh, we started off with a mandate of access, improving access to communities, better basic schools, better health clinics, better water supply, uh, mostly in the rural areas. And as we evolved over time, more so as you got into the early 2000s, communities start to speak to us more about the things that were keeping them poor. You know, yes, Mr. Sweeney gave us a school, but we would have liked to have been able to do it ourselves. You know, uh, what can we do more about the things that are keeping us where we are? And that speaks to the theme of this year in 2023, transforming communities through economic and psychosocial best practices. And so since then, we've spent a lot of our time focusing, for instance, on economic development. And as the previous speaker said, we have spent time looking at the local economy, or economy, I should say, and how it is that money can not only be earned within the community, but also be kept within the community. And so if a person even works outside of the community, the goods and services they need for their daily life can be purchased within their community and build a community. And that, that, that certainly has gone on. Similarly, in terms of the psychosocial, we understand that until you address a person's immediate need, you can't really talk to them about anything else. You can talk to them. Whether they're listening to you is another story, right? But you have to address what affects me first. And so with that, we also developed mechanisms to ensure that we were able to address some of their immediate needs. And with that, we believe that until you do those things, you can't really count a community as transformed. Recently, you may have seen the Governor General praising the community in Buckner with respect to their work in reactivating a community center. We consider Buckner to be a great example of a community that has been transformed. That community center was built 10 years ago, right? As per usual, it was defunct and it was a community who realized that we are not going to exist here without skills training, without computers, and they reactivated the center, right? That's, that tells you their mindset and the importance of doing the important things. And so I'm glad we're here today to continue to speak that dialogue, continue to speak the language. And I want to end with something more on a personal note. I'm an engineer, as many of you know, and I don't know anything about plants and gardens and, and those kind of things. And I was really looking around my house and I didn't know, I didn't like how it looked. 
And I got an expert, somebody who knows about these things. And they came and they were telling me all these grand ideas. And I said, you know, when I think about my capacity, I don't think your ideas would be sustainable. And the person said to me, okay, start here. Do something small, but make it perfect. Every single day, make it perfect. And if you do that, you will be okay. What happened is, in me making it perfect, I started to pay attention over there, I pay attention over there. And in the end, it transformed. Right? Every time someone comes, they say, oh, what did you do to the place? Who is doing it? It transformed. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what we need to do for Jamaica. Let's focus on just a small space and make it perfect. And if we can do that, the rest will take care of itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sweeney. I now invite Mr. Carl Hyatt, Acting Chief Technical Director of the Minister, Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce. Ms. Rochelle White, Chairperson, the Honorable Fable Williams, Minister, Ministry of Education and Youth, Ms. Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General, PIOJ, Mr. Omar Sweeney, Managing Director, Jamaica Social Investment Fund, Mr. Delroy Simpson, CTD, Minister of National Security, Mr. Omar Frith, Deputy Executive Director, Social Development Commission, and Dr. Elaine McCarthy, Chairperson, Jamaica Umbrella Group of Churches, Partners, Agencies, and their teams. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. I am honored to stand before you today at the PIOJ 8th Business Practice Symposium in Social and Community Development. I extend heartfelt greetings on behalf of our esteemed Minister, Senator the Honorable Aubin Hill, at the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Jamaica's Business Ministry. This year's symposium centered on transforming communities through economic and psychosocial best practices resonates deeply with our ministry's mandate of fostering a robust business environment. At the heart of our strategic vision lies a fundamental truth. Our national prosperity is bound to the vigor of our communities, the triumphs of our micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, and the pivotal role of our social enterprises, which stand as a vanguard of community and societal transformation. MSMEs play a driving role in our economy. At the end of October 2023, there are approximately 422,000 active MSMEs within Jamaica. These enterprises collectively employ an estimated 60 to 70 percent of our local labor force, with 90 percent operating within the private sector. This robust participation translates into an estimated 44 percent contribution to our GDP underscoring their indispensable role in fostering social and community development and fueling our economic growth. The Government of Jamaica understands that MSMEs and social enterprises can elevate our nation, positioning Jamaicans at the heart of our development agenda. With that realization, the Ministry champions a strategic targeted approach to fostering economic growth through greater partnerships and synergies 
amongst our ministries, the private sector, and all stakeholders that nurture MSMEs. Jamaica's business ministry wholeheartedly support PIOJ's community renewal program and its collaborative initiatives with the Ministry of National Security, the Social Development Commission, the Jamaica Constabulary Force, and civil society representation from the Violence Prevention Alliance within this crucial symposium. This program is specifically designed to target 100 volatile and vulnerable communities across the five most crime-affected parishes, including Kingston and St. Andrew, St. Catherine, Clarendon, and St. James. By focusing on these communities, the program aims to fortify the very fabric of our society. It will create opportunities for social cohesion, foster job creation, encourage entrepreneurial endeavors, and drive economic growth. Through this collective effort, we can effectively reduce unemployment, empower individuals with entrepreneurial skills, expand export opportunities, and ultimately contribute to the overall betterment of our nation. This collaborative approach holds the potential to bring about positive transformation in these communities, enhancing their resilience and fostering a brighter future for all. In any thriving community, the strong spirit of entrepreneurs and the energy of small businesses are evident. They create sustainable jobs, encourage innovation and entrepreneurship, and address community needs. Their growth benefits the economy and, more importantly, improves community well-being supports the vulnerable, and fosters lasting development. As such, the Ministry of Industry, Investment, and Commerce, Jamaica's business ministry, is committed to supporting our MSMEs through meaningful initiatives, such as our MSME business roadshows. In an effort to bolster the importance of our MSMEs, and catalyze their growth. The ministry, in collaboration with the Inter-American Development Bank, has successfully conducted the MSME business roadshows across three parishes to date. Mandeville in Manchester, Montego Bay, St. James, and Ocherius in St. Anne. <clears throat> the turnout of over 100 MSME business owners at each location underscores the enthusiasm for this initiative. We are now preparing for the anticipated fourth leg of this pivotal roadshow, which is set to take place in Kingston at this very location, the Jamaica Pegasus, on November 21st, 2023. The roadshow represents a critical juncture for MSMEs to actively engage with the 20 agencies operating under the ministry's umbrella other external government agencies, and financial institutions. This opportunity is designed to empower our MSMEs by enhancing their business capacity, expanding their portfolio of products and services, and positioning them effectively for future export endeavors. It is a clear testament to our commitment to recognizing the significance of MSMEs and actively working to nurture their growth, ensuring that they play a central role in our economic landscape. During the roadshow, these enterprises will have an opportunity to engage in on-the-site business-to-business transactions facilitated by our agencies. Business proprietors can also take important steps, such as official company registration with the company's office of Jamaica, initiating the process for trademark and 
copyright protection through Jamaica Intellectual Property Office, JIPO, seeking valuable business advisory services from the Jamaica Business Development Corporation. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Moreover, they can explore invaluable support services from JAMPRO to prepare for international markets, access export financing solutions through the Exim Bank, and explore additional financial options provided by our financial institutions, such as LASCO Financial Services, the Development Bank of Jamaica, JN Bank, Sajikor, and the National Commercial Bank. Entrepreneurs can also participate in a business pitch competition for a chance to win Jamaica 300,000 in cash grant to support their businesses. This comprehensive range of support and opportunities paves the way for these enterprises to thrive and expand. With over 90 nano enterprises ready to grace the upcoming local economic initiative, Expo under the banner Unleashing Community Enterprises Value Chain Integration, we are poised to demonstrate the practical steps towards elevating these community powerhouses within our export strategy. Therefore, as we delve into the symposium's discussion, let us take note that only through evidence-based practices, collective resolve, and unwavering dedication to ensuring sustainability of, of meaningful programs such as this can we develop resilient far-reaching strategies. I applaud the PIOG and its partners for their unwavering dedication to nurturing our marginalized communities. As the PIOG seeks to further nurture and strengthen marginalized communities, rest assured that the MIIC stands alongside you, committed to realizing an economically flourishing Jamaica for every citizen as we seek to collectively establish our beloved country as a place of choice to live, work, raise families, do business. We stand with you, resolute in the mission to actualize a prosperous economy for all Jamaicans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hyatt. I now in invite Mr. Delroy Simpson to close out the greetings for this morning. Mrs. Rochelle White, Chairperson and Senior Technical Advisor to the Director General at the PIOJ, the Honorable Faval Williams, our Minister of Education and Youth, Ms. Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General here at the PIOJ, Mr. Omar Sweeney, Managing Director, JCIF, Mr. Omar Frith, Deputy Executive Director, SDC, Dr. Elaine McCarthy, Chairperson, Jamaica Umbrella Group of Churches, and I might add, my, my lecturer many, many years ago. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. Partner agencies and their respective teams, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Oh, that's a good one, that's a good one. Now, the Ministry of National Security has been a key partner of the PIOJ in the planning, resourcing, and implementation of best practice symposia over the years. That is because we recognize that crime and violence is a multifaceted challenge requiring a multi-sectoral response. We further recognize that best practice in virtually any sector will contribute to the creation of a safer society. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it is all interconnected. This symposium was first introduced in 2016, I'm told, through the PIOJ's Community Renewal Program in partnership with key governmental and non-governmental agencies, namely the CSJP, that's Citizen Security and Justice Program, JSIF, NHT, Housing Agency of Jamaica, of course, the SDC and the Jamaica Public Service Company. This year's symposium is guided by the theme, Transforming Communities Through Economic and Psychosocial Best Practice. As such, among other things, we are to deliberate on the economic and psychosocial issues that may contribute to crime and violence, as well as possible responses. 
The objective of the symposium has always been to showcase and document best practices in social and community de development and to stimulate and strengthen national dialogue and successful strategies in tackling critical development issues. Now I'm from the Ministry of National Security. Crime and violence, of course, is a critical national development issue. Additionally, just looking across the room, judging by the number of stakeholders that are represented here today, this symposium clearly offers an excellent opportunity for networking. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit that if we are to make meaningful progress in the crime reduction effort, the strength of our anti-crime networks must exceed the strength of the criminal networks that are operating in our society. I repeat, the strength of our anti-crime networks must exceed the strength of the criminal networks that are operating across our society. To the extent that this symposium focuses on community development, we consider it a key anti-crime network, which is therefore fully endorsed by the Ministry of National Security. And for that, we have to give credit to our partners at PIOJ for this visionary initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, as Jamaica continues to commit to approaching crime prevention in a holistic way, holistic way, we are cognizant that resilient individuals make resilient communities which translate to resilient and a transformed society. Vulnerability and volatility go hand in hand in many of these communities and therefore it is critical that we address the underlying issues that drive both. Through an integrated approach to development, the government of Jamaica has committed through the Citizen Security Plan to ensure that lives are truly transformed, thereby improving the socioeconomic status of residents within targeted vulnerable communities. We see this as a pivotal step in crime prevention. The psychosocial factors that contribute to crime are well known, but in order to transform our communities, we must first examine the root causes and implement strategies to mitigate these challenges. Admittedly, we are constrained by our fiscal realities. No entity here today is awash with cash, I'm sure. And that applies to the Ministry of National Security as well. Therefore, our ministry, in accordance with the joint MNS, MOEY, interministerial school support strategy, has targeted the most vulnerable to violence, and that's our children. Lessons learned from previous fora such as this have led our ministry to commit to the adoption of risk-based approaches and the utilization of a case management methodology. Taken together, this allows us to have a more targeted approach to crime prevention at the individual and community levels. In this approach, criminogenic risk factors, which include psychosocial issues, are identified through a collaborative effort, working with psychologists and other professionals, the necessary interventions are provided. In order to transform our, com our communities and by extension our beloved country, we need all hands on deck to combat the challenges we face as a nation. Data and evidence-based approaches must form the core of policy determinations. The best practices continue to recognize this and provide an avenue for stakeholders to share information and strengthen collaboration. Recognizing that although each challenge is nuanced depending on the stakeholders that you're looking at, there is a commonality that allows us to learn and improve, therefore provided for not mere intervention but social investments in crime prevention. In closing, it is our hope that this symposium at the end of it, as we return to our respective offices, we will share the information received and develop strategies and indeed policies that will assist in achieving our mandate of citizen security for all 
a safe and secure Jamaica. Do enjoy the rest of this, this symposium. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. Thank you to Mr. F Mr. Frith, Mr. Sweeney, Mr. Hyatt, Mr. Simpson once again, and to Minister Williams for the opening session and the remarks provided in the opening session. The role of the community was emphasized, the data, the importance of collective responsibility, the importance of innovation and, en and entrepreneurship from the perspective of the MSMEs. And we know the plug, Mr. Hyatt, for the MSME Business Roadshow on November 21, which I will reiterate. And I also want to communicate to you that on Friday, an expo for local economic initiatives, and a lot of our MSMEs will be involved, over 95 LEIs will be on display supported by the SDC, will be hosted at Devon House, beginning at 10 a.m., and that will end at 7 p.m. We encourage you all to visit and support uh, by purchasing from the LEIs and also viewing what they have on display. And the LEIs on display are from the vulnerable and volatile communities which the CRP supports. At this time, we note that currently it is 18 minutes after 10, so we are behind schedule. And to make that up, as we move into our coffee break, I'm going to ask you to take 10 minutes to get your food and to come back so that we can have a working break. And then move into our first session, which will look at transforming communities through psychosocial best practices. So I invite you to have your coffee break. The Community Renewal Program, CRP, was established in 2011 as a multi-level integrated intervention for coordinating and enhancing service delivery among 100 of the most volatile and vulnerable communities in Jamaica. 
Its primary objective is to achieve sustainable positive change among the targeted communities by harnessing multiple interventions under six broad thematic areas. These are social transformation, socio-economic development, governance, youth development, physical transformation, and safety and justice. The selected communities are from the five parishes that have sustained the highest murder rates over the last 10 years. These are St. James, Clarendon, St. Catherine, Kingston, and St. Andrew. Objectives of the Community Renewal Program The overall objective of the Community Renewal Program, CRP, is to contribute to inclusive growth and equitable national development by fostering the socio-economic well-being and enhancing the quality of lives of residents of volatile and vulnerable communities. The CRP Secretariat coordinates the implementation and monitoring of the CRP by building partnerships among state and non-state entities to ensure collaboration, coordinating and harmonizing development partners, state and non-state entities and institutions to prevent duplication and maximize the impact of interventions. The Planning Institute of Jamaica, through the Community Renewal Program, continues to support the process of policy formulation and development through the coordination and implementation of policy activities under the economic sector. Notably, in 2016, a policy committee was established within the PIOJ to facilitate stakeholder discussions and to advocate for the development of a legislative framework for the social enterprise sector in Jamaica. This advocacy was successful and led to the CRP's participation in the review and update of the MSME and Entrepreneurship Policy, resulting in the development and inclusion of a new chapter on social value creation being added, which received cabinet approval in 2018. The CRP now chairs the Social Enterprise Working Group, a subgroup of the National Policy Implementation Committee. Monitoring and Evaluating to strengthen the MND capacity of the Community Renewal Program, a web-based monitoring and evaluation database was introduced in July 2020. This system is intended to be used by CRP implementing partners to plan, track, measure and report on the performance of interventions under the CRP umbrella. Coordination and collaboration among the agencies within each parish is facilitated by the Parish Interagency Networks established by the Social Development Commission, SDC, to facilitate coordination and collaboration among the agencies within each parish. Let's now listen to Mr. Charles Clayton, Program Director, as he explains the CRP's theory of change. The CRP recognizes that agencies working by themselves in silos are unable to accomplish the kind of change that is needed in the spaces where we have social problems of the kind that we are addressing. So if we expect communities to be able to be transformed into in spaces where people can operate in, in a mainstream society, then we have to be more targeted in our approach. We have to target the issues that need to be addressed more intelligently and we need to work together in an un competing kind of way. So what the CRP brings as the theory of change is a process in which agencies that are working in common spaces are working in support of each other rather than against each other and they are targeting the issues that need to be addressed having been informed by the data that is available and there is a process that is defined with an end game inside that says this is where we want to be in this community and this is the role that I will play versus the role that another agency will play and at the end of the day we are able to measure the change we have accomplished having worked together for a common good in the particular sphere that my agency is responsible to work in. For more information on the CRP, visit the PIOJ's website or email us at info at pioj.gov.jm.
Jamaica Social Investment Fund, JSIF, celebrating over 20 years of investment in community development. JSIF has forged relationships with international funding partners as well as private and public sector entities. Let us continue to invest to reduce vulnerabilities. Let us build our social capital and resilient infrastructures to ensure full participation in Vision 2030. JSIF, investing for community development. The Social Development Commission leads the charge in community development. We mobilize and organize community groups. We produce high quality community data. We empower community groups to grow their businesses. We improve the quality of life of our citizens. The Social Development Commission. Building communities. Building Jamaica. Planning today. Securing tomorrow. The PIOJ story. The Institute's mission is to lead the process of policy formulation on economic, social and environmental issues and external cooperation management to achieve sustainable development for the people of Jamaica. The Planning Institute of Jamaica's inception as the Central Planning Unit, CPU, in 1955 was pivotal in anchoring development planning in Jamaica. Established to support the Office of the Premier in economic analysis and planning, it guided the birth of institutions like the Bank of Jamaica and the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation. The CPU evolved into the National Planning Agency, NPA, in 1972, with broader responsibilities including long-term development planning. The NPA was involved in the creation of institutions such as the National Housing Trust. In 1984, the NPA became a statutory body, the Planning Institute of Jamaica, PIOJ, with an expanded role in sustainable development, environmental planning, and international cooperation. The explosive population growth of the 1940s 50s and 60s increased the pressure on social services in education, health, particularly maternal health and child care. The Central Planning Unit supported the Ministry of Health and the National Family Planning Board in the formulation of the internationally recognized Two is Better Than Too Many campaign, which contributed to a dramatic decline in infant mortality rates and birth rates. Over the generations, my family size has changed. My siblings don't have a lot of children like my parents. The PIOJ and its precursors played a significant role in formulating policies aimed at achieving economic stability during times of uncertainty and crisis. In the early 1970s, Jamaica's economy was under pressure from the dramatic increase in oil prices. Based on the advice of the National Planning Agency, the government instituted the bauxite levy, thereby securing more revenue for the country. Oh, here, the the 2007-2008 was a global financial crisis and all of this was coming on top of an already difficult economic and social um, situation for the country. Our initial role, which was always central, is research and advice. Given that the situation was deteriorating quite rapidly globally, we had to find our own solutions, our own way forward. I think the PIOJ played an important role in, in that regard. In coordination with our development partners, IMF, World Bank, bilateral agencies, um, and other multilateral agencies like the CDB, we forged uh, an economic reform program 
The COVID-19 pandemic caused a sharp decline in government revenues, jeopardizing social programs. However, economic projections from the PIOJ allowed Jamaica to secure favorable adjustments from its lenders. A result was the CARE program, which provided relief to numerous families. Through decades of challenges, the PIOJ responded to emergencies, driving national projects and ensuring Jamaica's resilience. It was instrumental in Jamaica becoming a member of the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, CRIF, a regional fund for Caribbean governments that assists in post-disaster recovery and relief efforts. The PIOJ facilitates the integration of sustainable development considerations such as climate change, disaster risk management, natural resources management, and energy science and technology, among others, into national development planning. Over the years, the PIOJ has been mobilizing resources from external partners to fund investments and implement policies in relation to the economic and social sectors. The PIOJ has made significant contributions with respect to the demographic context, for example, the National Population Policy, the National Policy on Aging, the National Policy on International Migration and Development with respect to gender, also with health sector initiatives, such as postpartum mortality, HIV AIDS, non-communicable diseases, NCDs, with respect to social protection and poverty reduction, with respect to education and training, labor market reform and youth, with respect to national security, justice reform, governance, community renewal and development. We continue to provide data, conduct research and provide information, including the Jamaica Survey of Living Conditions and Poverty Mapping integration with global and regional development programs including Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and the Montevideo Consensus on Population and Development. The PIOJ led the implementation of major infrastructural projects including the North Coast Development Program. For the part of the toll from Cayman to Lindsay that has impacted my community and myself because I used to go to Arden High School and if Flatbridge was blocked, listen, we had to wake up from like 4 o'clock to ensure that we leave up by 4.30 in order to get to school for 7 o'clock. No, with the toll, all of that cut out. You can leave Bogwa from as late as 7 o'clock, you get more time to sleep. And for businesses, it's more efficient for businesses to move in between what we know as country and town. There was a paradigm shift in the approach to development planning moving from short-term to long-term cycles. In 2007, the PIOJ guided the crafting of Vision 2030 Jamaica, the strategic plan to put Jamaica in a position to achieve developed country status. The PIOJ also is responsible for coordinating the implementation of the plan and it serves as the focal point for Vision 2030 Jamaica and also the Sustainable Development Goals. It aims to transform Jamaica, to so address those long-standing challenges that have impeded our development. It also seeks to give us Jamaicans a chance to participate in developing our country towards achieving the kind of, of Jamaica that we want, not just for ourselves, but for future generations. The large and growing diaspora has been playing a role in support of Jamaica's development. I believe the people in diaspora are very interested in giving back and being a part of this one big community called Jamaica. We're just trying to find ways to get involved, help and see Jamaica become the best version of itself. The PIOJ, Jamaica's premier planning institution, continues to evolve to meet the changing needs of our country and the global environment. I envision the PIOJ as a place of choice for the brightest minds across the range of disciplines pertinent to the Institute to enable Jamaica through ideas, innovation and enterprise to increase in the pace of development and to become the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business. Can we please take our seats?
The Community Renewal Program, CRP, was established in 2011 as a multi-level integrated intervention for coordinating and enhancing service delivery among 100 of the most volatile and vulnerable communities in Jamaica. Its primary objective is to achieve sustainable positive change among the targeted communities by harnessing multiple interventions under six broad thematic areas. These are social transformation. We will now be moving into the meat of the matter, beginning with session one, which will be exploring transforming communities through psychosocial best practices. A uh, lot of the speakers this morning made reference to the importance of the psychosocial as we devise best practices. This session will be led by Mr. Orville Simmons. Orville Simmons is the Senior Case Management Coordinator in the Crime Prevention and Community Safety Branch in the Ministry of National Security, where he provides oversight to the Interministerial School Support Strategy, a collaborative effort between the Ministry of National Security and the Ministry of Education and Youth, which seeks to identify at-risk students in selected schools and provide the relevant support to them using a case management approach. Prior to his current engagement, Mr. Simmons spent over 20 years in various capacities with the now closed Citizen Security and Justice Program, the Ministry of National Security's largest crime prevention program to date. Mr. Simmons, importantly, also worked at the PIOJ and the Jamaica Social Investment Fund and has extensive teaching experience in Jamaica and Nigeria. I'm going to now invite Mr. Simmons to lead us in the session, Transforming Communities Through Psychosocial Best Practices. Please help me welcome him. Uh, I'm sure the minister will see with me if I say all protocols observed. Yay! <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues, my co-workers, it indeed is a pleasure to be here this morning to facilitate this session on the psychosocial. Uh, I'm sure all of us here are quite aware, we're quite seized with the role that mental unwellness is playing in our society. It's there in our schools, in our families, in our communities. It is for this reason, in the course of the work that you know, we do at the ministry and what we see, that we suggested to PIOJ um, that this year, let us focus on the psychosocial. And I'm happy to see, not because I was once employee <laughs> at PIOJ, but you know, they accepted um, that suggestion. Also, another reason why I proposed it, there is a, a wind of change, if I may say, going on in the Ministry of National Security. It has been there for a while now, but it's becoming more, you know, stronger and stronger. I've been at the ministry for over 20 years, and ladies and gentlemen, this is the first Minister of National Security that I've seen, and I've gone about seven or eight of them, who is so committed to the psychosocial, especially as it relates to minors. Dr. Chang, you may, you may see him talking about Zozo and you know, state of emergency, etc. But that man has a very, very strong commitment to the psychosocial 
lives of the most vulnerable. And so today we are going to have a little discussion on that matter. We are going to be focusing on the psychological aspect of it, though we know the connections that are there. We have been working with young people for quite a while. And one of the main things that has come out always is a sense of hopelessness that young people have, the feeling of hopelessness. We did a survey once and about 70 odd percent of young men, young women, you know, indicated that they felt hopeless. And so what, have, what do we see? We see they're trying to find hope in the hand middle. We see they're trying to find hope <laughs> maybe in the middle of other parts of their bodies. Serious thing. We see them trying to find hope in a Roman boom. And even today, we are seeing young people finding hope in dunceness. It's unimagin unimaginable the impact that this has on the lives of young people. Students in school, the high levels of PTSD, aggression, impulsivity, that are wreaking havoc with our students in primary, primary, and high schools. The other day, SSP Dillon was on a television. The senior citizens increased levels of domestic violence among senior citizens. And what is that causing? Violence among senior citizens, some of them killing them one another. And so today we have a very distinguished um, group of persons here who are going to be having some discussions with us. Um, we have all the way from Mexico, Dr. Ma Bauche Madero, our Jamaicans, Dr. Kai Morgan, Dr. Shetty. And we have one or two persons who will be giving some testimonials. Let us, we're going to start with our distinguished guest from Mexico, Dr. Madero. Dr. Madero has been, you know, working in the field of social development and violence prevention for almost 20 years. He has worked on various violence prevention projects in Mexico, um, and particularly in the area of cognitive behavioral therapy and violence prevention, and he has also done some work with our partners here in Jamaica, in particular USAID, FHI 360, and the work that they have been doing in communities. He is a co-founder of Pro Sociedad in, in, in Mexico, which is a social development consultancy, where he's a senior consultant and is involved in social impact projects. He has a wealth of experience in research, diagnosis, design, implementation, and evaluation of social programs in different local, regional, and national, international settings. He has experienced both basic and applied research. Dr. Bauche Madero, did I say it right? Bauche, right? Right. Madero is also a professor. He teaches topics related to the design and implementation of social violence prevention programs. Among other academic achievements, Dr. Bauche holds a doctorate in psychological research, a master's degree in social development, and a bachelor's degree in psychology. He's here with us today for us to discuss this matter of the psychosocial, in part the psychological, with respect to violence prevention. Dr. Bauche. Madero. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I believe that the presentation is already there. Thank you. Is this the, I, I believe this is the Google Slides last presentation, right? Do you know? Okay. Uh, well, my name is Carlos Bauche. I'm really 
Happy to be here. This is sec my second time in Jamaica. We've been working. Thank you. We've been working with. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, it's working. Let's see. Okay. We, uh, I'm, I uh, have the fortune of working with a very uh, professional people in Jamaica since 2019 at the end, 2020, so it's, I'm very happy to be here. I'm, uh, I work uh, with uh, Dr. Morgan closely. Uh, then I met uh, Grace and staff, Curtis, uh, and some other people that are not here today, but uh, I've been following what you've been doing here in Top CBT, and um, I'm really happy of what you're achieving. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of our lessons learned. These lessons are also uh, part of sometimes from failures and sometimes for they are lessons from successes. So, uh, by the way, uh, excuse me about my English. I'm not my, it's not my first uh, language, but also I may uh, make some mistakes while I am uh, speaking. Okay. So, let's see. Should I point over there? Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Planning Institute of Jamaica um, and uh, Community Renewal Program, the, the IDB, the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, the Ministry of National Security, and the Social Development Commission for making this uh, symposium. Congratulations for, for, the, for making this symposium. And okay, first of all, the most uh, basic thing to say here is that violence is a public health issue. It's not uh, only a crime issue, but it's a public health issue. So this is be why, because this is why the World Health Organization has been involved in in violence and and crime uh, behaviors and issues since the last century. So there are many things about violence that are related to uh, public health. So we need to understand it broadly in that. The, also the United Nations have uh, included violence and crime in some of the sustainable development goals like number 16, peace, justice and strong institutions and number three, good health and well-being as you will see. Um, also, violence is not only a public health issue, but also, and importantly, a mental health issue. As you see in the target 3.4, that says promoting mental health, and the target 16.1, reducing violence everywhere. The United Nations and the countries that are in tune with the SDGs recognize that violence and crime and violent crimes have a public mental health issue that needs to be addressed. So it's not only through more police officers, through more efficient uh, investigations, how we end uh, crime and violence. And as you see in the other slide, there have been a, a lot of, uh, sorry, there's been a lot of research, meta-analysis on the things that are uh, related to, uh, to violence, like antisocial behavior, antisocial personality patterns, antisocial attitudes, antisocial associates like peers, family, education, employment, and all, all, all these factors. So it's well established that there is a relationship between these factors and violence and crime. So, okay, and we also need to recognize that violence and uh, and criminal violence has uh, something to do with uh, the Convention of Rights of the Child. So we need to recognize that people, the children that uh, suffered mental health uh, 
um, so, suffered some violence at the homes, at the neighborhoods. They were, uh, sometimes their rights were violated. So the Convention of the Rights of, this, of the Child established this uh, framework. They emphasized the right to mental and emotional well-being of the, of, of, of the children. And sometimes they recognize that people that are adolescents that are already involving in these type of behaviors is sometimes because they, uh, their rights were violated and need to be restituted. How can they be restituted? Uh, well, mainly through these services that you provide and also, of course, through CBT services. Okay, this is a recent this is a recent um, study published in uh, Nature that establishes the age of onset of mental disorders. As you will see, some of the most important mental health disorders are, um, are set in different stages of their lives. And as you will see, personality disorders, behavior, mood, and substance abuse are establish our onset in some ages that are very important uh, uh, for cognitive and and uh, brain development and you will, as you will see as well this is also related to it, the age crime curve so uh, if you you may notice a pattern here so this pattern show us that in these stages from 14 to 20, 21, 22, the prefrontal cortex and the cognitive maturity needs to be uh, well developed and sometimes this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen and this, it creates a lot of suffering for the people themselves and to others. The studies have shown that this uh, universal or primary prevention is not enough and that we have found that sometimes we need to focus more on where are the more uh, risk factors, for example, where is the people more segregated through uh, racism, through ex social exclusion from uh, education, through uh, poverty, and, and, and we will notice also a pattern, right? And this pattern shows us that the risk factors uh, need to be addressed differently and we need to focus uh, and do more prevention that is more secondary and tertiary prevention. Uh, we need to work differently with, with people. It's not enough just to, uh, to try to do primary prevention and uh, help all the people in the same way, but sometimes we need to use our resources, our economic resources, to work differently and focus on the people that are more at risk. <coughs> okay. Well, our experience, we've, we've been doing uh, CBT for secondary and tertiary prevention in Mexico for many years. Uh, we've been working with in different states or regions of Mexico. Uh, we have worked uh, directly with uh, people that are more at risk and we have tested the model in different settings. Which, uh, we have a model for school settings, we have a model for justice settings and neighborhoods. We have our theory of change that uh, I won't, uh, I won't um, spend much time on it. But basically what we do is we do CBT plus social inclusion. We have found that CBT addresses the agency and social inclusion uh, addresses the structure. So if you, if, you, if you just work with the structural problems, you, you may miss very important things of the individual. 
And if you only work with the agency, the individual issues of the adolescents, of the children, of youth, then the structural issues can make the, all the changes uh, go back. So for us, uh, in violence and crime prevention, there is no CBT without social inclusion uh, components. Like case management, like services for school, like services for, uh, for poverty programs, etc. Okay, and our model, it's focused on, uh, to simplify it, we work on the person and the environment. And uh, when we work with the person, we try to work what is called the propensity. What, what are the history of behaviors that may, uh, they make more probable, increase the probability to behave in a more uh, violent way. And this is what we call sometimes the, the match. Uh, and the environment can be the, the gasoline, the oil, right? What can create the, the problem. So sometimes the environment, the situations, the, the people that are more prone to violent responses, they, are, they don't, do not respond violently in every time, in every case. Like, if I have a violent uh, prone response, I won't be hitting people here in this Congress, right? So probably if I am in another place, maybe I am drinking alcohol, may, maybe I am with some uh, peers that they like to, to be more uh, masculine and more aggressive and more uh, uh, masculinity normative uh, behavior, maybe my behavior can be more aggressive in another place, right? So for us, uh, risk, uh, violent and uh, crime behaviors are not only about anger management. Um, anger management is very important, but we have found that it's more a risk. Uh, there are many, many emotions and many patterns around uh, behavior and, and uh, uh, like crime and violent behavior, such as fear of rejection, need to belong into a group. Of course, anger, sometimes it's jealousy, sometimes there's a girl on the, on the, that is uh, with another guy, sometimes it's resentment, some well, resentment due to uh, history or past histories. Sometimes, sometimes it's more self-regulation issues, sometimes it's more a fragile ego, pride, victimization, and among other things. And for all this, we need to have a CBT protocol, curriculum, that addresses not only anger management, we need to address uh, like more at risk patterns. So for, for us, this is how, how it works. And in the same way, we, ha we need to find what are the incompatible patterns. We need to increase self-confidence. We need to increase less need to please the group. We need to increase more tranquility, serenity, trust in others, acceptance of my emotions, forgiving, of course, when there's resentment, humility, empathy, and compassion. So. This is how we 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 try to to do to do it, and uh, there are many. All these risk patterns can be they have a cycle in in psycho social in psychology. We can we can understand it and CBT a cycle. There are triggering events, there are antecedents, there are things uh, vulnerability vulner vulnerabilities that are prior, there are negative thoughts uh, that we can change through CBT. There are emotional responses that we can address and we can learn to understand. There are physical symptoms that we feel when we, when we have these risk patterns, such as anger, jealousy, 
resentment. And there are behavioral responses. These behavioral responses can be by words or they can also be by fighting. Uh, and as you may see in these five areas, there are CBT techniques and strategies to address this, all these five. Even if you want to, to help someone to understand their triggers, their vulnerabilities, how they in, interpret, how they, how they react uh, to, the, to their own thoughts, how, or, or how they have these thoughts about the, what, what is happening outside. The emotional responses they, they do, and the physical symptoms and the behavioral responses, you need some, uh, like at least more than 12 sessions, of course, and uh, sometimes you go, can, can go up to 24, 36 sessions, depending on the risk. Um, and uh, all this is, uh, it's, uh, has to be included in a more uh, broad sense with other components of social inclusion as I was saying. <clears throat> well, some of our research, okay, I'm having a little bit, okay, let's see. Well, we've been doing some research and we have uh, made some randomized control trials and uh, quasi-experimental uh, trials. Okay, I think I need to point over there. Where is the computer? Over there? Okay. Okay. Thank you. And, sorry, it's I think I need to understand this better. Okay, so, to, so some of the examples, I will, I will share some of the examples of some of our res own research agenda. Uh, first, I will focus on uh, a study we made in Monterrey, Nuevo Leon. Some of you have visited Monterrey in 2019, uh, like Charles, any, anyone else have went to Monterrey in 2019? Okay, I believe only you, Charles. Okay, and, and there was a big group of, of Jamaican professionals, among 30 professionals that went there, and they saw this uh, implementation. And uh, what we did is we worked with schools. We worked with, uh, we, uh, we did a risk screening of 2,000 students, and we chose the 15% of the students that were more prone to risk patterns, more prone to, to violence and crime behaviors. And we work for them, with them for 15 sessions, group mentoring and mentoring for social inclusion. And we have, what we have found is that uh, we, we were able to reduce the impulsivity uh, behaviors. They were more able to, to respond to the situations instead of reacting automatically up to the situations, they were more able to uh, change their physical aggressiveness and verbal aggressiveness responses. And they were more able to reduce the exposure to situations where the triggers were more uh, effective on them. So for example, if a uh, a guy knows that he's more uh, explosive when this and this condition are present. They were more able to understand the situations and to avoid the situations or to change these uh, activities to others that were more helpful for them where these, where these uh, triggers are not so present, like sports, like music, like uh, other activities, computing, uh, uh, like learning how to use the computer, etc. So the, for this, uh, for us, this, uh, this data was very useful. It helped us to understand that the program was working. After that, we did a uh, randomized control trial. 
And this randomized control trial also uh, helped us to see that uh, the program was working. So this program, we shared this program to with uh, FHI 360, and we uh, we made uh, cultural adaptations for Jamaica. And I, I, I believe you will hear a little bit about that later. So conclusions. Some of the conclusions that we found is that CBT and group CBT can reduce psychological risk factors. The main modified factors that we reduced were, were the reducing violent criminal involvement, aggressiveness, impulsiveness, and we were uh, and we and we did some um, subgroup analysis. This is uh, this is in Spanish, but I just want to show you that we did a subgroup analysis, and the summary of this analysis is over here, which we uh, found that nonviolent uh, that, that that we could understand when the program was more effective, depending on the characteristics, prior characteristics of the participants. For example, uh, if they had more involvement in criminal history, nonviolent criminal history, the program increases the size of the effect. If they have low performance ac academic, the program was more effective with them. It also, if they had attention deficit and hyperactivity traits, the program was more effective, and if they were males and over 15 years, the program was more effective. Some of the things that that decreases the size of the effect, still it was a significant effect, but decreased the size, is uh, when they have greater anger management issues, we uh, learned that they need more sessions, group sessions, or maybe they need more individual sessions that uh, can complement the group sessions. We also understood that the program was working differently between males and females. Uh, and uh, this, this requires a further discu this discussion. Uh, it was more effective with males, probably because it was designed more for males. Uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the beginning, we, we understood that 90% uh, in Mexico of the people involved in behavioral and crime were male, and we have this bias, right? However, we still need to address this 10% of female better. We found that when the program was being implemented by psychologists, the program was more effective. When we tried to do it through teachers uh, or social workers, the program was effective, but it was not so effective. So what we learned is that we need to train different, differently social workers and teachers if they are going to be involved in this program. And in, probably in Jamaica, as well as in Mexico, we don't have enough psychologists uh, in the schools. It's expensive, and uh, we come from a, a country that is in development. We are not like United States, as probably as Jamaica. So we need to find uh, creative ways to creative ways to uh, address this. Uh, also, we found that that the psychologists that were more had more experience with the risk, at risk youth were more effective on on delivering these programs. Uh, sometimes we uh, we hired people that were very good psychologists, but they didn't have experience in working with youth at risk. And as you may know, uh, this requires to understand them. And some psychologists they fear them, uh, or they don't, they don't know how to work with them. So what we found is that if you want to hire people for working with CBT, you need to, you need to have, have these two characteristics, preferably to be psychologists, otherwise uh, increase the training a lot, and uh, preferably uh, have people with experience in judo risk or otherwise, uh, hire them and wait for maybe six months or a year until they can run a program by themselves because they need to 
understand the language, they need to understand the culture and subcultures, they need to understand uh, the pain behind the aggressiveness, no? they, they need to understand that uh, different things, right? <clears throat> so we d we've been doing some research and as I was telling you, the last one that we did is a randomized control trial and we've been, we've been uh, learning from this and we've been learning how to make the program better. So every three years we update the curriculum, the curriculum that we shared uh, in 2020. Uh, now has changed, but we, we've been sharing with Dr. Morgan some of the things that we updated, so she could uh, also uh, include them in the top CBT. Okay, so, so just a quick uh, thing on general, uh, general, in a more general way. First is uh, we recommend that we work more with the nonprofits and NGOs for each 10 cities and organizations work in the communities. We have found, the studies have found 90% uh, reduced reductions in homicide rates, so 4% uh, in robbery rates and 6% in overall right crimes. So for us, Partnership with, uh, between government and nonprofits or community organizations is very, very important for reducing violence prevention. Secondly, uh, we, we have found that there are many challenges faced by organizations. Uh, some of the organizations and community organizations, they have, uh, Sometimes they cannot sustain their programs because of their income. They are depending on this budget, and sometimes they are not able to generate enough information or data for the program impact. So we need to work with community organizations, but at, at the same time we need to address that sometimes these organizations have some weaknesses, and we can uh, partner to to help them on that. Then we have found that when the organizations have pre-existing methodologies, they are more skeptical or they, are more, um, they have more difficulties on uh, adopting CBT as a curriculum, as a protocol. Uh, and I understand that sometimes organizations, they, they, they develop a sentimental link with their own programs. So using a CBT or a foreign program, a program that comes from the outside feels weird at the beginning. So uh, if you want to scale CBT, you need to understand this as well. And also uh, we need to understand that we, it's not only about preventing, it's also about promoting. So uh, promoting inclusive youth development promoting social inclusion, promoting and understanding other needs that these people, these the youth people have, is very, very important. And um, we have found that CBT and other evidence-based therapies are not only useful for violent uh, crime behavior, but also we can work with different protocols to address trauma, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and other issues. And basically, I believe that uh, that's it. So I, I have 40 f seconds left, so I want, to show, I want to share with you a conversation I had. I went to the Kingston Airport, and Maurice, the driver, uh, was telling me about his life, so I asked him if he belonged to a, a gang. He told me that yes, he, he did. Uh, well, a group, it's not specifically a gang, but it was something similar. And I, t I asked him, why do you think people engage in, in gangs? And he said, it's all about power and respect. And I asked him, why do you think they don't find power and respect outside the gang? And he said, well, 
it's a system. This is how it works from the top to the bottom. So my reflection on that was if we can, through these programs, through CBT, increase power and respect the power to, to, to choose from their own lives, the power to decide differently in every situation, and the respect and dignity they deserve. So that's it. Thank you. Carlos, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Carlos. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I did not have coffee, you know. But right now, me say me belly full. Me belly full, Carlos. He doesn't understand that one. <laughs> wow. What a wonderful presentation. I'm sure we, want, we feel as this is just the beginning. Tomorrow, we're going to have Carlos again with a, sorry, a smaller group of individuals. He's going to have a workshop with us. He's going to go into more detail. But I guess I just want to emphasize, Carlos mentioned two things in his presentation there that really struck me. Aggression, impulsivity. These are two things that are wreaking havoc. Aggression, impulsivity. When you mix those two, wow. And we see them every day especially um, with our youngsters. The, the agency versus the structure. That's a big one, Carlos. Big one. The individual versus the wider environment. And we see the interplay between, you know, individual issues and dysfunctions and the wider environment. How to treat with that is a biggie, biggie, biggie. And we would love to hear more, you know, about how you treat with the agency with the issue of the structure. Because whereas we can deal with agency in some way, when it comes down to the bigger thing, ha, trouble there for us. Um, appropriate techniques. Psychologist, you know, it's best to have psychologists as against teachers or social workers trained in the field. They can be trained, yes. So, you know, but the better thing is to have the psychologist there and the appropriate psychologist. Not just who finish university education and have book knowledge or don't know how to engage your youngsters. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Kai, it's your time. <laughs> Dr. Kai Morgan, everybody know Dr. Kai Morgan, right? She's going to follow on um, Carlos and you know, talk, tell us about the top CBT work that she has been doing um, in schools. Do I need to say anything? You're a registered psychologist who treasures... All things psychology and family, very importantly. She has been lecturing for the past 25 years in various topics, clinical psychology, um, psychopathology, neuropsychology. There are some others here that I can't even pronounce. <laughs> Dr. Morgan is the immediate past president of the Jamaica Psychological Society, co-chair of the Professional Practice and Standards Committee of C. A N P A. What that, you got to tell us what that means. <laughs> Sits on executive board of the Lister Mary Gilby School for the Deaf, etc., etc. She has spent much of her life's work uh, with children, especially youth, within the context of violence and improving um, mental health. Um, she is a founding executive director of Kale Journey, a nonprofit focused on her life's journey which is creating trauma-informed Caribbean societies. Dr. Kai Morgan, welcome. Greetings, greetings, everybody. Um, give thanks, Orville. Um, it's Caribbean Alliance of National Psychological Associations, you hear? So, okay, so let us talk a little bit now, following up, actually, my presentation really follows very nicely from what you just learned, right? Because when um, Carlos spoke about the visit to Mexico in 2019, 
that is where FHI 360 at the time, nonprofit organization, had been investigating an evidence-based model to work with youth violence, right? To work on the youth. And that is where the, the, um, the program in Mexico, Role, right, is, is um, where it started. So then coming over to, to us, into Jamaica, and wanting to bring that program um, to our to our um to wait i'm sorry hold on okay all right so that is the program we call the top cbt program which was adjusted and adapted and i want to spend some time kind of telling you about that process because that process of the adaptation and then the implementation is is one of the best models that I've been involved in at least when it comes to evidence-based work, right? Something that uh, we've, we think and we talk about a lot in our field that we don't see and hear and, and experience enough of. So I'm going to talk to you about two programs that, that I'm involved in. The top CBT, which, which stands for Transforming Our Perspective with Cognitive Behavior Therapy, and then the Interministerial School Support Strategy. Okay, and then challenges and recommendations. Okay, so we start with the top CBT program, and it's a USAID-funded program. Um, okay, and currently, so, so, so it started, as I said, with FHI 360. That project had, has been completed, and currently the Democracy International's Positive Pathways is actually also continuing, expanding, and sustaining the work for top CBT in Jamaica. And FA, the, the, the project in um, Positive Pathways also includes issues around family or supporting their work and their focus also includes families and parenting. So it's actually a, quite a nice support to the top CBT program. So, okay, every time I press it, it goes back ways. Okay. Okay, you're doing it. All right, so don't put down my thing then. All right, okay, give thanks. Okay, so let me start with talking about, I said local partner development, which is where FHI 360 came in. And that was the introduction to the role model. And the whole process of localization and adaptation took place. So the, the, we got the curriculum from Carlos at Pro Sociedad and a team of us psychologists looked at this, looked at the curriculum reviewed the curriculum, made some shifts, some changes, a number of changes that we thought would have been um, adaptive culturally, right, for us. The program is very interactive, so it has a lot of, it has a lot of um, action, a lot of art, a lot of music involved, and so we infused our own realities into the curriculum. After that came the, the training of the facilitators, or really around the same time, training of facilitators. So I facilitated a training which Carlos and his team with, and our teams and, and a group of, of um, individuals with the Ministry of Education and Youth was, has always been very closely involved in this program as well. So that was included. And then we started that adaptation process. That then we went to the pilot. The first pilot, I see Curtis. Curtis is here. Curtis did the first pilot um, with Ganesh at, from Grace and Staff. They conducted the first pilot, which we then utilized. We, we spent quite a number of days breaking down that, the, the results of that group that was held with Carlos again. Carlos came and, and worked with us, and we broke it down. And when I say almost line by line, right, we're talking about... 20 to 24 sessions that were had. We broke it down. We spent a lot of time looking at nuances. I remember one of the more significant shifts that came from that was a, pro, was a particular module that we had that looks at, that looks at uh, mask, the mask that we all wear, right? And I remember typically that one is at number, is at number four. It's the fourth session, uh, fourth or fifth session. And while, while we talked it through, Curtis had been concerned, Dr. Sweeney, where is he? Oh, there he is, right? <laughs> he was concerned that there wasn't enough, there hadn't been enough cohesion at the time for the group, 
right, before, for, for that to happen and to actually bring the meaning forward for and what it was supposed to do. So we moved that one to session number eight. And then after, so that was just one little piece of some of the things that we did. So we broke it all down and we revised that the curriculum then became a little bit more um, solid. More training, more facilitator training, more um, with supervision. So then we had the multicultural, the multi care, sorry, youth foundation also become involved in the process. They'd been involved in the process, but uh, to also do some training training of guidance counselors, psychologists. MNS was at that training as well. I see a couple of those ladies here uh, that did that training as well. So we do more training. So lots of training going on, lots of adaptation going on, and then more piloting. So we did uh, about maybe about 10 more groups within the next four or five months at the time and then took all of that data to look at what was really happening. Use that data also to, re to, to make any final tweaks and changes to the curriculum. What were our facilitators finding out there? And while we were doing this, we were having supervision for all of the facilitators while that was happening. We would meet, you know, like a community of practice every week and we would discuss the groups, what was happening, any shifts, any issues, challenges, recommendations, et cetera. So all of this process, again, happening. We did about 10 more groups, and then we finalized, for the most part, because we feel like the curriculum, like Carlos said, in their curriculum, they move it, they shift it every three years, they have an adaptation. We'll find that there may be one or two things here or there that we need to, that we need to amend, right? So we finalized the curriculum at that point and then uh, did some work on the did some work on the numbers right put all the numbers together to see what was happening what really was going to um, what was going to be the outcome right and that's another piece that again is so critical that we don't get to that we don't often get to do so we had the pretest a very important part of the model is doing the pretest looking at the impulsivity the aggression and the pro-social behaviors and then measuring them after the intervention right so we know is this really working uh, something we do not do enough so we had that data we pulled it together. Uh, then you can, yes, thank you. Right, so the sessions, I'll tell you a little bit, just a little bit about what the, the, the data showed at that time. The data I have ends, ends last, at the end of the beginning of this year. So we, and I want to also tell you a little bit about what the group entails, right? What does this top CVT, what is it, what is it doing? What are we addressing, right? So we have automaticity, identity, and future projection as the three areas that we utilize to address impulsivity, aggression, and pro-social behaviors, right? So automaticity, we're talking about the impulsivity, really, right? Or automatic ways in which we behave. We don't think about it. We just, we just move, and all of us do it, right? But when we have certain, um, quite certain other issues, which Carlos pointed out in his presentation, you're more likely to respond in particular ways when you're vulnerable, right? So we have that addressing most of the sessions, around 10 of the sessions are focused on automaticity. Then identity, you heard also Carlos talk about the importance of building self-confidence, right? Then who we are, who we are and who we are in, our, in relation to self, family, and our community. So we, we have modules that address that as well. And then we have modules that address future projection. Essentially, where am I going? How am I, who would I like to be, and how am I gonna get there? Career-wise, uh, family-wise, self, etc. So we talk about all of these things in around 18 to 24 sessions. We broke ours down, it's, it's the initial, the original role model has 24 sessions. 
we tried to figure out how we could, could we get it to be as effective, as efficacious. Uh, they had experience with shorter models that did work. So we said, okay, how can we pull them together, pull all, get all, everything done in about 18 sessions. So we did break ours down to 18 sessions with a couple sessions that are in there that look at, that are maybe ceremony, you know, to celebration or a midway, a midway kind of, um, kind of recognition of where the participants are at and work with the, the, with the, with the participants one to two times weekly. Tw twice weekly was the, common, was the common way that we worked and we worked in schools and we worked in the communities as well, right? The school model and the community models were, not, the, the, the curriculum was the same but some of the challenges were different, right, as we, as we might expect. And these youth were medium to high risk youth. So they had been all assessed. So they pre-assessed them with the CSJP, the Citizen Security and Justice Program Risk Assessment Tool. And that tool helped to, to um, place them medium to high risk, right? So the facilitators also is a very important thing, very important in terms of how well they're trained and then how well they're supported as well. Because again, as part of this model, the supervision, the community of practice was really very important to how the model works, right? The mentors is also important because we had a mentor, at least one mentor that was, that was um, connected with each of the groups. And so that mentor was also somebody that could then reinforce the information right so we're meeting twice a week which we found it can work with once a week but we really like the twice a week simply because of the the cementing of the information then we had the mentors who then are able to maybe follow up they would come to the groups in most of the scenarios they are a part of the group as well in most of our groups so we have that we had that kind of support we also had linking activities which is really important, which I, is the social inclusion piece that Carlos was mentioning. Really important, a number, if not all of our, all of our group participants were doing skills training or some other kind of activity or, there, or some, something else because what we do know is that one thing will not work, right? It is not a silver bullet. It cannot, CBT group by itself is not gonna do anything without the supportive mechanisms that are around it. And some of them include the mentors, include the types of faci the, the facilitation and the support of the facilitators, but also linking activities for themselves, right? One group, for example, I think that was your group, Curtis, that had done like a little, um, a little um, music, a DJ something, right? And they recorded it. I think as part of their, one of their sessions, they did something in a recording studio and came up with a little rhythm beat, you know, song, something, you know? So some of those things as well are important. And as I mentioned, the pre and post testing, very critical because we don't know if what we're doing is working and how that outcome is, how, how, what's that outcome if we really do not measure what it is that, what it is that's happening, right? So we had about 88 participants in those, in the, in, up until, the beginning of this year before, before it is, uh, has been expanded by, uh, by Positive Pathways, the, those 88 participants, we saw that most of them, 63% of them had reduction, levels, redu reduction in their levels of aggression, right? So that was a really, really important um, piece. They had, we had less so for the impulsivity about 36% and about 50% of them showed some type of increase in their pro-social behavior, right? So we're talking about your, your recognition others about others, right? They need help, some empathy, that kind of thing is what we're trying to measure with the pro-social behavior. So there were some differences as well um, in gender, um, but those I think we need a little bit more analysis. We showed less, less of um, the decrease in impulsivity with girls, which was very interesting. So there needs to be a lot more in terms of digging into the data to be able to kind of pinpoint some of those things and why it is that the model works this way versus that way, or, or those results then are a little different for, for girls 
um, we did have most of our, uh, the, 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 the sample was pretty much split. Most of our groups had a mixture of boys and girls. We had a couple groups that had only boys. And so we need to look a little bit more at that, at the data. Go ahead. Right, so in terms of best practices for the top CBT, we're looking at a model that is really evidence-based. And something that we emphasize when we talk to our facilitators and train our facilitators is about adherence to the model, right? Because the fidelity of the model is really critical to the results that we have seen, the results that we saw initially when we um, adapted the model from Role, what they've found, and the model that we currently have, which is showing um, significant improvement in our, in our participants. So we have to keep the model, the, the importance of keeping the, the, the model fidelitas is, is critical, right? So it has been culturally adapted for us all our facilitators looking at it, feeling it out, it has given us feedback in addition to what the expert team of psychologists did initially. The outcome measures, I cannot emphasize that more, being able to track what the behaviors are before and what the behaviors are after, the importance of our facilitators being adequately trained. You know, we do not have a huge complement, you know, of, of disposable mental health professionals, right? So we have to do and make and have creative ways in which we can, we can get these, these um, programs done. The challenges of the program, one of the things that we found very early on is that it doesn't address trauma. Now, any model, any program cannot address everything. So we're very aware of that. But that, that piece is really important for us in terms of trauma and in terms of what our youth, uh, how our youth are responding, some of the, the, the triggers that are facing them. And when that comes into play, it means the family comes into play. So that's a qu something that comes in, a, com a question that often comes, right, for us, is that are the parents involved in these programs, in the, in the, in the, in the groups? No, they're not, right? So we then need, again, supportive mechanisms. It's not going to solve everything, but we can, we, with this and with all the supportive services and programs and linking activities, then we have a better chance right, at the, the development of the whole person. It does require support, as I mentioned, with all those components in place and in place properly so that we can stay, we can, we can maintain the fidelity of the model. It does require significant support, right, to administer it and, and effectively, um, effectively implement, right. The, we're not sure also about long-term follow-up. So that's something that we need to look at and we need to be able to figure out is the sustainability of the shift, of the changes, right? We all know, okay, you've done this program now for about, you know, 10 to 12 weeks and you've been involved in it, infused in it twice a week with all the support and then the group, the group, is, the group has ended essentially. When you now go back into your environment, you go back into the communities, into your families, into the schools, etc., where maybe you are then faced with some of those similar triggers, right, that, that were feeding into the acting out behaviors, aggressive behaviors, impulsive behaviors, then how do we sustain, right? How do we sustain that? So that's something also, and again, comes with the support that, is, that needs to be around the, um, the, the, the model. So the second one I'll talk about real quickly is the interministerial school support strategy. It's um, in uh, the, the psychosocial piece of it. So the psychosocial piece of it started in February 20, this, this year, 2023, uh, even though the program itself has been in existence for a little bit, we, uh, for a few years, we started now with a team of 17 counselors. You can go to the next slide, right? 17, 17 counselors that we work together as a team in different schools, in, these, in all these schools. So Augustown, Chetola, Coburn, Den Denham Town, DuPont, Edward Siaga, Greenwich, Kingston, High, 
Norman Manley, Papine, St. Alban, St. Andrew, St. Peter Clavers, Whitfield. So these are, the, these are the schools that we are in, working with some 100 students that had been identified as the most vulnerable, as of the, the Ministry of National Security. Between February and August, we had 452 sessions. So let's say an average of four sessions per child, but it was, there's a range, and some children actually had around 12 sessions. That's the other thing I'll mention that I think has been really important is that um, it was also for me the first time in an, in an endeavor and in alliance with, with an organization that we were, we had the capacity and we had the breadth to have more than four to six sessions, right? Because normally we are limited, we are limited resource-wise and we're told, okay, this is all we have, what can we do with this, right? However, we were able to have 18 and with everything that is going on and with the challenges that we note with our youth, Four to six sessions doesn't do anything. By four to six sessions in the group, you're just seeing the group beginning to kind of to, to become cohesive and beginning to then trust, right? So that has been major as well. So it was also major here in, the, in this program to be able to have the window and the capacity to have more than four to six sessions, right? So this is the beginning. We continue, we're still there. This, this data was just pulled from the February to August, right? So, so we're trying to, and there needs to be more support. So we have um, the 100 students, we have the 17 counselors who are really, I really have to um, give them a whole lot of props and the case managers, because that is a piece of the program that has been really very helpful, the support, again, from the case managers on the ground. So the case managers who are assigned to each of the schools, the counselors are assigned to the schools, and they work together to be able to identify. These are indiv this is individual work now, right? So these children had been identified as the most vulnerable, high risk for violence, and so on. And so we're now doing this tertiary prevention, right? So, so we had... 50% of them get at more than five sessions, right? Some received, as I said, up to 12 sessions. We as a team meet every, every week. We meet and we discuss all of the, the, the issues, any successes, any challenges, recommendations, et cetera, et cetera. And we talk about that on a weekly basis so we can kind of keep and uh, uh, monitor what's going on and help each other with the... With the with the approaches, with what we're seeing, right? Some of the things that we tend to see are we see the trauma come up a lot, right? So a number of our children have what some of you may know, the adverse childhood events, right? And experiences, they are in it, right? There's a lot of neglect. There is a lot of, you know, missing school because of the neglect. So there are challenges in keeping, in keeping the, the program smoothly going with sessions, if you will, you know, there is violence in the communities at times where they don't, we, we can't get into the community to go to the school. There is, um, there's a lot of difficulty in mobilizing our parents, right, especially in the high schools, right? The primary school children are, it's definitely better, the, the better, it's easier to marshal them. When we get to the high schools, we're finding a little bit more of a challenge. So there are important strategies that I think we have to, we have to implement in order to get to our parents, to reach our parents, our families, and, um, and engage them better, right? So there's a lot of abuse going on. There's a lot of those kinds of issues. We've had to be in touch with the relevant authorities on some of the things that have been happening. There is um, a lot of anxiety and depression, you know, with our kids. There are a lot of antisocial behaviors. So those are the main things that we're seeing. And we see that the trauma likely drives all of it, right? Trauma, which includes the physical and emotional neglect, Right? In the research, we're seeing a lot. You know, we often think about trauma and abuse with the physical piece of it. But there's a lot of research that's showing that the neglect, the emotional neglect actually is causing a lot of psychological disturbance you know, 
and, and changes in the brain centers, right, that we didn't understand before. Things like dissociation that are more common when a child is emotionally neglected, right? So, so all of these things are, have come up as important things. They, they also, the remedial issues have come up, right? So sometimes we find we're not even able to work with a child effectively because the child is really not, is, cog is low, the cognition is very low, right? And, um, and so we have to kind of devise other strategies, you know, or try to figure out how we're going to do this. Or we feel like, okay, they need an assessment, right? We well, need a full assessment to see what is happening with this child from on a cognitive level to, to really kind of make some decisions. We have, they are having challenges with reading, with math, um, with writing and difficulty concentrating. The attention deficit issues are very high. We see a lot of them with those kinds of challenges. Sometimes it could be coming from trauma. Trauma and ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder have a very close relationship with each other because of the dysregulation that happens in the brain centers when you experience trauma, especially chronic trauma, then, then it is likely to look like inattention, concentration, and having those kinds of challenges in the school setting and other learning challenges, right? So we're noting the need for all of these types of assessments for the children so that they can be adequately also dealt with on that level. But then also we look at the, the system on the outside thinking about how then, okay, so we've noted this problem, maybe even we've got an assessment, right? But then what's next, right? How do we move into this particular, the, the next phase for this child that we may need to be advocating for? What's the treatment gonna look like? Who's gonna do it, right? How is it gonna be funded? Where are the resources for it? So those are some real challenges that we see as we, as we see these children uh, some of our counselors, as I was saying, have to big them up. They, they go above and beyond, right? And they go and they try to do home visits. They try to do, and this is not something that's part of their remit at all. But all of us are pulled um, at the heartstrings, of course, when you see these children in front of you and some of the things that they are struggling with on a daily basis, right? So. So we do, we've seen some from a qualitative perspective. We've seen some improvement in some of the behavioral issues. We've had feedback from some of the guidance counselors, some of the case managers, they, about some of the things that they see. Some children, they really are consistent with their sessions and we see some of the differences qualitatively. You can go ahead. Right, and um, the helpful, the, the, the efficacy of the program I think is built in all of these, in the case management approach, in the fact that we do have our supervisory sessions, our community meetings then, you know, and it also, we're finding that it's a space that the students are getting, are connected, they're feeling connected, right, with somebody, which, which a lot of them will say they don't have that kind of relationship or that feeling of safety with many people or anybody sometimes in their lives, right? They, so it's promising, what we're seeing is promising. We don't have any hard data right now with this program. Uh, we did not, we were not able to do pretests, which we really, really advocate for. Um, and then following post-tests, et cetera. Again, it's the resources. It's all a, a resource issue, but this is something that we need to be doing with all the programs that we have. We need to have more trauma-informed care in general, right? We need to have the three tiers of prevention in place, our primary, secondary, and tertiary. We need to have therapeutic. There are certain approaches that we need to be we need to be using tailored to our particular age group and, and the particular vulnerability or the particular challenge that the child is having. Go ahead. Right? And, um, and so basically, we need the strong referral systems, right? For those particular needs, we need our things to be evidence-based. The intersectoral collaboration has been a good practice from this as well. It is a collaboration with the MOEY and the MNS right, on this particular um, psychosocial support piece, that it, it addresses the needs, it's trying to focus on our most vulnerable youth, which we need, this is, this is critical for us as well. So we just see that 
again, I think I've said all of those, we do have insufficient resources and it is at the heart of what we think could make this a best practice, right? So if we can get that support, then I think that we could um, pull this together. Give thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as a young, as a student, you know, I wanted to become a psychologist. And this morning, you know, I'm so happy that I'm, you know, engaging with psychologists here because my failed attempt at being a psychologist, I'm here now, and I get my belly full. Dr. Morgan, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Resources, 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 evidence, 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 sustainability. We see it in many instances. The outcome is good. This has been reduced. The risk level has been reduced, etc., etc., etc. How long will that reduction last? Four months, five months, six months. And then we are back to square one. We have to pay attention to sustainability. Otherwise, we could be wasting a lot of resources. And so we have to, you know, um, make that big flag. Um, just in case you don't know, the case managers are MNS employees. I have to pull that, you know, um, plug for our case managers, the Ministry of National Security, because people think that MNS is only guns and police and soldiers. I have to acknowledge that lady at the back there, <laughs> Mrs. Olivine Evans, Minister of Education and Youth, a stalwart. There she is. Give her a round of applause, please. And supporting us in our in the interministerial school support strategy. I don't see Mr. Troop nor Mrs. Davison, but these are other persons from the MOEY who are central um, to this effort. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have two testimonials. Um, Ms. Joyetta Bryan, she's going to share some experiences she has had with the school strategy at her school, Whitfield Primary. And then we are going to have Nicholas Morgan. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more when Nicholas comes up. But for the time being, Ms. Bryan. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and fellow counselors and advocates, good morning. Today, I'm here to share with you our heartfelt testimonial on the incredible impact of this program. These interventions have touched the lives of countless young individuals and have the power to create transformation and hope where it's needed most. I had the privilege of witnessing the remarkable journey of several students who were on the verge of losing their way. They were caught in a web of challenges, a troubled family life, academic struggles, and involvement in risky behaviors. It was easy for them to lose sight of their potential and fall victim to despair. However, their lives took a different turn when they became a part of this interministerial school support strategy. This program provided a lifeline, a safe haven where they could express themselves, confront their issues, and find support from dedicated case managers, Ms. Simone Gordon and Mrs. Nikisha Jackson Powell, and our counselors. Our psychologists, Mrs. Valin Gordon Graham and Mrs. Judith Silvera, who willingly worked with them to overcome their struggles. It was here they began to rebuild their self esteem and regain their confidence. Through a combination of counseling and skill building activities, our students gradually transformed before our eyes. 
they started to improve in their academic pursuits, showing that they had the capacity to succeed when given the right resources and guidance. More importantly, they learned essential life skills, such as conflict resolution and effective communication that would serve them well in their journey into adulthood. These are a few of the thoughtful and well-structured approaches that made a positive impact in our student lives as best practices. First and foremost, building trust and rapport. Now, building trust and rapport is fundamental in creating strong, healthy, and successful relationships, both personally and professionally. It fosters effective communication, teamwork, and collaboration, which enhances their well-being and is a critical factor in long-term relationship sustainability. Individualized assessment, this is crucial for addressing the diverse and unique needs of our students in various aspects of their lives. From education and health care to personal development and social inclusion. It ensures that the support and interventions provided are tailored to their individual need, maximizing their potential as well as their well-being. Family involvement, now this is an essential part of this program. It provides emotional support, improving health and educational outcomes. It advocates for their well-being of their loved ones and contributes to their overall development and quality of life. We have skill building. This was essential for their personal growth, adaptability in this changing world, and overall well-being. It equipped our students with the tools they needed to navigate life's challenges and to seize opportunities as they came along. We have currently follow-up and aftercare. This supports our students in their journey toward positive change. It helps them to prevent relapse as well as crises, and it fosters trust as well as personal growth. And this is where our case managers follow the students after they graduate from our schools into their high school life. Now, moving forward, let us connect our students with positive role models, adults who were once considered youth at risk, who are willing to demonstrate that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. These mentors will provide guidance and also show that success is attainable no matter the challenges one faces. As these young people continue their involvement in the program, they will begin to dream of a brighter future, one they could shape through their own choices as well as their determination. As we gather here today, let us remember that this program are, these programs are not just interventions, they are investments in our shared future. They are a reminder that every young life has potential for greatness and it is our duty to nurture and guide them towards a part of success. Thank you for your attention, and I urge us all to continue supporting and advocating for these intervention programs, for they have the power to change lives and build a brighter and more inclusive future for our communities. Whatever has to be done, has to be done to keep um, Joetta at St. Peter's Clever, right? <laughs> the school is benefiting from her um, you know, presence um, there. Thank you, Joetta. Um, I'm glad to hear that you're you know, dealing with the sustainability part of it. You're continuing with it. Ladies and gentlemen, um, the person on the program who was due to do a testimonial, Tiane, Unfortunately, he's not here. He's from Montego Bay, um, and the um, state of emergency, which was announced this morning, I understand, has somehow you know, caused some challenges for him to be here. But um, I'm going to ask someone else to come up and say something. Nicholas Bryan, Nicholas Morgan. Nicholas, can you come here, please? Nicholas. <laughs> no. For some persons, maybe our visitors from abroad, um, you may have a little difficulty following me right now because I'm going to switch into another gear. 
Um, Nicholas is a shy man, eh? I'm shy. Nicholas no love talk. But let me tell you, Nicholas born in height. Him in height. Him born in height. Him grow in height. And by in height, I think you'd understand what I'm saying. Certain places in Montego Bay. That's where Nicholas is. But he has, you know, um, risen up and he was trained in top CBT. He has been working with the MNS for quite some while as a case manager, community liaison officer, case manager. He has been training top CBT. And he's going to share with us, um, you know, just his insight, his perspective into this matter of top CBT and the engagement of young people. I'm shy, I'm same nervous, but watch him, man. Just go on in it. <laughs> um, afternoon, everybody. And afternoon. Is that afternoon? afternoon? No, man, I have to know You know, I love the belly, you know, so I think it's lunchtime. Um, so it's afternoon, everybody. Yes, I'm a very shy person. Um, when it comes to stages like these, it's not me. I like to work in the background and give support. Um, Mr. What's his name? Mr. Madero. Mr. Madero and Dr. Kai Morgan. Um, earlier they mentioned something that is very important and I just want to pick up on it. I am not versed in the knowledge or the theory as they are our psychologists that are here. Um, but I can tell you that when it comes to being on the ground, being there, know what it is like to to to, to be in an inner city. I know what it is like. So when it comes to the experience of delivering or interacting, interacting, engaging at risk youths. I can say I have some, I have a lot of experience in that field. And some persons will ask me, Nicholas, why are you so good at what you do? You know, you're not the speaky spoky person. You're not, you know, you won't go up on stage and you won't talk about the things you do. I, I will not do it. But you're very effective in what you do. How comes? And I say, listen, it's the love. If you don't love this thing, don't do it. You, you must be able to connect. You must be able to connect with at-risk youth. So my friends who are speaky spoky, <laughs> my friends who like to use a lot of big words, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> um, so, CBT, CBT, Dr. Kai, I'm telling you, CBT, at first I was a bit hesitant when it came to the CBT, but I went to the training, you know, and I looked at it, and I must tell you that I'm, I was very impressed, and I'm still impressed with CBT. It's a good program, and Mr. Simmons mentioned I was a part of the street, too, if you want to put it mildly. And it was because of interventions that forced me to think. Think. Persons came to me and they said, Nicholas, there's a difference between wrong, right. There's a difference between how you can react. And as I grew up, I thought about these things. How should I react when I am faced with a situation? And that is what pretty much CBT allows you to do. It allows you to process, to think. 
And as a counselor, a psychologist, if you can't get a person who is at risk to start thinking, then in my opinion, I don't think you will be successful. That, that's my opinion. Because that person needs to make a decision for themselves as to what will I do when I am faced with a situation. And the situations of youths, at risk youths, I am telling you sometimes a split decision that needs to be made now can mean the difference in life or death or going to prison or you know what it can lead to generational intergenerational young wars you know so they need to think what do I do when I am in this situation um, TNE that's the young man that is supposed to be here unfortunately you know he's not here um, I remember there was once uh, an officer from the JCF called me um, Norwood is under a Zozo and an officer called me now and he said boy he identified himself and he said do you know this young man Tiene Brown I said yeah man I know him and he said boy you know we have him you know I said, what do you mean you have him? I said, we have him, man. You know, we, we're going to hold him for a while. And I said, what, what has he done? He said, nothing really, you know. Um, we just saw him. Um, he came on the road without shirt. I think he was in a marina. And, but he wasn't properly attired. And they, you know, they approached him and say, you know, who are you? Where are you going? And the attitude, how he responded to the officers, made them decide, you know, we're going to hold you. Because he reacted, you know, as ghetto youth. Some ghetto youth, when you, when you approach them, they tend to, like, get defensive, impulsive. Yo, we, you know? So I said, no problem. No problem. He said that he's going to, when I spoke to him and I explained to him the program that he was in, who I was, and I said, you know, talk to him, man. And he said, okay, we're going to have a discussion with him. We're going to keep him for a two hours or a three hours, and then we're going to let him be on his way. When I saw TNE, I said, TNE, what went wrong? Sir, boy, sir. The explanation that he was given was, what we would call a system, was a system, system one, the system one, right? And for those who don't know, in CBT, in the top CBT, there is a system one and a system two. And my fellow um, case managers, you can help me. Um, system one is, system one is the impulsive, impulsive. So TNE was demonstrating a basically a system one to the officers. And I said, TNE, what went wrong? You know, as I said, he couldn't really explain himself properly. And I said, Tierney, you see, that behavior is why we are doing the CBT. And I said, what could you have done differently? And he thought about it. And he thought about it. And he said, sir, you know, I could have done this. I could have done this better. And I said, okay. And I said, Tierney, that is what I want you to do. When you are faced with a situation, think about this, the consequences. Before you react, think about it. Even before you came on the road, you should have thought about, if I go on the road like this, I'm in a Zozo area, I know what can happen. I should dress properly, because if I don't, this can happen. You understand? TNE um, is a, um, I think he, He's 18, just turned 18. Um, he left high school without any subjects. Um, very impulsive, very aggressive. And I remember another sto um, story. While we were in CBT, you know, we had asked them to, to 
Um, I don't remember what, what topic we were, we were doing, but TNA response was, um, I think it was an encounter. They were to explain an encounter where they had reacted impulsive. And I remember he was telling me that there was, at school, there was an incident. There was an incident where he, um, you know, got into an altercation. I see my time is up. Um, just give me one more minute. And, you know, TNE said that, Sir Manila, stop up the boy. Understand? So my time is up, putting it short. Um, after the CBT session, or near the, near the CBT session, you know, um, I had some more discussion with, with TNE, and I kept on asking TNE, what's your thought process? What's your thought process? And the thought process, you can see that there was a huge difference in the thought process. You know, he was able to even secure a job, and he's still there now. Um, so, I'm sorry my time is up, but I can say that CBT process, the CD, the CBT um, program, it's a good program. Um, it has made a lot of difference, not only in TNA's life, but in other um, clients that we had had. And big up CBT, big up yourself, everybody. My you don't talk about him shy. <laughs> shy. <laughs> I don't like you talk on podium. Nicholas, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was a good one. And they say everything happened for a reason. Because here you heard the two perspectives. You know, the TNE and well as the Nicholas, you to rise up and now is a case manager. Again, we have to thank you and we have to thank all the case managers. Um, you know, who are in this process. We are going to defer the um, question and answer um, section until after our next presenter. And maybe I don't even have to say his name because he's right here. <laughs> and you all know him, but Dr. Ganesh Shetty. You know him, you know, he's a man at the Child Guidance Clinic. He has been doing a lot of work, especially with children. And he's going to share with us, you know, some work that he has been doing on a particular model called Bounce Back. Bounce Back, Breaking the Barriers. Dr. Shetty. Uh, good afternoon and greetings, my brothers and sisters. One love, one heart, and one destiny. Um, I am a little more shy than Nicholas, so to make me relax a little more, I would like you to stand up if you are comfortable. Can anyone sit and do this? I would like you to follow me. I will lead you in a, what I call two left foot dance. Okay? Come on, please. So I know that you are not still in the mesmerized state of my previous presenters. Okay, so this is how it goes. Say Jamaica, boom. <laughs> Kingston, boom, boom. Kingston, boom, boom. No problem, no problem. Feel airy, feel airy. Let's do it again. Jamaica, boom. Kingston, boom, boom. No problem. No problem. no problem. Feel airy. Feel airy. Feel airy. Good. Thank you. <laughs> While you're sitting there, I would like you to put your hands out and imagine you have a lemon in each hand. You have a lemon in each hand. You're going to squeeze it now. Squeeze it till the juice runs out and drops on the ground. Squeeze it. Feel how it feels in your arm and forearm. That's how you feel when you're stressed. Drop the lemons and shake it off. All right, pretend that you have a dumbbell in each hand. 
It's a heavy dumbbell. You can barely manage it. I want you to lift it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Don't drop it on your foot. It's going to hurt. Hold it up. See how tense is your shoulder. This is how it is when you're stressed up. Put it down slowly and relax. Okay. Um, I believe everybody has a belly button. Some must, some ones might be located a little deeper. Put your finger on your belly button. And push it back towards your back and tense your tummy muscles. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, and relax. Now, those who are sitting, put your feet flat on the ground and push it into the ground as if you are digging the ground with your feet. Press it down. See the pressure on your thighs, your legs. This is how it is when you're tense, when your boss is not behaving right and your kids are making a lot of noise in the background. Hold it and let it go and relax. Okay, um, now I would like you to imagine you're in your favorite relaxing place. It could be your bedroom, it could be your bathroom, it could be beach. I want to go to beach. And I want you to close your eyes and go to beach. Your favorite beach. Be there. Look at the waves. Feel the sand, your foot bottom, cool and nice. Feel the breeze across your body. Listen to the birds chirping and the greenery behind. And the fluffy cloud in the sky. It's a nice day. And you feel wonderful. You feel relaxed. You feel loved, you feel protected, you feel guided. Stay there for five seconds. My job is done. This is the most fun part of the intervention I'm going to talk about. And so we live in a monetary, military, missionary, materialistic system. It depends on the amount of money you have, which can buy many things. Military or militia or militants you can command, whether you are in JDF or DDF, Dance Defense Force. And missionary, the position you occupy and persuade the power you have in the religious establishment. And materialistic, the stuff you own and can flaunt around. These components of the system constantly influence and interact with each other and pursuit, preservation, and enforcement of these sources of social power greatly impacts society in myriad ways. Unfortunately, this influence extends to how we see and relate to our family, friends, classmates, colleagues, community, and other human beings through this faulty prism of power endorsed by this dehumanizing system. So these are the systemic barriers we have to break. And look at the monetary system. It influences you to view as everything is for sale and commodifies everything, including relationships. And a second farmer who was in trouble for selling weed and flaunting the money on Instagram, um, we were talking about slavery. It was the Emancipation um, Day week. And he said, Doc, no, this is brilliant. Slavery has been reinvented in the way of money. I said, explain it. Uh, in the slavery days, somebody will go down to Africa or India and give something to somebody, will catch somebody else um, in the tribe and sell them to the slave masters. We'll bring them to Jamaica and have the mother here working and send the father to Montego Bay. He'll get some other ladies uh, like him uh, pregnant to produce more mini slaves and they'll send the child to work in Clarendon. So they divide the family, take away their culture, take away their connection. But they don't have to do that anymore. I says, tell me more. See, my father could have stayed here but money was low, dollar was not strong, so he had to go to Florida to get some US dollars to work. And then he found a nice lady there and he forgot about my mother. So my mother has worked two jobs and by the time she comes home, she's tired and bored. 
And by the time I've done whole lot of homework, my school gives me, it's one of those good schools, you a lot of homework. Um, I'm tired and bored. So she sits in front of the TV watching a soap opera. I sit in front of a laptop doing my TikToking, Instagramming, and Facebooking. So they don't have to send me to Clarendon. I could be in the same house and be disconnected with my mother. It's a brilliant. And we have military system, as I said, globally, locally, and recently in Middle East. And material system which says what you possess is more important than who you are and what you drive is more important than what drives you. What is on you is more important than what is in you. And a missionary system, God bless those uh, clergymen who do some wonderful things for poor people, but God save those who exploit them and buy gas for the Benz car. And I wonder sometimes if everybody in Gaza was a Jew, will this war take place? And if anybody, everybody in Israel was a Muslim, will this conflict take place? And so many kids, as you can see, will be traumatized, losing their relatives and friends. Social system entices kids to get addicted to drugs, social media, video games. Uh, they don't know what relationships are about. We are in a sexualized society and uh, they get tempted and become parents when they're not ready. And media is a good source of information but also a lot of false information and a lot of them into fear mongering. Um, gory TV channel gets more visits. Education system, which makes you feel you're only as good as your grades, your future is only as bright as your grades and it stresses you out, it takes away creativity. We have to wonder, are we preparing them for future or just preparing for the past? So what are the domestic barrier peculiar to Jamaica? Cry with, which is crime and violence disorder, which is endemic to Jamaica, which is superimposed by COVID. Poor parenting practices where physical punishment is endorsed by culture and children are not heard or even seen. There's traumatization at home, traumatization at school, and communities so they have nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. Poor psychosocial support. One out of four children in Jamaica live in poverty. Can you talk to a child to go to school if he doesn't have breakfast, or clean water to bathe with, or clean uniform to wear, or little lunch, or lunch money, or bus fare to go to school? And okay, you give them some of that, and when they come home, they don't have electricity to do their homework. So, we have to decide how we're going to provide that before we can say that they're not going to school, they're not learning. And there's something called no breakfast ADHD in Jamaica. If you don't have food in your belly, you can't focus. And the violence is very prevalent. One out of five teenagers involved in violence in one of the studies, a lot of them carry weapon, and one out of 20 are stabbed or shot at at some point according to one study. A lot of kids. And they live in inner city communities and they're prone to depression, problems with drugs, behavior, and involvement in crime and violence. So, we have a legacy which we have to break through. And kids have it hard. They wonder am I white enough, black enough? Who wants me? Where do I belong? No respect. And am I fat enough, thin enough, sexy enough, Christian enough? Who are my role models? Or where do I look forward for guidance? Virtual world has its own digital dilemma, deluge, distraction, dementia, deduction, depression. 
and addiction. So we have adverse childhood experiences haunting them and predisposing them to mental and physical illnesses. So all the slavery is abolished, the tools are left behind which are used on a regular basis. So they disconnect us, separate us, divide us and classify us. So who is going to build this cat-off system? Who is going to make sure even a section of inner city community which is known for or uh, infamous for violence and crime that they can grow food in the backyard and get it before somebody thief it. They can get water which they don't have to pay because Jamaica has so much water flowing waste when it rains. And they can get electricity from sun instead of polluting the environment by burning gas and sending money to South Korea, is it? Are they going to uh, get a, a con uh, concession in transportation so they can not worry about bus fare to go to school? Who is going to build the cat? The cat is going to eat whoever is going to try first. So there are four foundational predisposing, precipitating, and perpetuating factors which fuel a lot of problems in the society. Poor parenting skills, poor psychosocial support to the parents, adverse childhood experiences, and unidentified and untreated mental disorders. And they fuel crime and violence, drug use, teenage pregnancy, you name it, as well as increase your risk of physical illness like diabetes, cancer, and such. And COVID has just made it worse. And these factors correlate with the factors identified by National Plan of Action Against children, Childhood Violence. And so solutions have been found for the problems, and there are solutions, and they have to be implemented with the help of uh, collaboration of different agencies, different players from different communities, as well as different ministries coming together. So till 2010, I was happy to work with five magnificent clinicians in the child guidance clinic at Comprehensive. I was seeing about 1,000 children, which is about 5% of the target population, Kingston St. Andrew, which is about 30,000 or so, and diagnosing kids with ADHD, conduct, learning disorder, PTSD, and operational defined disorder. Those are the ones usually associated with agitation, aggression, and such. And wondering what is going to happen to 160,000 children out there who suppose they have mental disorders and 40,000 of them who meet criteria for PTSD. And what is going to happen to one out of five adolescents who are either victims or perpetrators of violence? What about those more than 30% of inner city primary school kids who have symptoms of post-traumatic stress? And we're wondering we have to have a new approach. We need to move out of the clinic, into the community, into school to find these people and help them. And then ground zero of 9-11 of Jamaica. May 2010, security force operation in West Kingston resulted in 70 casualties and over 200 children and adolescents screened positive for PTSD. So we started scrambling for what we're going to do. Yeah, psychological first aid, yes, and there's trauma-focused CBT, which we used to use, but hey, we have 200 children. I have two more volunteers along with me to do this job. Impossible. So I went to New York, talked to the mother of TFCBT, Judith Cohen and company, and said, we have this crisis in Jamaica. What can we do? And she said, two CBTs. I said, what is that? Uh, cognitive behavior intervention for trauma in schools. And you can also do SSET. What is that? Support for students exposed to trauma. And we wanted to reduce PTSD symptoms and help address anxiety, withdrawal, low mood, and behavior problems, and so on. And this was based, the CBITS and SSET, in CBT model, where you're going to influence the thoughts, influencing your feelings, 
influencing your behavior. So CBITS is a skill-based group intervention based on CBT. It uses systematic desensitization, relaxation, exposure, and habituation. And it is in against... Uh, okay, go back. Okay. Uh, ESSET is also skill-based intervention as it derived from CBITS program. What's the difference? CBITS is delivered in school as is ESSET, but CBITS is delivered by mental health clinicians, whereas ESSET is delivered by guidance and counselors. It's 10 group sessions both, but they don't call it sessions. When it is delivered by guidance counselor, they call it lessons. And there are some individual sessions in CBITS which are not there in ESSET, including the one with teachers and parents in CBITS. And it was originally designed for ages 11 to 15, but it can be adapted for younger and older kids. Is it effective? Yes, the literature said yes. And um, so we said, okay, let us find out if it works in Jamaica. So we use some uh, tools like PTSD symptom scale, depression scale, SDQ and also clinical interview when we're doing the CBITS, but SET is just SDQ and PTSD symptom scale. And um, when we looked at the data after we had provided to 60 kids, uh, it was helpful. And also what was interesting is these kids, like four to 15 stressful life events were endorsed by 55% of children and 10 to 13 stressful life events um, while 30% of children in the sample are exposed to 14 to 15 out of 17 stressful life events. So the invasion of Dudu's land was just politically popular trauma. These kids were traumatized before, during, and after. Next. So when we looked at it and we talked to the community members, parents of some of these kids, they were so despondent and disappointed with everything happening. They said, Doc, can you teach us how to help these kids? Because nobody's going to come and help us. Although there are a lot of people trying to help us, including Kai Morgan with her sister in at that time. Uh, and they said, okay, we have to devise something simple, something non-clinical, which could be used in the community. So with help of some NGOs and so on, we trained some folks in the community, PIOJ was supportive at that time, uh, and they helped the kids in the community with this six session intervention. And it did show that 39% of them had improvement, 28% remained steady, but 33% showed decline. That's because they go back to the same environment and are traumatized by the same folks and situations. So unless we target that, we'll not make much progress. So we also looked at, hmm, we have just two guidance counselors per school. How many kids they can help at any given time? Even if you uh, squeeze it, we can see 10 people in a group intervention, so 20 kids per school, if anything, they're lucky. But we have 200 kids, so we have to do something different. So why don't we teach the teachers to use these strategies in this intervention to impart it to the kids in their everyday classroom setting. So in other words, they would do some uh, psychoeducation about what trauma does to people in the morning after prayers. And they could do some deep breathing during break. They could come back from lunch and do some muscle relaxation. And they can leave the school with a visualization, they can go home relaxed. Or they can do some um, two feet, uh, two left foot dancing also before they go home. Yes. So again, it haunted on us, hey, we have 160,000 children with mental disorders and 40,000 with PTSD. How we can reach them? And teachers were also saying, what about us? You're going to wait till we go to Bellevue? Next. So what we did is turned the teachers into kids during the training. And they'll go through the intervention as if they're kids who are traumatized. <clears throat> they'll come on a Friday, for example, and go through this one and a half hour intervention where they'll have a workbook to work with. 
and they will learn something that day, like maybe what trauma does to people, or maybe next session, what you can do, like breathing, muscle relaxation. And from Monday to Thursday, they're going to teach that in their classroom setting. And they'll get a copy of the workbook on their smartphone, and the, pair, the <coughs> principals will make some copies of the activities and hang it in the classroom. And some of our folks who are involved in this would go and visit the schools and see if it's translating into action. And then, you know, with any skill building, unless you repeat, it will not stick. And if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So <clears throat> Jamaica bounce back, or bounce back Jamaica has five sequential parts. It is derived from foundational prototype T of CBT and bounce back together where you teach teachers to learn this and go and use it in the everyday classroom is called bounce back together. And bounce back one is the same six session intervention delivered by guidance counselors for those who have been identified with trauma already. And they're going to use PTSD symptom scale. If it is, they are very seriously having PTSD, they'll refer them straight to the clinic. If not, they'll have them in the group intervention. They'll give the PTSD symptom scale after six session. And if it is not relieved, there's persistent problems, they'll refer them still to the child guidance clinic for further treatment. And bounce back to is a clinical intervention where they're going to go into things which needs a little more expertise, like creating trauma narrative, processing it, uh, helping them to deal with triggers, and also sharing their trauma narrative with family and friends and the um, participants. Uh, and <clears throat> helping them to keep themselves safe and look forward to our future with hope. Next. So we use this cascade training where we're going to train the clinicians and clinicians are going to go and train the teachers, uh, guidance counselors, sorry, clinicians, guidance counselors, and teachers in that way. And also we use problem-based learning. In other words, we're not going to have a weekend uh, workshop, a nice hotel north coast, Everybody enjoys it and goes home and not use it and forgets everything. So they have to learn today, use it for the next four days, and come back for the next session next week. And tell us what worked, what did not work, and we have made a lot of alterations and improvements and Jamaicanization based on the feedback we get from the trainees. Next. So this is just um, the outline of what is bound back together. Students are ultimate recipients. Teachers are uh, trainees who are trained by folks who are trained in this intervention, like guidance counselors, and this can be adapted to be implemented in church, because basically, let's start the congregation with some deep breathing. God will be ha happy about that. People have relaxed uh, during Sunday morning, right? And we'll end this um, congregation with a visualization where we're going to heaven. We'll be happy to do that, right? So it can be used in your Bible study sessions too. And it can be modified and used in other places like Jewel and Detention Center. And we have piloted it in the children's home uh, during summer, we call it therapeutic summer camp. Yes. Next, please. Okay, this is the clinical uh, and we don't want to stop there because we know that trauma is not the only problem they have. They have some neuropsychiatric disorders which need to be assessed and treated and that will be done in either extended bones back or what we call bones back better which need to be at least two years and we need to use what has worked elsewhere in communities and countries like ours like multimodal, multisystemic therapy and also we had to put it in a trauma systems therapy approach and we could use the bones back one and two as a part of it. So this is in a nutshell. You can look at your handout. That is a summary of it. And if you want to know more boring details, you can go to my website, Dr. Ganesh Shetty. That's a D-R-G-A-N-E-S-H, S-H-E-T-T-Y. You'll see this presentation this afternoon, as well as please check out two more videos there done by a young man who had gone through a lot of trouble. 
and one is called Jamaican Youth Violent or Violated. It shows how an innocent child is turned into a gunman by the society and the family and the community and the school. And also the last warning, which is the warning of young people of this country to adults of this country, that if you don't do something quickly, something which is helpful, you have to pay the price. And we are already paying the price. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Shetty. We are wrapping up now. Um, we'll come to a question and answer um, session. Um, how much time do we have for question and, and 10 minutes, question and answer? And questions can be fielded to anyone who was um, here this morning. There are two mics. Um, they're here. Um, I would imagine that if you have a question, you could just stand at either mic and um, in a line and, you know, speak. And um, presenters, um, do you... Ha okay, um, can, the, can the presenters use these mics? <coughs> They're going to be fielded questions now. Um, suffice it to say, though, that... The issue of dosage, I think we need to consider how much of what? Dosage in terms of the quantity and the quality. And that is something which we all have to consider as we're moving along. But most importantly, I'm hearing from Dr. Shetty an approach, and I heard from Dr. Kai Morgan um, an approach. In our little small space here, it seems as if we have to have some conversations to avoid what duplication, confusion um, in this particular sector. Working with children, working um, in schools, have uh, different approaches. Is that you know the best thing? How can we ensure that a level of collaboration and partnership takes place? So that even if we have two models, um, we're not, you know, stepping on each other's toes and causing confusion among, you know, practitioners, but most importantly, among um, participants. So we have a question there. We're going to ask you to identify yourself, please, and just field your question. You can identify the person to whom um, you're, you know, putting the question. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pastor Naveen Henry, and I am a part of the ministry system, <laughs> problem system, you know, that Dr. Dr. Shetty, you know, um, highlighted. I have questions for all the persons, all the persons who are sitting at the front. No, I am really... Um, like I'm embracing, I love everything I heard this morning. I love the initiative. I love the work that is being done. What I didn't hear was how, how is this work going to be expanded across the island? And I am hearing also that there is a lack of resources, you know, to really foster that expansion. I hear it clearly. Um, my church is in the, um, the associate pastor of a church that is in the, in the inner city community. And so Holy Trinity and those schools are near to me. And, you know, I have had to work with the Fletcher's Land Police Station to visit the schools, to have conversations with some of the troubled um, youths that are there. And let me tell you, the only solution the principals have is to just kick them out, right? And, and, like, it grieves my heart every time because they are not listening. Like, we're here to teach them. We're not going to be killed by them. Get rid of them. And so um, I'm happy about this intervention that is currently taking place and the initiatives that are taking place. What is the plan in place to broaden, you know, this initiative to create the impact that is needed? And secondly, I know that there is a psychotherapy unit at the University of the West Indies that is very powerful. 
I'm sitting there and I have a daughter who like, oh my God, why I didn't know about all these things before. I sat with her, she had mental issues. I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know where to get the help. I was so stressed out about it. And I eventually took her to, War 20, um, to the Universal Hospital. That's when I found out that there is a psychotherapy unit that has been, when I say it has been a godsend, very effective. What is the partnership with the psychotherapy unit that is funded by the government, that you have psychologists and psychiatrists that are paying their monies to be trained, you know? How are you partnering with these students to have this initiative widespread? Because that's missing for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not sure any of the panelists here may be able to answer the uh, question. Just a second, um, just a second, Dr. Shetty, on um, the expansion and on the resources. Um, but if there is any, you know, policymaker here in our audience, you know, who can treat with that uh, at another level, fine. Dr. Shetty, from where he stands at the Child Guidance Clinic, can speak about especially expansion of that facility. Okay. Um, I am very peeved about um, brilliant people have brilliant plans and they get funding from, usually from international funding agency and after a couple of years funding stop and the intervention which is demonstrably done well stops. So when I started my work I had a lot of resources which is myself and two volunteers and I put in sustainability in the um, program planning so that I'm proud to say that most of the stuff we did initially was done at no extra cost from uh, the, uh, to the region or the health department. It was all volunteers, including some of the volunteers who helped me to intervene. Um, and uh, that's the way to go. For example, if your church is willing, um, call me and I'll give you the workbook. I will train you guys. You can start that in your church. And if there's anybody in the community, in fact, I'm talking to uh, the, the Community Development Committee of Augustown tomorrow, uh, trying to impress on them how important it is they should try to uh, implement this intervention in their community. And I already, this afternoon actually, we are going to Augustown Primary School and we are trained. So basically, if everyone who can and is willing to, um, can choose a school, a church, a community, either of them or all of them, and start with Bounce Back Together, which is a basic non-clinical intervention, there'll be a good start. And then we have to have top CBT, um, multi-systemic therapy for antisocial behavior, trauma systems, but more complex, which might need professional intervention, professional to implement the intervention can be involved as such. But as a starter, as the uh, victims of crime, trauma, and abuse, and violence, uh, we can give them helping hand with bonds back together. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shetty. Dr. Morgan? Yes, quick response. The top CBT, I'll speak specifically to that. The, um, so currently, as I had indicated, it started off with local partner development. Um, the Positive Pathways currently is, has been scaling it, right? So there was some scaling done. So there is a, a more training. And these trainings, the important part is that is, is how is the sustainability. And so the training is for the guidance counselors, the deans of disciplines, et cetera, in the schools. And so the hope is that that's where we would like it to go, is that then these individuals have that capacity to be able to, to do the groups in their schools, right, as partnered with the MOEY as well, right, to be able to carry this further and to have it sustainable. So it's, it's in St. James. We did a number of the Nicholas that spoke is from St. James, and the group that he facilitated is in St. James at one of the, in the community. But there was um, a, a school as well, schools as well, that were part of the intervention. Same for Clarendon, same for, so there are at least six parishes that I can think of 
that have had this intervention and we continue to scale. We're still training facilitators, right, uh, uh, for example, going forward. So that really is the plan, we top CBT. And there is collaboration, right, that's happening because you were talking about the collaboration. Um, there are quite a number of um, psychology clinics or clinics that have psychologists attached to them in the public sector. The problem is that, the problem often is the is the wait list, for example, the resources, again, we'll go back to the resources, which is not a question that, as Orville says, I can answer. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Morgan. And just to share, and some of you might have seen it, you know, um, KMA has a child guidance clinic, Dr. Shetty. Um, there has never been one really in the Western region. And recently, um, you know, through the efforts of the Ministry of Education and Regional Office, our Minister, Minister of National Security, and the private sector, Sandals Foundation and others in the Western region, a site was identified for a child wellness center. Um, the Ministry of the Public Finance just approved about six different positions for psychologists, etc., for the child wellness center in the western part of Jamaica. So pretty soon, the western part of Jamaica will have a child wellness clinic. We hope that you know, we can have something in the center of Jamaica in a couple um, years to come. Thank you so much. We see another question um, here coming up. Is it for Dr. Bauche or any particular? I'm not quite sure. I think it could be for everybody. OK, <coughs> good, good. Identify yourself, OK, sir. my name is Keith Dixon, and I'm from the SET Foundation. Um, we focus mainly on neurodiversity. I'm ADHD and my other siblings are also neurodiverse. Um, as you all may know, 20% of the global population are, are actually dyslexic. So if I went around the room and counted five people, every fifth person would most probably be dyslexic. 35% of those individuals who drop out of school are dyslexic. 70% of our juvenile delinquents drop out, who drop out of school are also dys dyslexic. And 50% of adolescents who get involved in drugs and alcohol are also dyslexic. We believe, with the research that we're doing, and we're screening as we speak, that neurodiversity, which includes ADHD, dyscalculia, dyscalcul um, uh, autism, and also um, dyslexia, are prominent as we speak today in Jamaica. So my question to you all is, especially the professor on my right, your left, your right, is. You spoke in detail about your programs that you're doing in actually in Mexico. Have you seen a trend whereby neurodiversity is slowly rising to the, to the top, as we have seen it in some of our research in Jamaica? And this is both for children from five to the ages of 16 and adults as well. Thank Hi. You. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, just a quick answer. First, uh, we have uh, actually seen that neuro neurodiversity is very important in screening for, uh, for people that are at more risk of uh, violent and crime behaviors. Uh, for example, these patterns of the ADHD are uh, usually very important, and we have found that CBT programs are usually uh, very useful. The, uh, I, I don't know if you, sh if you saw the data, but people with uh, ADHD patterns or, or behaviors uh, had a better effect size in, in this program. And we, we are not sure why. We believe that it's because um, the way the curriculum is, uh, is designed and sometimes the school, the traditional, the traditional curriculum of schools are very, a little, they, they, we could say that they exclude a little bit the neurodiverse people. So uh, CBT can be a way to uh, approach in a different way to, to neurodiversity. And uh, a quick thing about sustainability, because I don't know, I know the time is up, is that uh, there's uh, recently uh, a 10 year study of people that participate in a CBT violence prevention program in the country of Liberia. And they found uh, 10 years, they followed the participants for 10 years to see if the program was sustainable, and which is a very important question. 
and they found that the program was effective even after 10 years of following the, the 999 participants. So that's just something to say. Thank you. Um, is, is, do you have a question there? Um, I'm sorry, we are out of time, but no, we'll have to take you. No, 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 we take um, this question, please. Um, quickly, Dr. Shetty. Sorry, please, just quickly. Till she finishes her question. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Rhea Rollock from Tourism Product Development Company. Um, Dr. Madero, um, I saw the graph that you had for the age group for children to adults 25 to 30 who experience um, psychological disorders. For those um, from 19 to 30, I noticed that more complex disorders were developed, such as schizophrenia and personality disorders. Did you notice any, or, or for the entire panel, do you know what the catalyst would be for the development of those disorders to present themselves? And, and if any type of study was done on how the, an intervention can be done to minimize the development of those disorders. Because like for me, um, I'm at the end of the threshold and I'm 30 and taxes are already you know, <laughs> affecting me. <laughs> so I wanted to know, um, is there anything that could assist with that? Yeah, uh, I think the, the, Dr. Shetty can, can uh, give a comment on this as well. And probably Dr. Morgan. Uh, each uh, mental health issue has different triggers, different catalysts, different uh, risk factors. And this is why it's very complex just to have like a universal intervention that can address every, every one of them. However, there are uh, efforts around the world to, to gather like the, like the main, to promote the main uh, mental health factors that can be like an umbrella to protect of, uh, from, from most of these uh, mental health issues. And it depends uh, on, and it, uh, on the stage, like if you're an early stage, or um, that, that, that means probably that you're younger, and, or you're in a late stage that you already have this issue, also the, the, the protocols and the treatments are different. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very hard question, but maybe uh, Dr. Sherry and Dr. Moran can go further. I, I will just add really quickly to that, that as one of those risk factors for looking at how we, how we prevent, um, trauma is a big one, is a huge one. It's a risk factor for a number of those mental health problems. Um, personality disorders was one of those that you saw in the later brackets. Um, and I'll speak a little bit to that one, that they, um, even though we don't diagnose a personality disorder until you reach adulthood, 18, et cetera, that however, we see the development of it coming from before. And trauma is very, very highly related to personality disorder development as well. So looking at how we protect our children and our youth in their, their emotional health is, is, is really a huge factor in, in prevention in general. Um, as I mentioned, the four foundational factors which predispose, precipitate, and perpetuate all the mental disorders you can think of, if they are addressed, will significantly reduce the risk of any child developing any kind of disorders which will eventually uh, emerge, like schizophrenia, bipolar, and so on. Although some neuropsychiatric disorder like ADHD and autism is born with you and becomes more and more problem as you face life uh, and more complexities of life. So if you can help the parents to do the parenting uh, in a way which is supportive and helpful, if you can support the parents uh, who are struggling with multiple kids from multiple fathers who don't support them uh, and such, and also they have to do two jobs to make the ends meet, that will reduce the frustration, that will reduce the taking it out on the kids. If we can uh, protect our kids from adverse childhood experiences, the least of what I put on the uh, presentation, as well as if we can identify and treat the disorders as they emerge early, you find them and help them, uh, better is the outcome. But before we go, uh, they say ungrateful is worse than obia. I don't want to. Uh, forget thanking P. 
PIOJ and Shaman and Orwell and all the good people there, as well as the teachers and the principals and the community leaders who have helped me with my work in the last 13 years. But also, I don't want to give a wrong impression that we don't need help. All the national, international, local folks who want to help, we need help to scale it up and make it available and effective. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Dr. Madero. Thank you, wonderful people. Um, I see some of us have already, you know, gone into the appetizer. So, um, I don't know, Russell, are you going to um, please? Yes. Thanks again. Wonderful session on psychosocial um, services for at-risk youngsters. The work continues, the conversation continues. Russia. Thank you so much, Mr. Simmons. And I will reiterate the thanks that you gave to all the presenters who uh, so ably spoke and touched on issues that are very important. As Mr. Simon said, lunch is underway, and it will be, as with the break, it's going to be a working lunch. Uh, we will allow some time on the program. Lunch is slated to end at 1.15. We will resume at around 1.30 with the program. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch.
far I can say that I think we are on track towards doing that. Our afternoon session, this afternoon, session two will focus on transforming communities through socioeconomic best practices, responding to social threats. And if we can go by how rich the session was this morning, I know that we are in for another good session this afternoon with the engagement and involvement of everyone in the room. This afternoon, we will be led by Ms. Charmaine Brim, who is employed to the PIOG as a technical specialist with portfolio responsibility for socioeconomic development within the PIOG's Community Renewal Program Secretariat. Ms. Brim has over 10 years experience in planning, designing, and delivering economic development strategies, working in multiple sectors. In her current role, she provides coordination, project management, and programmatic support to address socioeconomic issues at the community level and policy strategic planning and institutional support at the national and organizational levels. Ms. Brim is also a Justice of the Peace, a director on the board of the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, and she, in that capacity, she is chairperson for its selection and listing committee, and she is also a member of its monitoring and evaluation committee. Importantly, she chairs the Social Enterprise Working Group, a subgroup of the National Policy Implementation Committee, and is also a member of our SDGs core group and National Oversight Committee. As PIOJ's focal point for the social enterprise sector, her contribution led to the PIOJ being awarded the Jamaica National Foundation Public Sector Award. Ms. Brim is an avid Christian for over 18 years and a mentor of the Ministry of National Security's We Transform program. Please help me welcome Ms. Charmaine Brim. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is Dr. Shetty still in the room? I'm wondering if we should do that two left foot dance to ensure everybody <laughs> is okay. But, but I'm going to spare you. I think you are sounding vibrant enough. All right. Um, so good afternoon. I will seek to ably guide you through this process. So we're going to be talking about transforming communities through economic resilience. And when we think about economic resilience, of course, we're thinking about the ability of our communities to, to bounce back or to respond to different social threats. But I want to offer to us a, a definition because I think it is so on point to, to how we're going to be guiding our conversation this evening. And Arbon et al. in an article published in Science Direct says the term community resilience is used to describe the interconnected network of systems that directly impact human society at a grassroots community level, including the socioeconomic, ecological, and built environments a community is resilient when members of the population are connected to one another and work together so that they are able to function and sustain critical systems even under stress, adapt to changes in the physical, social, or economic environment, be self-reliant if external resources are limited or cut off, and learn from experience to improve itself over time. Or focus this evening when we speak about responding to social threats we're going to be looking at the issue of gang the presence of gang in our communities and we're also going to be focusing on the high levels of unemployment and so this evening we're going to be hearing from our international partners from homeboy industries we're going to be hearing from our local partner Dr. Henley Morgan, who is the CEO of the Agency for Inner City Renewal. We're also going to be hearing from the program director of the Community Renewal Program at the PIOJ, as well as Mr. Tariq Weeks. 
Now, before I invite our first presenters, so just to give you an idea of how we will flow, we will begin with two presentations, one from our international partners and the other from our local partner. This will be, we're going to ask you to hold your questions and then we'll flow into a panel discussion. And after the panel discussion, then we will take all your questions. So we're going to ask that after the first two presentations, you note any questions you may have and we will certainly be taking them at this segment for Q&A. Now, just to provide a little bit of information, the CRP recently conducted uh, baseline studies in 17 communities. And two particular things were revealed following a situation analysis. And it noted that among the reasons identified for the involvement of so many young men in gangs were a lack of employment opportunities, poor education and unemployment. The desire for socializing, safety, and belonging were also listed as pull factors or reasons for gang membership. It was also noted that young men were on the ends because they lacked parental guidance, their fathers were absent, and they succumbed to peer pressure or followed bad company. It was also suggested that young men wanted to get into the system to reap the benefits there, and some wanted to become shutters. And for our international partners, you know the expression shutters, Mr. Verdugo? No? So like bad man, you know, love fire gun. Shutters, yeah. All right. And so we're gonna unpack, we're gonna unpack um, all these issues relating to gang formation. We have the expert in the person of um, Tariq Weeks as well as it relates to gang formation in Jamaica. And we're going to hear from Dr. Henley Morgan in terms of his approach to using an economic model to engender community transformation. And so without further, further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Mr. Hector Verdugo, who is the Associate Executive Director of Homeboy Industries. And Homeboy Industries is a program that was founded in 1988 by Dr. Gregory Boyle for the purpose of providing a space for the rehabilitation of young men who have been involved in gangs. So Hector has been with Homeboy Industries for more than 17 years and was promoted to Associate Executive Director in 2009. His duties include overseeing the training program and training population, mentoring and overseeing Homeboy Industries' day-to-day -day operations. He is a part of Homeboy Industries' executive leadership team. Mr. Verdugo, his work at Homeboy is personal in nature as he too was born and raised in the Ramona Gardens housing project in East Los Angeles. He has stated that his goal is to build kingship with the most marginalized members of our, of our community. At, home, at Homeboy Industries, we strive to help gang members heal so they can move forward from high risk to high potential behavior. He is a Boeing Fellow. In, he, in 2010, he became a Boeing Fellow and completed a year-long leadership program through the Southern California Leadership Network. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Mr. Hector Verdugo. And whilst he comes, let me also introduce his colleague who will join him as well, DeAndre Comas. He tells me that he goes by the the name Dre. Dre Comas is the Director of Strategic Projects at Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, California, where he helps to develop and implement plans for ongoing success in developing areas for the organization. This includes housing and training, as well as leadership development. He has a background as an educator and youth advocate prior to working at Homeboy, and has worked with the Skid Row Housing Trust where he led a team of more than 80 frontline service providers as Vice President, Health and Social Services. He has also led critical initiatives with key partners like the Department of Health Services and the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority to bolster service provision whilst raising funding to build capacity in strategic areas. 
Growing up in Compton, California, a low-income community, Dre understands the severity of alternatives to incarceration, re-entry, and homelessness in Los Angeles County. He grew up gang-involved and justice-involved as a juvenile and young adult. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dre Comers. I believe just listening to their bio, we recognize that we, are, we have experts here who not just studied this thing, but they have lived it. So we look forward to their presentations. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for having us. This is our first time in Jamaica, so this is you know, an honor to be with you guys. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we, um, you know, we come from, from Los Angeles and, and we're gonna talk, talk a little bit of our stories, but first we're gonna open up with a video and uh, let's check it out. Go ahead and run that video, you guys. Thank you. My name is Miguel. I'm head of security, community relations, and there's no place like Homeboys. My name is X Cam. I'm a operations supervisor at Homeboy Electronics Recycling. My name is Marvin Kelly. I've been there 10 years now. I'm the manager of tattoo removal. My name is Inez Salcido. I went through the 18 month program and I am now the Substance Abuse Case Manager at Homeboy Industries. And Homeboy's success certainly is based on that we have grown many leaders from within the organization. I got to two tries in prison, that life wasn't for me, and I wanted to change. My mutual friend told me, hey, come down to Homeboy's and you might be able to get a job. I was at a dark place in my life. My family wanted me to get right. I wanted to get right. When I was in prison, I always thought nobody was advocating for us. That's why a lot of people in prison were just a number. They could judge us whatever way they want, but once they get to know us, they get to know the real us. Every person that comes in that door is treated with love and kinship and compassion. We come from broken homes, we come from, from the streets. When we come to Homeboys, we're here to offer something completely different than what we're used to, you know? We offer the love, the compassion, the unconditional love that we don't get when we're out in the streets. It's more about relationships with every single homie that walks in through the doors. We were those people coming in. They see us like, you know, we're bettering ourselves. They want to come be a part of the family, too. Doing security at Homeboys, you kind of become a therapist, a navigator, a case manager, a friend. It's an opportunity to give back, to work with individuals, be able to try to show them the right way of how to conduct yourself, being accountable, showing up on time. If you don't know these simple stuff, like, man, you're not going to be able to keep a job. The trainees need to learn, and you know, I want to teach them. The important part of being a trainee for me was like watching the, the leadership. It was important that they were homies because um, watching them, I was able to see that I could do it too, you know what I mean? What Homeboy does is restore and give hope. Once upon a time, I was them, and with hard work and dedication, just let them know that anything's possible. I'm in awe over what they stand for and their unbelievable commitment for the organization. People are going to make mistakes, right? It's good to know that, you know what, the door is never closed. No matter how down you are, there's a door that is always open. Homeboy Industries was the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's about the people that they need the help, they need the hope, a little bit of love and a little bit of self-respect. It's changed the way I see the world. The world needs more of Homeboy Industries, you know? I was supposed to die in prison, and I'm out here. So this is the dream. They're really good examples of what leadership is all about. There's no place like Homeboy Industries. We're willing and we're able. If called upon, we will show. Loving somebody and caring for somebody without knowing them, <laughs> it's one of those things, you know, that you're like, wow, this is it. I'm in the right place. As introduced, my name is Drake Homers. I'm with Homeboy Industries. Um, and today's presentation is gonna be a little bit different than the previous presentations. Uh, we wanna give you guys a little bit of more raw um, into what's going on you know, on the streets. Um, so a look into a rehabilitative approach to healing the most marginalized and oftentimes the most demonized. Next slide, please. Um, I think a lot of, you know, Two takeaways from that video, um, I would say love and hope. Love and hope, it's a 
major, major impact on a lot of folks who experience trauma. Trauma throughout their childhood, and they often lack love. They often lack hope within their neighborhoods. So at Homeboy Industries, we provide that ambition so folks feel they're worthy. They feel like they do matter, because a lot of the times they're treated as if they don't. And you know, throughout the trauma that a lot of people experience, Homeboy Industries helps over 8,000 community clients per year. And there's about 500 full-time trainees, uh, program participants, if you will, who are given job opportunities, job training, et cetera. So it's been an organization that's been around for about 35 years. And it really does focus on empowering and investing into the folks who are the most marginalized. So there's a lot of services, including case management, legal services, mental health, and education. All of that is great, but a person has to be ready to receive those things in their life, right? They have to be ready. They have to turn that light on themselves. So a great quote from Father Greg, he often says, you can't turn the light on for someone else. However, you can flash your, shine, your, you can flash your flashlight on the light and allow them to put their light on themselves. Right? It kind of goes to, I believe, Nicholas in the back was saying, they have to be able to think for themselves. Um, for myself, I too had to be able to think for myself. Uh, I joined the gang at 14 years old. I was first arrested at 16 years old and caught my first charge. At that point, I seen where the trajectory of my life was going, and I didn't like it. I felt that I could be better than that. And throughout all that time, I needed to process and start thinking about the consequences. But when you're angry at life or your situation, you know, hurt people, they hurt other people, right? So I had to first realize what negative impacts I was having upon myself and stop being mad at the world and my situation. Next slide, please. So with turning the light on myself, it allowed me to redirect my life into where I'm at today. And being here, standing in front of you all, here in Jamaica, I never thought I would make it here. I'm going to keep it real. But I'm here with Homeboy Industries, and we serve 100 and plus students who are enrolled in college. All right, over 100 plus technical assistance sessions by community-based organizations come to visit us each year, over 350 of them. Uh, there's 500 plus job training opportunities and about 4,000 more therapy sessions were attended by the trainees and program participants. 10,000 plus tattoo removals. As you can see, I'm not one of those 10,000. <laughs> but for me, you know, my tattoos represent my journey and where I came from and now where I'm going. Next slide, please. So with our theory of change and our philosophical approach, you know, like they were saying earlier, you know, all the big words, it's great. It sounds good, but you can't fix the problem behind your office and your, behind your computer at your desk. It won't work. You have to be in the trenches. You have to see exactly what's going on. And that's what we do at Homeboy. So for myself, being the director of strategic projects, I really don't care about the title. It's more important about the work that I do and being a black man in America, being representation matters. So it's another reason why, go ahead. It's another reason why I feel that, you know, I'm not gonna remove my tattoos because other folks, young men, may see someone like me and they can relate. But at the, higher, the hierarchy of, of most organizations, you don't see anyone like me. So again, your hope is lost, right? So for me, that representation matters so that they can see, oh man, he looked just like me. He used to be where I was at. And he's in this position? How do I do that, right? And for me, that's the most important. So I continue to fight more uh, prejudices and people's stereotypes. I love it. Look at me and think, you know, whatever you may, right? But you'll see through the work that we do and the lives that we change. And to me, that's the most important. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, 
and my homeboy, Hector Verdugo, to talk about some of the theories of change in, in the program. Thanks, brother. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know what, we've pretty much seen a lot of the presentations and they go, they go about this uh, theory of change. Now, I'm gonna, go back to, I'm gonna go back to my story of a kid in a home that right a, a week before I was, my twin brother and I were born, my father had died from a, um, an overdose of heroin. And then my earliest memories are my mom being a heroin addict and violence and her boyfriends and how that violence spilled onto us. So when we talk about the society of what's going on right here in Jamaica, like that story is very familiar. And then going into school and, and trying to learn and you got, you know, you're worried about going home and, and school is kind of like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not able to learn here. And eventually, by about 12 or 13, this is when your body changes and your testosterone kicks in and you, you, I kind of like looked at myself and said, you know what, nobody's teaching me anything. Nobody's helping me. I'm, I grew up with, with gang members all my life. My f grandfather was a gang member, my father was a gang member. And eventually, I, what Father Greg says, you give up hope. There's, once a kid gives up hope, that's it. He's going to get involved in gangs. And I got jumped into a gang. By 14 years old, I was already toting a gun, and I, got, I went to a juvenile hall for carjacking. And then, and then the foster care system and all, this, all these setups that were supposed to help me were, were just another, another poke in, in my side because you got people who are supposed to care, and they don't care at all. They're disrespectful, they try, to, they try to hurt you in one way or another, and, you, and you're, you're dodging bullets left and right. Who cares? Nobody. That's the way I grew up. And so you don't have a, a, a respect for authority. You don't have a respect for, you know, I didn't have respect for men. I didn't, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't women, you know, that's a whole nother story. And, um, and so here's this kid trying to make it in life and he's got nothing going on for himself. Of course, the criminal life was going to be my life. Going through um, drug dealing and, and, and getting more sophisticated. Um, eventually, at, at 18 years old, I got caught with some stuff and I went to prison. And was I, was I afraid? I kind of wasn't. I was meant to go to prison, and I knew that. I was, my older homeboy schooled me to go to prison and how to act and, and who you're going to see when you're in there. And so... I went to my university, to my, you know, to prison, and learned more criminal activity and come out a little bit better. And so, I come out, and I start running all kind of stuff. Once running all that stuff, um, you, you know, with money, you get lawyers, and lawyers, you don't go back to prison, and I'm literally dodging bullets, and, you know, dodging the law, and then I have my sons, I have kids, and then I beat this huge case that was supposed to put me in for life. And um, when I finally got out, and I, and I, I was you know, going back into the system, you know, going back into what I know what to do, like something just, like it was something in my spirit. I'm a Christian, I believe in Christ, and I've always have, but it was just like, God, don't let me get busted. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was the wrong way of doing it. You know what I mean? And um, so finally, I feel like my, my spirit woke up and said, there's got to be something different in life. And I remember when I was a kid in juvenile hall, I met Father Greg Boyle. And he was someone different. There was just something different about his genuine love, which we're all attracted to. We all want love. We all want peace. We all want to be hugged and nurtured without no sick mind behind it. We just want to be loved, you know? And um, I remember him in juvenile hall. He came to visit. And, and then finally, it, it, it came to me, go to Homeboy Industries if you want to change your life. And I came to Homeboy Industries almost 18 years ago. And um, I was 31 years old. I'd already lived, a, a, I feel like, a couple lives already. And... Um, and then it was just that, welcome home, son. And once, once it was welcome home and I chose to, 
I chose to, to say I want something different in my life, then it was like, okay, well, what do I do? And he was just, just get in and answer phones. Just, and then I didn't understand that in the beginning. So I, I just kind of got in, I answered phones, I you know, did whatever I needed to do around the office. It was, it was kind of silly to me. But, um, but then I would go to class. And then I started you know, learning about therapy. I started listening to, to people talk about change. And I felt like the mirror was up in my face. Who am I? Where am I going? What's going to happen to me? And um, I started doing a creative writing class, and I started writing about my life. And when I started writing about my life and thinking back, digging up the stuff, and it wasn't, I didn't think of it as a big deal. I thought, like, oh, let me just write about my life. Let me reflect. But that reflection brought me to tears and I had to stop because I was with other gang members. And I was like, I'm not crying right here, you know? So I was renting a room at the time, and I went back in there, and I wrote. And I started writing about little Hector and what he's gone through, and I just, I just came out. I just started crying. And I felt like God was saying, let it out, son. This is what you need to do. We need to take that. We need to, we need to heal all that pain that you've been carrying. And that pain has been transmitted to, to people on the other side of the tracks or anybody that I could dish it on to. But now we need to dissipate that pain. We need to let it go. And so I'm on that journey. I still am. And um, I'm from, from writing to therapy sessions to there's got to be more. I would, you know, we started cop coming out with EMDR. Are you guys familiar with EMDR? Anybody hear of that? that was, that's some crazy stuff right there. That's just therapy. And you're, you're talking, you're sitting down. And while you're talking to the therapist, you're tapping and they're doing some other weird stuff like that with your eyes, you know. You know? And next thing you know, you just start, I could sleep. Because I went through some rough times during, during my time at Homeboy Industries when I felt like I was healed by a lot of things, but then I hit a rough patch that was, that was devastating for me, and um, I had thoughts of going back to where I came from, and, um, I, and I knew that that could not happen, and so I did EMDR, and it just, it allowed me to sleep, it allowed me to feel like peace. It, it's crazy, look into it, you guys. So, Coming into homeboys, you get love. That's the biggest thing. It's like a triage when you first come into homeboy industries because I can't pay this and, you know, how am I going to get my ID? I got to do this and I got to do that. And everyone's just like, hey, take a deep breath. Breathe. We got you. No matter what, we got you. I remember Father Gray gave me $200. Go buy some clothes, son. And you're like, what? And that's what I need. I needed to grab a couple things, you know. And, um, and then making sure that we're all fed. I remember um, we moved into this big building, and I remember Malcolm X, and, and um, I remember, oh, the Black Panther Party in the United States, and I remember they had this breakfast program to make sure people had, the kids had you know, food in their stomach in the beginning of the day. And I was like, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make sure everybody has food. Except everybody came late at work, so we had to make it a lunch program. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, so people are fed. It's just like some grassroots stuff, you know? We're all just going to help each other. And as people come in, and people come in tough, because you're like you're on a prison yard, when you see the blacks and you see the browns and everybody's tatted up, it's like put your mask back on, you're back on the yard. And, and, and we, but do you notice anything different? My brother, do you, anything, do you notice anything different? Look around again. They're all smiling. Everybody's shaking hands. The brothers, the, the, the Chicanos. We're all just kicking it. We're all just one. And then everyone's shoulders start to go down. Like, oh, shoot. What's going on here? Yeah, this is family. You're in the homeboy family. And, and this is going to affect you big time. And the... This, this, this like energy starts to come out of you and you start to feel love and that love when you go home because we don't have a, a housing department yet but you will go home and that energy will affect the people around you and, and then you come back the next day and then you get refilled again then you go back home 
Next thing you know, your mom gets sober. The kids start looking at you different. You start to, you're going to work now. Now your kids are looking at you, waking up in the morning and going, going to work. Your homeboys are, are looking at you like, where are you going, dog? I'm going to work, homeboy. You know what I mean? Like, who hired you? You know, homeboy industries. Next thing you know, you have people saying, can I work there too? And then that's what happens. We have a probably, I don't know, we have like, I would say more than 100, 100 different gangs in, in, in our organization that people come and their homies want to come too. We want peace, man. We want love. This is, we're broken people and we want to be put together. We don't want to live like this. I mean, some guy, you know, the guys, they come up when they get frustrated. They're like, you know what I could make on the streets on the corner? Twice as much as this. I said, well, go. Go. But no one's stopping you. Your probation officer, no one told you to come here. You came here because your spirit was calling. But don't threaten me about going and robbing somebody. You know where you're going to go. We serve fresh water. And we've been thirsty. And out there is mud. Come, you're going to come back. I promise you that. And I, I say it to our staff, I say, look, people want to, you know, I love keeping people there, but if they want mud, they'll go back and get it. And I guarantee you this, they're going to come back. And we are going to have our, our arms wide open saying, come on back, you guys. You know what I mean? Because you know, we know what you want. And I love that. I love that we get to be a part of that. Um, I love that um, to see... You know, the generations of, of, I've been here for 17, so I've seen, you know, women pregnant. And then next thing you know, I see their, their kids are already teenagers. And um, they're not involved in gangs. You know, they're coming from school. You know, they're going to college, you know. Their mom's going to college, and they're graduating, you know. Unbelievable miracle. I call it the miracle factory of home, you know, is Homeboy Industries, where someone can come out, um, from prison, start, get their AA degree, and now they're already on their way to getting their doctorate degree. That's crazy to me, and I love watching it. I say to people, when you come to Homeboys, and you did what you did out there on the streets, and now you want something different, reignite your dreams. Those dreams that you had when you were a kid. I had dreams when I was a kid, and and now, I'm proud to say that I get to help my homeboys and, and other homeboys. I got these little vain dreams, I guess, I, maybe you could say, where when I wanted to be an actor, and now I'm an actor. I'm on a t I was on a TV show. I can't wait for what's going to come on next. And I'm a world traveler. I get, I've been all over the world. That kind of wasn't supposed to happen. But at Homeboy Industries, we make it happen. I made it happen for me. Homeboy Industries is just the path to get on. Father Greg didn't do this for me. I did this for me. He did this for him. And, um, and I love being a part of that. So I'm going to toss it back up to, to Dre. Yeah. Our time has come to an end. But um, I'm going to finish off with a few more slides because I think this is really important. Um, and with this, you know, a person's healing is not linear. It doesn't just, it's not cookie cutter, it's not one way. Um, for myself, education saved my life. So I wasn't able to be a beneficiary of Homeboy Industry Services. Um, instead, I went to college. Um, I was able to get a, a scholarship to play football. And at that time, a lot of my homies went into penitentiary. So I felt like I wasn't deserving of that degree because I should have been with my homies in, in the penitentiary. But that was wrong, that was just the wrong way of thinking. So this path that you see, this is most people's path. And this was definitely mine, starting in college, but still getting arrested, still selling weed to students so I could pay my tuition. All of these small things that were still keeping me back, you know, but eventually, now I'm in the blue, right? And I don't straddle that line. So that helps. Um, phase one, phase two, three, and four, these are all the phases that, that trainees go through when they enter homeboy industries. And again, it's not cookie cutter. They may go one, two, three, then back to one. But that door is still open for them to go one, two, three again. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and it's also important to have a secure base, support. 
is what we call a secure base. You got support holding one person. You got the employment counselor helping you find jobs, the work readiness trainer helping you prepare for those jobs. You got a navigator who's going to spend the day with you and kind of see you through your day. You got a therapist that you can, you know, go and see. And then you have a case manager. All of these folks are around you caring about your well-being and your journey. And we, you know, four years ago implemented a system uh, which is care for and the case manager can see the healing journey. It's cool to see outcomes. That's great. But it's more important to see their healing journey and where they're at because everyone's journey looks differently. Right. So um, this is the secure base. Next slide, please. And a lot of folks talk about our social enterprises. Right. A lot of our social enterprises, is, it, it sustains us, but it doesn't it's not the main sustainment. Um, we lead our social enterprises as more of a break even model because it promotes job opportunities. It promotes training opportunities. So that's the most important out of the 11 different social enterprises. Homeboy Industries has a $40 million budget today. Uh, 25 million of that is from fundraising and private funding. Uh, 10 is from social enterprises and 5 million is from government funding. So all of these things help continue to sustain Homeboy Industries and, and not just one thing. Last slide, please. Uh, so I'll finish and close by, you know, giving thanks to you all for having us here in Jamaica, having us here at this conference, um, and we appreciate all of you, and we'll save the questions and answers for our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you wow. Was that inspiring or what? Yes, give them another round of applause, please. Wow. Um, you know, as a Christian myself, we, we, I think most persons are familiar with the word testimonies. And the reason why we go through experiences is not for ourselves. It is for, for others. Yes, it's to come back and establish the systems that allows individuals to heal. Right? We say... Resilience is about having systems in place for connectivity. And what I'm hearing coming out from your testimonials, you know, even if we're talking about an approach towards theory of change, is being, ensuring that there's a system in place that will respond or allow individuals to respond to the trauma, to heal, you need a system in place that provides the kind of love. Um, it, sp it speaks about relationships, the kinship, restoring a sense of identity. And I don't know if anybody is noticing the connection with the, even this morning session, the psychosocial aspect of it, you know, how, how do we bounce back and become productive citizens? Yes, it's so, so powerful. Can we give them another round of applause? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Okay, I'm going to invite our next um, presenter, Dr. Henley Ward Morgan, I believe. Most persons in Jamaica know that name and is familiar with Agency for Inner City Renewal. Dr. Henley Morgan became a household name after relocating his substantial business consultancy practice from its office in the New Kingston Business District to the iconic but dreaded inner city community of Trenchtown. Former public defender Earl Witter, in his, in his report into the Tivoli operation, that would have happened in 2011, recommended Dr. Morgan's model of community transformation as a template for ending donmanship and political garrisons in Jamaica. Dr. Morgan spent some time in the United States, during which period he obtained his major academic credentials from institutions in Texas. He possesses a bachelor's of science degree in biology and chemistry, a master's degree in business and industrial administration, and a doctorate in education administration. He is the founder and CEO of three limited liability companies, Caribbean Applied Technology Center, Global Management Services, and Employment Testing Services. Through these companies, he has for more than 20 years offered management consultancy services locally and internationally. 
In 2014, Dr. Morgan was conferred one of the nation's highest national honors, the Order of Distinction, OD, for his work in the area of community transformation through social entrepreneurship. This evening, we will hear from Dr. Morgan about the model utilized in Trenchtown to, to achieve community transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. Henley Morgan. Greetings I bring from <laughs> All right, let, let, let me just give you a trench down welcome. Music. Okay, all right. Rewind and come again. <laughs> I, I wanted to start by giving you a 30,000 feet view of a community which is stereotypically treated as a place where only fools venture, angels fear to tread, and where government has abdicated its duties and responsibilities. So we have a very nicely produced video that would have shown you some of those uh, community assets. So I'm still hoping, hoping we can get that queued up and that you could see that. But while we wait on that, clap your hands, I'll tell you what you're clapping for. I, I want to thank you, that's for me, it ain't too good. But I'll accept it. Now clap your hands, I'll tell you what you're really clapping for. That's for homeboy. It's hard to follow a storyteller. And there's no greater story than one which you are scripted into. But I got news for you, I got a story too. And I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes just, um, just revealing. Let's see if we've got it now. Come on, you know you have to do Come something. Come with me. Do something. Do something. You are about to experience a road less traveled. The path trod by giants and icons. A beat and a song. Trench tone to the world. Come, hear, see, taste, and feel the vibe. A natural mystic is still flowing through the air. This is the Grand Old Lady, the old Ambassador Theatre, the Bass. She opened her doors in 1952. She is the womb from which our best musical talents emerged and were honed and then set free to the world. This is No Man's Land, the site of Marcus Garvey's first church and a symbol of Jamaica's social and political struggle. And out of the struggle, they emerged Rastafari and a culture rich in liberation themes and lyrics, which caused the music to become the anthem for freedom movement across the globe. This is Boys Town, home of many of Trench Town's unattached youths who went on to become iconic figures in the arts, culture, music, sports, business and politics. Founded by Father Hugh Sherlock, 
who also wrote Jamaica's national anthem. This is Culture Yard, where Bob Marley lived, first as a member of the Whalers and later in his solo career. He rose to stardom and recognition by the highly rated Time magazine as the most significant entertainer of the 20th century. On the signs appear the names of giants of the music and culture. Bob, Bonnie, Peter and the Ivories, Joe Hayes, Mortimer Plana, Jimmy Tucker, Alton Ellis, Delroy Wilson, Cynthia Schloss, Dean Fraser, Ernie Wrangling. From 1st Street to 7th Street, there is no other space of the same size anywhere in the world that has birthed a world genre of popular music. What would the world be without reggae? The youth them today have within them the roots planted by the legends of the past and the present. At Jamming Studio, they give voice to their talent, study pro tools and get coaching in the business of music. Trench down, the maker and maker of reggae. Music that you can't dance to is music without a language. Mentor, rock steady, dance hard, reggae, has spawned dances like Dinky Mini, Brookings, Willie Bones, LOL, Afrobeat. So come to Trench Dog and learn the boss I dance. Thank you. Bring up my title page. So my topic is fresh perspectives on community transformation. A new, a different, a fresh way of looking at communities. And one of the things I always say to my big man friend them, you don't have to feel sorry for me. You don't have to worry that you're going to pick up the paper tomorrow and I would be dead, shot by gunmen in the street. I am doing well by doing good. Let me get a hand clap for that. My presentation, please. So that's the topic, fresh perspectives on community transformation. And in the limited time, I'm going to present you with a working model, which is Agency for Inner City Renewal, following about six criteria that we were shared, that was shared with us in the notes that helped us prepare for this presentation. First slide. Go ahead, next one. Let's stop there. Keep it right there. Um, the way we have treated communities and approach community transformation, we start from a perspective that these people are irredeemable and that the atrocities that we hear happening there only happen to certain kind of people. It's what's called in the field of psychology, labeling. The approach we use is a completely different approach, where when we look, we don't see needs, keep it there, but what we look, what we see are assets. And if you see assets, what do they do uptown with assets? They leverage assets to do what? To create wealth. Are you with me? The needs analysis approach has been used in Jamaica for over 50 years, most of the years of our independence. The multilaterals have spent over $2 billion, and the problems are worse today than when we began. 
And I'm glad I can stand up and tell the truth. Because when you're in a trench town, them can't demote you no more. No politician can touch you. Are you with me? Because <laughs> you have already done that to yourself. So one of the things we start with is an economic analysis, a socioeconomic analysis. And for this, we use the SDC. Luckily, the SDC back in 2011, a little dated now. The SDC has a community profile uh, on Trenchtown. So it's one of 16 communities within the downtown development cl cluster. And there are actually four districts. So when you hear like last week, say, 70 people get shot. And they like to label it trench town. Like trench town is some little contiguous space. As long as it happened in West Kingston, it's trench town. Trench town is four or five districts with over 27,000 people in adult population. Next one. So typically, it's, 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 uh, it has a large number of female-headed households, low level of educational attainment, high youth unemployment, limited opportunities for training and certification, inadequate housing, and poor infrastructure, uh, poor environment and physical sanitation, and of course, crime and, and violence based on the STZ, SDC 2011 um, census. Next one. Now, let me give you a fresh way of looking at communities. I'm going to give you the economic perspectives, but don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. I'm going to give you in the words of some recognized global figures. Next. Rebecca Treadway. This is what she said. Long ignored our nation's inner cities. And by the way, this is a common feature. This is America, not Jamaica. Long ignored our nation's inner cities hold far more than the dismal pathology conveyed by the data that is publicly portrayed. Inner cities are a source of untapped opportunity, a means of economic growth and revitalization. Let me just stop here for say something as a proud black man, as a Garveyite, as a revolutionary in a suit without tie. <laughs> Consider if God in his infinite wisdom had given trench stone and reggae to America. All you have to do, I go Memphis to where Elvis Presley used to live. And you get a part of the answer. But let me go. Next one. Michael Porter in a Harvard Business Review article. Business peep inner, city com inner cities possess competitive advantages. Business people, entrepreneurs, and investors must lead to economic revival of the inner city and community activists, social services providers, and government bureaucrats must support them. Are you converted yet? Can we start the baptism? Hold up your hand. Let me bring out the pool right now and start some baptism. Next one. John Kretzman, who wrote Building Communities from the Inside Out, which is sort of the small b Bible for social entrepreneurs these days. Viewed from the perspective of their needs, troubled inner city communities to some people appear to be irredeemable. Viewed from the perspective of their assets, and they use what is called asset-based community development, ABCD, these same communities are full of economic possibilities. Hold up your hand if you're convinced by now. Well, let's see if one more will do it. This one is by Dr. Gladstone Hutchinson, who was seconded by his university in America to be head of PIOJ for two years. He's a Jamaican and a leading social entrepreneur. 
And he wrote an innovative public-private partnership downtown Kingston redevelopment project back in 2017. This is what he said. Human, physical, cultural, and economic assets are everything that a community has to create value and wealth. Trenchtown is asset rich. What is that? What is that? Talk to me now, people. Next what? Maybe I should wear a different suit. Don't look like me look the part. In terms of a working model, when I made that faithful, I didn't say faithful, that faithful decision within the space of 24 hours, went home and said to my wife, kneeling on the ground, she said, oh, Henley, Henley, oh, Henley, what did you do now? What do I have to forget give you for? And God bless her soul. She resting in his arms. I said, honey, we can't continue this. I lived in America for 27 years. I'm faced with taking you and the children back to America to accept a job with IDB. She said, really? What is that going to cost? I said, it's going to cost me my life. I will not survive more than six months. She said, what is the option? So we're going to move to Trench Town. Oh, what a night for richer, for poorer, in death and in life. And that was it. And we formed Agency for Inner City Renewal, AIR. Next one. And I'm going to just share with you, to be brief, about six or seven criteria for those of you who may want to benchmark this approach. Number one criterion is your mission statement. You have to be focused. You can't envy your rich friend them who you leave behind, who drive Beamers, and who drive Porsche. You can't be a little bit in a this and a little bit of that. You have to be totally dedicated. From your mission statement, I know where your heart is. So this is our mission statement. Our mission is to transform zones of social and economic exclusion to zones of opportunities, investment, and wealth. You need anybody to exegesis that? You need any explanation? It's clear, and that's what we're focused on. Number two, align with national goals. Let me tell you something I noticed. When we went to Trench Town, I had some money, some resources. And my first strategy was giving handouts. I learned soon I wouldn't have no hand or no pocket to put it in and no money in there. So we quickly changed it to, we're not giving no handout, we're giving hand up. You get it? You get it? I put people in a position to do for themselves. But sometimes at the local level, you get so inundated that even when you write your, your proposals, they are so localized. So every proposal we write, we start with the national agenda. We start with Vision 2030. And by the way, Vision 2030, clap your hands for the PIOJ. The S, the S, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, are 95% aligned with our Vision 2030. We usually say it the other way around, but Vision 2030 came before SDG. So there they are, and especially goal number three that speaks to economic, we contribute to that, and also we give precedence to the SDG. Number three, moving along. Criterion number three, choose a strategy. Now, we have chosen the strategy of social enterprise. As a matter of fact, it's gaining some currency now as the air model of community transformation or the social enterprise model of community transformation. I think I can get credit for the first person who has spoken that in the international domain. It starts with transformational leadership, 
We work through partnerships, through human resources and talent. By the way, human resources are extremely important. In my office in Trenchtown, 85% of the persons are degreed. My five executives have all MBAs because the problems are complex, brethren. Are you with me? And the first responsibility of the company is not about the whole heap of poor people who run around the place. Because we don't have to work to produce them. They already exist. What we have to do is work to keep the people who are going to solve the problem. Hold up your hand if you know what I'm talking talk about. Right? So we got that. Physical resources and assets. We work through processes which are largely business processes. And we impact society, impact people, impact the economy, impact the environment. And the outcomes are economic or financial. And that's what makes a social enterprise different than a charity. Next one. Criteria number four, collaboration and partnerships. You have double helix, you have triple helix, you have quadruple helix. Now you have quintuple helix. Academia, civil society, private, government, religion, mean all of them. All of them. PSOJ, I'm head of their pension fund. Academia, we offer an MBA degree in a social entrepreneurship. We are teaching it also at um, Excelsior Community College. Private sector, we're in with SEWG and, 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 and the Ministry of Industry and Commerce and, and so on. Religion, well, you know the, that I mean. So where you get convergence, you create transformation. We sing a little chorus in church, you in your small corner, I in mine. That's good, but that not change nothing. It's when you get convergence that the dynamics causes a community lift. Let's go. So watch your time. When I went into this field, I thought, God had saved me because me hate maths, me hate maths. One plus one equal five. I don't like maths. So I was not going to feed the trivia. So I go into Trenchtown where when people ask me how are things, I just say bad. How are you doing? Not too good. Now, if you're not dealing with metrics, measurement, Nobody is convinced. So we use all the tools that private sector use. We use histograms, Pareto analysis to properly assess problems. We use um, all kinds of tools. You can't make it out from that. But the paradigm has changed where you have to use objective tools to solve your problems and to do monitoring and evaluation. Next one. Almost done. And then evidence of impact. And we, of course, choose SROI. Business is ROI. Return on investment. Social enterprise is social return on investment. And Brother Knife, Ears' SROI is by a factor of 11 to 1. That means for every $1 we invest, we'll get 11 on return. Such a core, eat your heart out. Come to Trench on and we teach you how to do it. Clap your hands for Kadamari Knife, the leader in the thought and just did a whole series of training. How many of you were in it on how to calculate SROI? Next one. You see, when it come to talking, I'm done. You see, when it come to talking about sustainability, let me tell you something. When my wife was alive, when my aunt her come, her name was Sandra. I said, Sandra, if me ever said Joan, me in a trouble. Well, I see a way with money. 
If you want money, say money. Everybody shout money on the counter three. One, two, three. Jamaicans will never say money. I don't know why. We just think that if we say money, it means say uh, we're not altruistic. So I'm not talk. We don't use words like sustainability. We don't use words like uh, uh, these euphemisms. We, we are in it. And the best thing we can do is show you the figures. By the way, those are millions of dollars. Look on it. First time I showed this in a public. Right? The difference with our organization is that 90% of your earnings are invested back in the mandate. And the 10% is used to pay staff and so forth. Last one. Conclusion. Good news. Jamaica is among the first countries in the world to create a fourth sector. So you have, you have public sector, you have private sector, you have non-profit sector, and on government's legislative agenda for this year, thank God for Charmaine Brim and others like that, Oral Shaw, we are going to now have a fourth sector, which is the social enterprise sector. Some people call it the fourth benefit sector. That is big news. Clap your hands. And I'm done. Next slide. Next slide. They can read this when they get it. It's question and answers. Charmaine. Talk about dynamism, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. Um, the evidence of community resilience, establishing systems, um, unlocking and leveraging the community assets in a, in a manner that will contribute to empowering the residents of the communities. Um, you spoke about as, as institutions, uh, community-based institutions, the, the importance of following a, a, a kind of approach that ensures that you're aligning to your national goals, um, looking at the, using, utilizing a strategy that is focused on transformational lead, leadership and looking closely at your business processes, the collaboration and partnership, this quintuple system that he has spoken about, um, which really is, is essentially a pulling on. The truth is that community transformation cannot happen with one or even two entities. Yes? It's really about identifying all of the key actors in a space and pulling everybody together. And that is the essence of, of coordination. It's the, it's the essence of the kind of theory of change that even under the community renewal program model, we are saying if we can pull together all the systems in the, in the one place and have them working together, focusing on your expertise, we should see the kind of community intrinsic transformation that we want. And the important thing, they say, what is measured is what gets done, yes? So the importance of that, um, in order for you to be able to see the impact that you're creating. So I think if we were to pull it all together, listening to the homeboys model, listening to Dr. Morgan's model, it is really about putting things in place to allow communities to respond to the different things that will happen. For Jamaica, aside from crime and violence, they, there are high levels of trauma that persons are exposed to, yes? And uh, those are just two things. And so it is very, very important, ladies and gentlemen, that as we are hearing these experiences and hearing these systems and models, we really have to think about what we can adopt to apply to our own within our own organizations to get the changes that we want can we give dr morgan another round of applause and whilst we do that i'm going to ask dr morgan and hector andre to rejoin us whilst i just quickly introduce our other two panelists um mr charles clayton who is the program director of the community renewal program at the planning institute of jamaica i'm going to invite him to join us on the platform as well as Tariq Weeks and just to tell you a little bit about Tariq Weeks who is 
currently a research fellow in the Center for Criminal Justice and Security at the University of the West Indies. He has for the past 15 years been involved in crime and violence prevention and behavior change research initiatives in Jamaica, St. Lucia, Dominica, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, as well as Grenada. He has worked alongside academic researchers in several countries, including Mexico and Colombia and Chile. And I, mo I want to mention the work that he has done in terms of his involvement in discovering more about the ecosystems in which criminal groups and networks thrive. And so I believe that it's important that we get a chance to get into the minds of these experts a little bit more. And so we'll just delve into the panel discussion. Hello, are you hearing me? Yes? Okay. Let me start with Mr. Clayton. Um, from a community renewal standpoint, what can you tell us as we, we continue? This, the discussion today is about transforming communities through economic resilience. Can you tell us within the context of community renewal, what would that look like? What, were we, what are we seeing based on the work that has been done at the community level? that maybe needs to be strengthened or that has worked and we, that, you, that you think will result in the kind of um, resilience, economic resilience that, that needs to, we need to see happening at the community level. All right, let, let me start by just re-emphasizing um, re the real problems that we really want to address. So we have a space, uh, we have spaces where the level of economic activity is not sufficient to sustain the, the communities. We don't have enough people working uh, compared to those not working. We don't have enough opportunities for business within the spaces. And we don't have enough people who are qualified to work or who know what their qualifications are for working. So those are the essential problems. So if you have a space where the economic activities are less than, than other types of activities, then it's not sustainable. So in addressing that, we have to start with the people. What is it that keeps people from participating in the labor force? At one level, you have deficit of skills, and then you have a deficit of information. People do not know how to go about um, getting information on training, getting information on what they need to do to work. We, people, they're, they're, if, you, if you go on the coronation market, it is one of the busiest places you can ever go to. You see people from the inner city down there very busy working in a lot of economic livelihoods. So the issue is not that people are unwilling to work mm -hmm. or that people don't want opportunities to work. It is really a matter that they, many people do not know what to do, how to pro progress. So information has to get there. Information on one, if you want to be an employee, what do I do to make myself employable? Where are the opportunities? That's the first thing. This, the second thing is that where people have the energy and the ideas, they need support for activating their business ideas. They don't know how to go about it. They don't know where the resources are to come from to start up. And the third thing, there are barriers to employment for some people because of the diversity of where they live or their backgrounds, and we have to work with the business sector to ensure that there can be a better alignment between people's desire to work and the opportunities that are offered. There's also the issue of underemployment. Many times people make the decision not to work because going to work doesn't make sense for what they're going to earn. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be only getting bus fare and lunch money from what you earn, that makes no sense. You have to live at home, you have children, you have money, things to pay. So the, the other issue that I think this is the elephant in the room is to find opportunities where people can find livable wages where they live. So those are all the issues that need to be addressed. So in terms of our work, what we need to do as, as, as people who are intervening there is one, start with the people, building their capacity, giving them the idea that they can. Because we have done focus group discussions with people from some communities where the boys particularly don't believe they are going to live past age 30. And because of that, their vista is very short. They have an anxiety to do now 
because they won't live long enough, so you don't give them any long-term plans. We have to convince them that there's space for them, there's hope, there's opportunity, they can live on. And, and so that's part of the thing, energizing people to believe that they can participate meaningfully and it, it applies to them as well. That, that, that's part of it. I don't want to speak too long, so I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Charles. So if I, if I hear you, we, it kind of goes back to some of the things we heard Dr. Morgan say and something that I believe one of our director generals, Dr. Hutchinson, used to talk about a lot, which is about building the social capital in the communities. So it is not because our communities do not have the human and other assets in order to respond to things, but it's how we leverage those, those, those assets and, and position the peoples to be able to respond to whether it is high levels of unemployment, whether it is to you know, the continuous formation of gangs, etc. It's really about helping, leveraging or building the social capital in the communities. And let me, this is gonna take me to, to Tariq. Charles just outlined or, or mentioned a very important aspect in terms of people want to be able to, he said, livable wages. The economic aspect, people's ability to provide for themselves, they want to survive. And in many of the communities that we target, we call them volatile and vulnerable. That is a, a deficit. How do you think this has contributed, for instance, to a lot of our young men, for instance, finding gangs attractive? Is the issue of economics a driving force behind involvement in, in gang formation, or, or is it not? Do community people see gangs as a medium through which they can respond to some of the threats that they see coming towards them. How would you respond to that? <laughs> um, very complex question, eh? um, Charmaine. But what I can tell you is that um, from the research I've been doing in the last maybe 15 years here, um, what I have come to understand is that, especially in the focus groups we've had with guys who have, for example, gone into advanced fee fraud in the very early days because um, we were in Montego Bay from 20, 2008 looking at Lotus Scanner. And then we came back in 2015 and we're back again in 2019. Um, the guys don't just want a livable wage, it's very important. It's actually it's very, very important. They want to be able to cover their means and stuff. But what they also were interested in is mobility, right? So you don't want to be in a job, and I found it very interesting because it's something that we as even non-gang members want as well, right? Um, we want to be able to be in positions that not just give us a livable wage, but we like to see some mobility. And mobility here is a little bit layered. Um, you talk about economic mobility, moving up financially, but also socially, to be able to get the things that you want. More than just a livable wage, which is working, which is your living conditions, be able to afford food, shelter, and clothes, that basic. They want a little bit more than that. Right? So the issue of mobility is something that has come up a lot in the conversations. And that is why in 2018, there was a meeting in, in St. James. Um, and it came up, our trust employer saying that she goes to them and talks to them all the time right, about being employed. And if you check it, they don't want it. They want nothing at all. Right? From, they don't want to participate. And I said to her, well, part of it is that, what are you offering them? Do they see a clear pathway? Which is something that... When we talk about gang demobilization and pathways, it's very important for us to emphasize to persons who wish to leave, right, that we, we emphasize a clear pathway for them, right? What, if you do this, what are some of the things you can expect along the way? Because many of them don't know and they don't understand what it means to take that clear pathway. What are some of the risks, right? I've met guys who are scared of taking that clear pathway, right, because they don't know if it will give them that level of mobility that they want. Now, it's a very interesting concept, right? um, and a very interesting battle, because do they understand what it takes to get to mobility? What, 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 what is required? Many of them don't have the education qualifi educational qualifications. Right? They didn't go past high school. Right? But they're looking at mobility as something that they want to see. It's very important that whatever programs that they get exposed to, the therapies that they get exposed to, introduce assessments that take care of that or rewire and help them think about how do they vision themselves in a clear pathway, right? 
Um, that's very, very important. So the assessments that we, uh, that we, we, we think about are mental health assessments. We think about um, structured violence um, intervention assessments. Right? Um, these are very important before we even talk about those clear pathways with them. It will help us think about what is it we can do to actually help them and help them see and vision themselves from now to then. Right? So my answer to this is that we have to start with those type of assessments to offer a clear paths. And I think I heard this from the homeboys' presentations. You have to have these type of assessments. Um, and then you need to all sort of handhold. I've had to handhold guys right, into schooling and throughout schooling right, who are former gang members because they have this, they're, they're scared, right? And the sad thing is that um, they also have sometimes have to go back into those environments that they're running away from. So whilst they have been able, in the US, you say, knife and off, right? Um, Harry, don't have something like that, but we ask, the guys do leave. They say they just want to leave the gang, right? So the assessments are important. I agree with you. There must be a decision that they want to leave, right? Even in the criminological literature, you see the emphasis on the decision to leave. But then there's those assessments that must happen, right? And assessments are not just individual based. It's a very ecological model. You need the family involved. You need to understand the community. You need to understand schools. Um, and then from that, you develop that vision, and, right, which gives that clear pathway. But the guys, Charmin, they, they, they are very interested. It's, and the guys I've spoken to are interested in leaving. But what has not been, I agree, some of the things that have been said, is that we don't have a very clear, articulated, coherent pathway. And this is why I'm so happy to see this kind of conversation happen because for a long time we've been asking for clear exit pathways right, for gang members. We don't have a situation here where guys just want to die um, or they see death as the only way out. Right? We do have examples of guys who leave. Right? So we need to um, work on that clear pathway, that coherent framework right, pathway for them. Thank you so much. You know, it's quite interesting you were speaking about the, the exit pathways and I'm just thinking about the power of perception, because I think, generally speaking, once we hear about gang members, we're not thinking that they want pathways out, yeah, yeah. you know? Um, and it, it lets me think we need, we need to probably do a little bit more in building the public awareness towards these things, because I think our attitude towards, you know, gang members or, you know, those who we call these high-level unattached youth. Um, I think maybe, on, for the most part, those of us who are not involved in the kind of work that you are doing, kind of does something that I think Hector and Dre spoke about. We're writing off people, you know. Um, Hector, I know I saw you nodding quite a bit to some of what um, Tariq was saying. You want to add to, you know, Please. based on your experience? Sure. Uh you know, when I think about Homeboy Industries and how it started, it started with Father Greg asking gang members, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And listening. And, and you know, the, the things, some of the things were this, like, look, we need to go to school. So they built a school in the community because gangs couldn't cross certain gang turfs. Um, and then one of the biggest things was, I need a job. So then we started this campaign. I wasn't there at the time. It was jobs, not jails. Nothing could stop a bullet like a job. But then what happened was um, gang members were given the opportunity to get to have jobs and most of them failed. Most of them failed from having really living wage jobs. I mean, jobs that you know, we would all be so happy to have you know, because it's going to really uh, make an impact in our lives. And then, and then it was like, well, what happened? Healing didn't happen. There's a component that needs to happen. It's, it's healing the individuals. And that's where, we, that's where we started to shift at Homeboy Industries and saying, okay, like if you were to ask me a, a, a live straight up gang member, what do you need? Healing wouldn't come out of my mouth. That was the furthest thing. The only thing we're gonna think about is money. And, and, and healing is, is the one thing that I absolutely need in order to see myself, to heal myself from the pain, to start to see myself as a different person and not a gangster, as a person. My name's Hector, you know what I mean? What am I capable of? If, you're, if, if I'm a, surrounded by a community that loves me, community trumps gangs, we, it goes over. Now, not to say you're gonna forget about your homeboys, but you definitely feel better inside. I make better decisions, I'm starting to love myself, and so, you put me on an economic path after that, I'm gonna take it. And I'm gonna encourage my friends to take it, my homeboys to take it. 
Excellent. Charmaine, can I just add something quickly? Um, yeah, the, the issue is that, you know, here we have two, there are two ways to look at the referral pathways for the guys that we have in gangs, right? One, you have the average age we've seen in our studies is 17.6 years old, right? But we know from speaking, sorry, you hear me? Yeah, so we have a couple of things to think about in terms of the referral pathways when it comes to those things. One is that we have gang members who are below the age of criminal responsibility, right? Um, they may not come into contact with law enforcement until in the early adolescence when they do more serious crimes. But at that age, below the age of criminal responsibility means that the protection, abuse issues, um, there is scope and opportunity for diversion pathways. And these here, um, as Charles was saying, and I think that's what you're saying as well, have to be improved, right? Um, we need better community access points, right? And we also need reputable um, persons who are those access points, right? Um, people who can work with the state, form the kind of partnerships and hold them and give that kind of guidance along the way, right, that the guys need. So we have those guys, but we also have guys who are above the age of criminal responsibility, right? And so these guys pose a different type of situation because we have to look at the, the you know, make sure that things that we put in place for them are in sync with our legal framework, right? Uh, we do have anti-gang, well, we do have a suppression of criminal organizations act, right? Um, so there are issues there that have to be resolved Right? And it's important that we get those assessments done so that the state, if it's offering and going that particular way, understands what are some of the navigations they have to Because it's not just social, there are also legal issues as well. Right? And that's why most referral pathways include the prosecution, they include the police right? um, in, in, in activities. The, the, the partnerships are very important also at the community level, like I said, you, know, you need those access points. One of the things that we just, in the 2021 study I did, I, well, I first did it in 2012, right? Uh, mapping those gangs in St. Andrew South and K, well, parts of Kemara. And I come back in 2021, right? Look at the baseline data we collected. And micro locations, which is what we use to talk about gangs, we don't talk about communities, talk about those micro locations, they haven't changed. Right? Gang members may have come and go, names have changed of gangs, but locations haven't changed. Right? So this goes where, to where the CRP is trying to, to, to improve. Right? We still have locations that uh, don't have, for example, whereas collective efficacy might be very strong in terms of um, community development councils and other groups, there's still that change in terms of the actual physical space that's required. Right? I mean, um, Henry showed the no man's land. We've known about no man's land for many, many years. Right? It's a space that's just open, right? and it has the name No Man's Land. That stigma, that's a lot of things that prevent us from actually capitalizing on, on gang, gang, gang exit pathways. Because guys won't cross. I have guys now who do not want to go. I, I just got a guy into heart, right? after years and years and years of him trying to, he came to me and he asked I mean, he didn't want to go past No Man's Land. Right? He's in, in, in another part of it. He didn't want to go past it because he just heard the name, he just knew. Right? We have to get rid of, reconfigure those spaces, as we call them in Ghana. In Ghan. So, right? And that's important for the referral pathways. Thank you so much. Very, very good insight. Um, before I throw some other questions, do we have any questions from the floor? Whether from the previous presentations? Any questions? Dr. Shetty? Uh, I always believe that uh, if we can only shed the red eyes and transform the bad minds, there's no problem we cannot solve in Jamaica. So it's a question for all of you. Um, okay, a red eyes and bad minds, how it translates into Queen's English? Queen is dead, King's English. Um, jealousy and antisocial people who try to sabotage what good you're trying to do. How did you neutralize those people who are jealous and destructive and want to stop doing what good you are trying to do? Okay, so the question. Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, I, can't, it, I think it goes back to what I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that representation matters. So you're not going to be able to change those people, those jealous people and those folks who are trying to you know, go against the grain. I think they have to see people that's like them start to make that change and then allow them to start making that change in their head. And, and those jealous people and, and folks who are trying to go against the grain will eventually change, in my opinion. Uh, I feel that, again, you know, seeing folks 
either from your gang or from your community now I'm thriving, right? And I go through it myself because I still go to my neighborhood so I can show them there's other ways we can take. But there are some, you know, haters or jealous people that now was my friend, but now they don't want, they don't want anything to do with me because of the positivity that I'm putting out now into the universe. So I think, you know, let those folks do what they do, but eventually I think they'll be able to cross over that path. Uh, well, another important thing is inclusion. If you include as many people as possible in the process, it reduces the extent to which you'll have people working against the process. So for example, if you're talking about training and it is clear that everybody has the same opportunity, then jealousy now becomes something that only applies if you don't take use of the opportunity. But, but I'm saying the broader you make the opportunities, the, more, the less the chances of people undermining the process as you go, go, go ahead with it. Yeah, I, if, I, if I may just add here, um, the economic model is a very linear model. It's input, conversion, output, that is some desired value. Now, can you imagine me going and I'm, and I'm negotiating with say Lasco Distribution Limited, where right now I have about 120 people working. And I start talking to them about these issues, I get no damn where. <laughs> so we actually deal much more with the good boys who don't want to be bad boys. It seems like the bad boys get all the attention. No wonder they have so many bad boys. Because everybody pays attention to you. But as, as, what about the good boys who don't want to be bad boys? Now, there are two things we have experimented which I think are very promising. All the employees we have, hundreds with major companies, one of the things in the contract is we take the disciplinary actions. And with most of them, when we have a disciplinary situation, like say attendance or fight, we refer them to uh, an organization that provides counseling. And frequently some community, family issue, are you with me? Kind of thing. The other thing we've done, I recently got a client to agree to me using a former gang member at us deportee from US after many years, but very smart. And he is now the supervisor. So he knows better than me why a guy not come in work the next day after he get paid. All right? Or whatever. So he knows, they communicate with him much, much better. But the point I want to make is that the, the economic model is very linear. And once you're using that model, you have to conform to it. It doesn't conform to you. So it really kicks out a lot of the psychosocial and other kinds of issues. You can't really take up a gang person and send to Salada Foods knowingly. Are you with me? Because if you did, you would break the relationship immediately. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. Any other questions from the floor? Um, to homeboys, I am interested in hearing how the, from a community level, so prior to the intervention by Father Greg Boyle, you, I would imagine you had situations where you had warring communities. So the issue of community cohesion, um, were there issues of you know, turf, turf wars that were happening between communities? And then can you say what changes you have seen in, co in the community dynamics through the intervention of, of Homeboy Industries in terms of engendering community cohes cohesion? You know, so where there probably would be rival gangs across different communities. Maybe some of those gang members have become beneficiaries on the Homeboys. Have you seen any change in the dynamics at the community level? Well, you know, Los Angeles is 
you know, just the the, uh, the gang capital of the world, and you know, and all the all the craziness that's that's been going on since I think the forties, um, and I'm sure earlier than that. But um, Father Greg was, and when he first got involved in in, in the gangs, uh, like to see gang members, he he went from he's a Jesuit priest. He came from uh, from Bolivia, and then was put into the poorest parish west of the Mississippi, which is Dolores Mission, which is in Boyle Heights. In that parish, he was surrounded by uh, four different housing projects, eight different gangs, and um, and that's what. And he was the youngest priest, and and priests are supposed to like just do mass and all that other stuff, you know, but. There was pure gang wars, pure turf wars all, all around there. Crack ep epidemic was going on. Everybody was trying to make money. Everybody wanted everybody's territory. And, um, and so he was like, how do I get involved in this? You know, se the, the señoras, which means the mothers of the neighborhood, were saying, you know, por favor, ayúdame, ayúdame. You know I mean? Like, help us with, with this problem. And, and so Father Greg would jump, off, jump on his little um, beach cruiser and cruise the projects. Everybody thought he was a cop in the beginning. He you know didn't I mean a white guy just cruising around the projects was like not heard of, you know? But, um, but then he tried to get involved in, in the gang wars and try to create gang ceasefires and, and, and all this stuff. But what, what it takes is, it takes for, for I got to get the leader of this gang, and then I got to get the leader of this gang, and I got to say, hey, leaders of gangs, can we stop this war? And then the leaders will be like, you know, well, you know, yeah, maybe we could stop this war because, you know, the chest pups up and everything. And then Father Greg, um, I'm going to fast forward, would say, oh, what I'm doing is, I'm giving oxygen to gangs, and that's gonna keep a gang, you know? Because he'll turn around and, and, and one week later, someone's gonna get shot and then we're back at it again. So that is, you know, to, according to Father Greg, and I, with his, you know, with what he says is, that's not gonna work. So you take gang members, you take individual gang members, and how does that affect the community? I say it affects the community. Does it stop gangs? Have we stopped gangs? That we have not done. We've definitely, I know for sure that we've reduced um, gang violence on the streets. We, there's a whole system that, that's in, in, I would say in California, really in the United States, that's against us, I would say. Yes. And so we have to, uh, gang members are, are, are churning. You know what I mean? If it's, you know, when they're throwing away the keys of, of one gang member, his kid's going to be a gang member, for sure. You know, so it's, it keeps perpetuating. And, and we're, we're involved with coalitions to change that system. It's a hard system. But it's a hard system to change, and I'm not going to give up on that. But what I'm going to focus on, and what we focus on, are individuals. And in those individuals, you're changing generations. Yes. My, you know, like I said, my grandfather was a gang member, father, myself, because I came and changed, my sons are not gang members. Sean Main, if I may just add there, um, I, I really want to thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Clayton. A uh, couple months ago, you called me up to your office and you told me about having gone to California and you had met, you know, uh, I kind of wondered at the Time, I may have to apologize if you don't have enough to do. But I can definitely see why, for instance, an agency for inner city renewal has another step to go through, which is the one they have done, where they have their own social enterprises, which provide a more holistic approach. Because I tell you, I don't think the straight economic can do it. Because in Jamaica, even though you become a power broker with almost a thousand employees moving, you know, and all kinds of stuff, but the Jamaican business people, and I'm not stereotypically treating all, all sometimes I think they're trying to make out of me is the new exploiter. You know, them think they're idiot, you know? The more I get rid of them problem, and find somebody who can pay below minimum wage 
and break all of the industrial relations laws. Are you with me? And then you, you, you get what I'm saying. So it's a, it's a constant battle. But I think eventually, and we may talk about a collaboration actually as we learn from them and vice versa. But I think that model promises a lot. Let's see homeboy, the way they do it. Charmaine. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. sorry, it's connected? You wanted to add to what was being said? Yeah, but okay. you have a question. So. No, you can go ahead. Are you adding to what was yeah, just said? Yeah, but or? yeah, I was just saying that you know, we can't think about just the economic model, right? Um, gangs are attractive because they're social groups first. Right, um, because they're social groups, they meet particular needs, as you were saying, as I've said earlier. Right, um, so we can't just think about the economic model. Um, because of that, the membership in gangs, especially in Jamaica, is not a homogeneous one. Right, people are in gangs for different reasons. They are there for reprisals later on that they wish to carry. They're there for protection, because community violence is something that we experience independent of gangs, as well as domestic violence. Uh, and they're there for pathways, you know, peer pressure, gain status, and so it's not exactly a very firm fit model that we have to work with. But if you look at the model from homeboys, it's a holistic approach. Exactly. It's not only looking at the economic side, but it's also looking at the social aspect of it. So I believe it, it does provide an answer that, that connects the dots in ways that other types of solutions don't. Um, they, when you describe what you went through, Hector, when you, when you came, the way you felt and the way they, the actual organization made you feel, and its ability to be able to cause you, yeah. to, to act, 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 cause, allow people to fail and then come back. We don't have any program like that. One strike and you're out. And, you, you know, the, 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 the complexities of involvement in gang, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's very broad. And one of the issues, really, that we contend with is what they call strain theory where your aspirational needs cannot be met by your capacity, so you seek other means. So people become parts of gangs to meet those aspirational needs as well. So I, I'm saying, with this kind of perspective, your whole perspective changes. It's not now just about making money, but it's about recognizing yourself as a person with an identity, and, 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 and an identity that is connected to other people because we're all social beings. So, so it, it is connecting the pieces in a way that our current solutions do not. We look at the economic side of it, so we try to get people into jobs and into businesses. We look at the psychosocial side, so we try to fix their minds. But we don't look at the holistic picture of, of an environment, a community that connects and makes people feel that like they belong. So I think this is the advantage of the model that you present to us. It's a, it's, it's a model that has an economic side, a social side, a psychosocial side, and it provides solutions for people who are otherwise excluded. So this is how I look at it. I could probably add to that as well that what the model um, does also emphasize, even though, well, it does emphasize is that there needs to be a system of care, right? Um, and that system of care floats between what we understand to be at the household level, individual level, and community level. Um, what I think the model that you, you suggested, well, the theory of change that you suggested, it does require us to have some referral system strengthening, right? Um, and referral system strengthening has capacity issues. Do we have enough social workers to help them go through? Well, right? look at the figures that you have in terms of trained staff and all. Do we have enough dedicated social workers? Um, do we have enough persons like you, <laughs> right? Um, to do that type of handhold and, if that, you know, and, and get them through. But the key thing is to understand that the system of care, which is what your theory of change is pointing to, right, is what we really need to strengthen, right? And the way to strengthen is to look at how do we communicate, how do we improve access to information around where to go, how to deal with situations, how to get through particular situations, right, within that type of holistic, comprehensive approach that you, you, you shared with us. Thank you so much. Gwyneth? Yes, thank you. We are bringing forward the voices from online, from on YouTube. They've been following very closely, and I have, hope we can accommodate two questions. Sure. So Island Girl is asking, as we work with the adolescents and adults, what are we doing to prevent these behaviors within our young children? Open bracket, early childhood and primary age children. That's her question. Okay. Well, I'll... Well, well, 
There, well, you, you would have heard if you were here earlier on this morning that there, there are a number of programs which are not even in the public mind, which actually engage children at that age. We need far more of them than we have now because the need is much greater than that. But there are programs in place that tackle the parenting and the early childhood. Uh, and this is an essential part of the whole chain of events because if you don't have the preventive measures, the problem you're correcting at the top will soon repeat itself as the next generation comes up. So you really have to lay the foundation where the, 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 the factors that give rise to that kind of behavior are eliminated and it starts at the point where the child enters this world with the parents. So we have to create a set of parents or nurture a set of parents who do not have the same sorts of trauma or baggage that some of the other parents carry which have caused their children to become the, 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 the fall into the difficult situation that they find themselves in now. So yes, we have programs in place. The, the, um, the National Parenting Support Commission and um, working in the Ministry of National Security in schools and so on. There, there, are, there are things happening, but the scale is not as big as it needs to be. Thank you so much, Charles. Hector, you had wanted to respond? No, no you know what? Um, Island girl, island man. <laughs> this is, you know what I mean? So. All right, so the second one, no, is. Uh, just on that one, uh, with, with our model, it does include an early childhood program. In Trenchtown, we run an early childhood institution of over 300 students. I invite you all to look at it. You would think you 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 think you in some foreign, just the way it's laid out and the quality of the tuition and 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 so on. And then for the adolescents and young adults, we have what is called the Miracle Club, which continues training more of the mind, though how to make choices, social skills. Once every two years, every year we take them on a retreat to a Sandals Resorts uh, for a weekend and so on to, you know. So it, it, it does include all the way from, you know, from early childhood through adolescence. But that's in our specific uh, program. So that's something that we can look at adopting? Yeah. Replicating that. Okay. Thank you. The second question was, is from... Venkot Dyer, the romanticization of evil on the sound waves and the swag of scammers flaunting their loot have become attractive to the youth of the garrisons. How do you mitigate against this pull factor? Wow. Wow. That's a, that's that's <laughs> well, I think that's what the whole discussion has been that, about. The, um, the, the, our friends from Homeboy, were, they were actually personally giving you testimonies as to what draws them into gangs and what draws other people. And some of the measures that have been used to actually pull them out of that, you know, the need to belong, the um, sense of exclusion, the lack of opportunities that they may face, multiple dimensions. Actually, this actual discussion is really about the multiple solutions that we need to find for that. So um, if you've been listening, it would be um, employment opportunities would be psychosocial interventions. It would be actually finding an atmosphere, an environment in which people can feel included. It would be all those factors together that would be used to address some of those challenges that, that are, are being brought up. I, I, okay. I think, sorry, if I, may, I think one of the things I'm probably hearing from that and in the Jamaican perspective, um, you know, there's a school of thought that says for the involvement is in, in gang membership, a big, big thing is, for instance, the amount of money you can earn. Yes. And it is, it is touted, right? So you go into some of these communities sometime and they That's say, right. why should I come on the straight and narrow when I have, I see some of my, my friends and they have them degree and stuff, but they can't earn $3 million in a, in a month kind of thing. So I think that's the kind of romanticizing that they, they are talking about. And some of these other straight and narrow things are not necessarily attractive. So if I throw it back to Dre and throw it to Hector and to Dr. Morgan, like in your own experience, what was the romanticizing thing in the LA experience that, that, that you thought was a big pull factor 
Um, if it's, you know, it, it probably is something different. And how did you get out of that? Yeah, great question. I think um, <clears throat> at, a, at a point when you have all of those things that you're romanticizing about, the money, uh, cars or jewelry, girls, whatever that may be, inside you still feel empty. You know, you still feel like, what is my purpose? Because now it's all in front of me. But there's still no fulfillment within your heart. And again, there's the human aspect that we're still humans. And now that you have all this money and jewelry, it doesn't mean anything at that point. So for me, speaking for myself, you know, it didn't, it didn't change the, you know, who I am, Dre. It didn't speak to any of that. It was really just a facade and a, a face mask, if you will, a cover up for the pain that was deep down inside, right? From the pain seeing, you know, my father, he smoked crack cocaine. He passed away. My mom then developed a alcohol disorder and, and then she passed away. So that's just pain that I'm pushing down. That's but the fine. jewelry and the money, I thought it was gonna make me feel better, but it didn't. So uh, I guess to answer the question um, and kind of, you know, doctor, you, you mentioned it. I think it's taking young individuals out of that community and letting them experience other activities, right? Uh, purposeful activities. Um, being able to, to go out and, you know, like Hector took some of the youth over in LA out wa white water rafting. Never been doing that ever. You know, they never would have thought of doing that. And, you know, you, you, you're so gangster that, oh, I don't want to do any white water rafting. But then during what, the white water rafting, you're smiling, you're laughing, you, you know, it's, so it's about taking them to experience different experiences so they can see that that facade really doesn't do much. That is so true. Uh, about three weeks ago, uh, I did something which many people questioned. I just looked, I said, you know, we've been able to give people jobs, but I don't think we've changed their minds. And we so said, why, why don't we just get to North Coast Resorts uh, over Heroes Weekend? And we took over 200 persons and their families. <laughs> That's great. And we just said, no comments. We need say nothing. We didn't hold one session. As we saw people just experience what the other life is like and what they would love for their children, if not for themselves. Mm -hmm. Where crime pays, crime stays. That's for sure. So in the community, if the guy was the gangster of all the girls and, you know, ride the bike and whatever and whatever, so what we do, our program is really one of creating alternative livelihoods through jobs and through entrepreneurship. Okay, I think Tariq just wanted to come in quickly and then... Yeah, um, just we, one of the ways of countering this, which is what we actually have been talking about, but in different ways, is to foster healthy relationships, healthy po positive relationships. I was about role models, but also as we've seen from RISE, the RISE experience of working at, at, at Risk Youth Hero, PMI's own experience, a peace management issue existed before, right? That, and also um, uh, this other one that did arts, I forgot them. But they took people out of the communities that they were in, and it was for the first time many of them had left the communities and exposed them to, as Henry was saying, that other life, what it is could be realized. Right? And I think that's an important component right, of, of countering um, that romanticized aspect of life. But the other thing, too, is that the guys that we have now right, are very much knowledgeable or aware that gang membership itself right, is a risk on their life. Right? It's a risk factor, we call it in criminology. Right? And so, they are aware, one guy said there's an expiration date, right? Okay, he doesn't know when, right? But there's an expiration date, right? And he wanted to leave as quickly as possible, disassociate himself as quickly as possible, because he could feel the intensity, right, of the, 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 the gang involvement and criminalization. Right. You know, because you are forced to do certain things. You are forced to be part of certain things. It's part of the group. It's a group characteristic. Right? So it, it is a case where you know, we have to work with them to get those healthy, positive relationships, include the family right, as well, 
and at the same time realize that they do, or some do want to leave. Remember we said that people join the gangs for different reasons, right? So we have some entry points there, at least in GA. Okay, thank you. All right, so three other questions then. Can I just say the last one because this one popped up. By the way, Island Girl says thanks for the responses. And Sahai Maxwell, how can children in conflict with the law and who are before the courts benefit from these initiatives? Is there a collaborative effort between the relevant ministries to foster participation? And I'll, I'll leave you there. Thanks. Thank you. Charles, you want to answer that? Well, well I know um, the ministry <laughs> of national security and the ministry of justice are working on alternatives to, to, to people being incarcerated so they for, for, for children that come before the court they look for alternative pathways that do not involve engagement with state institutions if possible so um that is one of the measures i'm aware of that is that is taking place okay. um there may be others too that that will come to mind readily but um that's that's alternative pathways is one of the ways they're looking at it Okay, thank you so much. Mr. Simmons? Both um, homeboys um, and Dr. Morgan. Homeboys, um, either a previously incarcerated person who is just coming out or someone who is employed to homeboys, do you have any form of assistance to them to start their own business if they so wish? If somebody came to us and said, I have this business opportunity, uh, let me say this, we yeah. get that all the time. Yeah. We say, get in our program. I mean, you know, everybody has a, a business proposition. Everybody has their own ideas of how they can make money. We don't discourage it. You know, if that's what you want to do, that's great. Um, but come into our program. But once they are in your program, is there any opportunity, pathway for them? There has been. Yeah, okay. there has been. There's been um, some. <laughs> I was just thinking of the name of the company, but I'm not going to mention it. Anyways, there's a guy who came in. Um, he's uh, he made a a a, a taco. Uh, he's a taco vendor, so he makes tacos on the streets, and um, you know we give him a hand. I let he, he wanted to come back one day and give free tacos. Um, there's other people. Let me think. Artists that do uh, art art things, we have rappers and um, we have actors, you know, that you know, came through Homeboy Industries and got an opportunity, but still need to lean on Homeboy Industries because what we didn't mention, I don't think that we mentioned is, when you come to Homeboy Industries to work on yourself, we pay you to come to Homeboy Industries. That's a huge thing, that's a huge advantage that we give. Yeah. And to say, you come and make a, you know, you make a, a, a check to get your high school diploma, to get all the therapy sessions and all that other stuff. So, and then while you're going on and you're chasing your dreams, lean on us as much as we can allow that to happen so you can get on, on board and then we cut you off financially. We'll never, we'll, we'll never cut you off completely. Um, you, we have a revolving door that, that we will always come back. And not everybody who comes back, comes back to need help. Some um, people come back to donate, to come in and yeah, show sure. off their, their big rig and their, and their truck, or, yeah. or you know, all kind of other things, but uh, yeah. And I'll just add to it. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. You know, I, I would say, you know, for, for those who are being released from prison or incarceration, you may have these great ideas, right? And you don't want to shoot that down and make them more hopeless. So we definitely try to encourage that entrepreneurship, but there's just so much more to learn. And I think that's why Hector said, you know, come into the program first, because there's still healing that needs to be done before you can be doing uh, return on investments and ROI sheets and, you know, actually being an entrepreneur. But we do hold them. We have, um, you know, a young homie, he wants to, he started his detailing service. So then he started washing cars of, of some of the staff. And like Hector said, you're getting paid to be in the program. So now, you know, in a sense, you're getting paid to wash cars. And now you're able to test the waters and see, is this something I really want to do? Um, and I can move forward. And then, then we can then help you move forward. Um, and then we have another homie who he, uh, he wants to be a barber. Well, he is a barber. He cuts hair um, within the program. So he has certain days and 
all of the trainees, you know, they get their hair cut. Um, so yeah, we do try to uh, hold those people who want to be entrepreneurs. Good. Do I have time Dr. to respond? Morgan. Yes. Our time is yes. long enough. We have 20 minutes. I, I think it's such an important question. The future of Jamaicans. I mean, I talk to all our nine to five people. Is in entrepreneurship. The global entrepreneurial monitor in the case of Jamaican women are number five in the world in terms of nascent entrepreneur. And for men, number 12. So Jamaicans are good at sports, they're good at music, and they're good at entrepreneurship. So what we do, first of all, with our employees, even the gas stations, the 25 gas stations we run, um, even the pump attendant has life insurance. We give them all the benefits, health insurance card. And then we run a loan program where we, we give low interest loan because trust me, the woman who is working at Honeybun, she has run something on the side. So she can buy a freezer. So the people them who are home and they're out the grocery can do little selling a chicken or she can sell a coronation. So we run a loan program to get them into entrepreneurship. So very, very important, important question. You have to get people out of the hand to mouth. Do you understand? Just barely make it um, to where from their entrepreneurial skills, they can go wherever that takes them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Neff, the last question to you. All right. Um, and it's really important, you know. You find that in Jamaica, the most successful gangs, the most successful criminal enterprises are closely aligned to political parties and to politicians. There's not a discussion, there's a fact. As a matter of fact, Dr. Herbert Gale research actually showed that the only two organizations that are truly qualified to be defined as gangs were the two political parties. I mean, people are serious. Now, with that kind of close alignment of politicians to gangs, how do we truly arrest that situation? Was that, an exp was that a part well, of the whole boys? Well, the truth of the matter is that nobody wants to touch it. Nobody wants to touch it. But everybody know the reality. And I have a, prop I have a problem with the definition of gang. Because it seems to be the definition of gang is a group of youth that sit on a corner. And you come try you scrape them up. Right? And the mother have to go down and pay a poly for money for police for to reach, bring them back home. But it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue which I think we should openly discuss. And not only discuss, we should do something to solve. Shaman, right. uh, just a quick point. Um, we, just have to, we have to be careful in certain arguments, right? In gang, when you talk about gangs, measurement is always a problem, right? Um, it leads to misidentification, you know, gangs become labeled things that they are not. Um, so you have to be very careful, right? Um, what we know from our experience here in J is that we have gangs and we have organized crime groups, okay? Right, so if we stay in gangs, right, the conversation is a very different one, right? We have street gangs, we have tough oriented gangs, we have violent gangs. But we also have organized crime groups. Right, I'll just leave it as that there, right? Um, because it's, we don't want to conflate the two, right? It's a very different experience. It's also a different level of intervention, right, when you talk about gangs versus organized crime groups, right? So let's just be very careful on that. But, but from our perspective, we're working on the, the, the level of the individual. We're working for, um, to get rid of the factors that might contribute to people becoming gang members and to deal with people who might be inclined to become gang members. That, that's a different layer out there we're talking about. Um, there are institutional factors, there are individual factors, there are environmental factors. So you work at the level where you can. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I think we could go on and on. Yes, do give them a round of applause. Very, very rich discussion. You know, I just want to summarize um, within the context of our, our theme. 
I'm going to summarize it to say community transformation through economic resilience requires a holistic approach, which begins with a system that responds to individuals, families, community, and is embedded in care. And I will leave it at that. Gentlemen, thank you so much. And let me hand back over to our moderator, Rochelle. Give them another round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you to all the panelists in the final uh, session, in the afternoon session. What a day. And thank you to all the persons in the room who remained. We really appreciate that you stayed with us. I want to start by thanking my colleagues from the Community Renewal Program for inviting me to, to moderate, to chair today's session. And I want to thank the PIOJ for hosting and all the partners for joining. I, I'm an economist by profession, and so I'm used to tackling the issues from a different angle. But the issues that we discussed today, I think, for all of us as Jamaicans are very important issues. At times they are heavy, but I'm happy that some attention has been brought to trying to address issues which are very real to us. Today we heard, I'm just going to summarize for both the morning and the afternoon session, some, there were some themes which were recurring throughout the day the importance of education, importance of data, infrastructure within communities, support, partnership, partnerships, that theme has been consistent throughout the day. When we looked at the psychosocial, the importance of mental wellness, hope, the, the issue of our youth, how do we reach our youth? How do we encourage change from that level? We also had discussions which focused on the nuances with gender. So there are different ways that we need to ap approach uh, both males and females. The importance of having trained personnel, and in particular psychologists came up more than once, their role in generating change. It was very interesting to me when violence was presented as a public health issue and as a mental issue as well. Sustainability, that came up quite a bit and we, we gave some attention to that as well. The testimonials for me were very impactful um, from Homeboys in, in International, um, also, this morning, Mr. Morgan, who stood in for Mr. Brown, said he was shy. But when he was finished speaking, I don't know if he's still with us, but his presentation was quite impactful as well. And um, I thought it was very important to hear, not just from the perspective of what would have been a participant, but also someone who is now having a a supervisory role um, and and I thought it was very it was very very impactful for me so the practical experience and the lasting impact of the importance of being on the ground he spoke to some of us who may not have that experience and how important it is to reach persons where they are Other things which, which came out was the power of transformation. And again, going back to Homeboy International, the power of always having an open door. Uh, the benefits of social enterprises, Dr. Morgan spoke to that. 
So we're twinning both the economic with ensuring that persons have a way to sustain themselves in a positive way. Overall, I think it was a day that was filled with, as I said before, impactful discussions. In terms of next steps, tomorrow, there will be further discussions, one-on-one -on -one sessions with Dr. Madero and Mr. Verdugo with key stakeholders. And on Friday, as I said earlier, there is going to be an expo for local economic initiatives. It's free to the public. This will be at Devon House, and it's supported by the SDC, and I invite all of you, if you are able to, to attend and to support our LEIs. Yes, bring your, uh, Charmaine is reminding me to bring your wallet. It's free entry, but if you want to, to patronize the persons who are there, then you know, um, JCF. Oh, JCF is telling me they'll be there as well. So my time is up, and we have a very, uh, just, uh, we have a very um, strict timekeeper. So I will now hand over. I'm going to ask, though, you have been provided with some evaluations. Please complete them and hand them to the relevant persons in the room, because I just spoke about what the experience was like for me, but we also want to know what the experience was like for you. Was it good? Can we do better? So I now invite Ms. Mona Suho, who is the Senior Manager for, the social for Social Development at the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, to offer the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson, Mrs. Rochelle White, Chairperson and Senior Technical Advisor to the Director General at the Pan Institute of Jamaica. One of my favorite persons, Ms. Barbara Scott, <laughs> Deputy General, <laughs> Director General of the PIOJ, and I believe I also saw a number of persons here from the Ministry of National Security, I believe I see CTD Trowers, and of course we have Latavia, Michelle Morgan, so many presenters, panelists, special invited guests, attendees online and in person, good afternoon. It is my privilege to have been asked to give the vote of thanks on this very important occasion that brings together a broad cross-section of human development practitioners in one place under the theme, Transforming Communities Through Economic and Psychosocial Best Practices. Firstly, I must express gratitude for all presenters for sharing your thoughts, ideas, lessons, and perspectives. Your insights will be a catalyst for many successful endeavors in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, an event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels started turning weeks ago, even months ago. It required extensive planning and attention to details while keeping the bigger picture in view. We have been fortunate enough to be supported by a team of highly skilled and motivated professionals from the Planning Institute of Jamaica. And at this time, I think we need to pause and give them a clap. <laughs> Without distracting from the outstanding leadership of the PIOJ, I would like to also applaud the efforts of, all, of other important partners, including the Ministry of National Security, the IDB, the JCIF, and of course, the SDC. We had a very rich program, very, very rich program. And uh, just to highlight the persons from session one, Dr. Kai Morgan, Ms. Joy Bryan, Ms. Tian Brown, and Dr. Shetty, moderated by Mr. Orville Simpson. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation 
and certainly it will add to our body of knowledge on those areas presented. In session two, we had Ms. Charmaine Brim, Mr. Hector Verdugo, Dr. Henley Morgan, very energetic Dr. Henley Morgan, um, in session two, moderated by Ms. Charmaine Brim. And once again, I know that what was presented there will provide a template for us to build on. We had other panelists, Mr. DeAndre Commerz, Mr. Tariq Weeks, and of course, Mr. Charles Clayton. And how can we forget the testimonials from Ms. Joette Bryan and Mr. Tian Brown from the St. Peter, Primary, St. Peter Clever Primary School and a participant from Norwood CBT um, intervention. And so as we close, I wish to mention and echo the line of a, f a popular Latin phrase, not in Latin, however, but in English. If we cannot find a way, we must make one. With this resolve, we press forward to achieve our goal of making Jamaica, and I pause here because now we have the whole chorus. Let me say again. With this resolve, we press forward to achieve our goal of making Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, and raise family and do business. Walk good, everyone. Thank you.